Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? I table documents pursuant to statute and a return to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. President, committees have lodged proposals as shown at item three of today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, I call Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, I seek leave to move a motion to provide for the consideration of a motion. Leave granted. It is Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, I move that a general business notice of motion number 1213, standing in the name of Senator Wong, be called on immediately and have precedence over all other business till determined. B, the time limit for the debate be 30 minutes, after which the question be put, and senators may speak to the motion for not more than five minutes each. And C, following consideration of the motion, the Senate return to its routine of business. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. 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 Contrary, no. The ayes have it. I'll call the clerk and then Senator Wong. Business notice of motion number 1213, standing in the name of the Leader of the, of the Opposition in the Senate, Senator Wong, relating to COVID-19 misinformation. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. Well, this motion in paragraph three thanks the heroes of the pandemic. Scientists, doctors, nurses, aged care and disability workers, cleaners and other essential workers. Australians who have shouldered responsibility. Australians who have taken leadership. If only this Prime Minister could follow their example, if only this Prime Minister could refrain from his consistent pattern of making excuses, of ducking and weaving, because we know that this Prime Minister does that whenever he's asked to take responsibility, and he's done it again when it comes to members of his own party undermining the public health messages in, this, in, in the face of this pandemic. We know that there was a motion, a very similar motion, in the other place, a motion the government didn't actually have the courage to call a division on. In speaking to the motion, our Prime Minister went to every length to avoid referring to the, for, to the member of, for Dawson. He said, what I'm not going to do is engage in a partisan debate on this. Well, the only partisan debate is the debate within his own party. He's not willing to have the debate in his own party. He's not willing, as the leader of the nation, to take responsibility and say to members of his own, you're wrong and you should stop spreading dangerous misinformation. You know, what he did say is, I don't support misinformation. Well, that's like saying you don't support cancer. You can't even be straight with people. Where was the rebuke? Where was the courage to say it was wrong? It's a spinner's way through, isn't it? Rather than making it clear that what the member for Dawson was saying was dangerous and saying he should stop making these sorts of comments, we saw the Prime Minister engaging in his same old dance of ducking and weaving. When Australia needs leadership and responsibility, Mr Morrison goes missing. He even went so far as to say, and the leader of the government here in the Senate has said the same thing. He said, when, if others wanted to undermine the public health effort with misinformation, he said, that's a matter for them. That's a matter for them, I mean really. That is a matter for them. What weakness, what weakness. This bloke can't even stand down his own party, let alone stand up for the country. But you know, Mr. Mr. Christensen is not alone in this. We have our own uh, uh, members of this place, senators in this place, who are prepared uh, to make statements which are demonstrably, demonstrably against the public health advice and demonstrably not in the public interest. Senator Rennick, who said this about public health officials who are trying to keep Australians safe. Our, com our country has become a comedy of errors. Our bureaucrats are the clowns. 
They're the clowns. And in a Facebook post that he's just made, he, he has since removed, he endorsed an article that undermined the TGA approval of vaccines. Remember that when this when this lot here stand up and tell us we're doing a great job because we've got the TGA approval from Moderna, one of their own is undermining the TGA approval process. And then we have Senator Canavan. I'm sure he's waiting for this. Well, Senator Payne, uh, in a speech on disinformation, made this statement. Let us be clear, disinformation during a pandemic will cost lives. Senator Payne would be aware, as Foreign Minister, of the leadership of Dr Anthony Fauci over many years and through the more than one pandemic. And I'm sure she would have also been horrified last year to read that the former chief strategist to President Trump, Steve Bannon, called for Dr Fauci to be beheaded. Mr Bannon was banned from Twitter as a result, but he still has a podcast. And a recent guest on that podcast said, coronavirus is doing more damage to our liberties than our health. And that guest was Senator Canavan, going on the podcast hosted by someone who has called for the beheading of one of the world's leading public health officials. There should be nothing easier than for Senator Payne to rebuke Senator Canavan, and I invite her to do that today. And I invite Senator Birmingham to do the same unequivocally, and not the weasel words that we've heard from the Prime Minister, oh, it's a matter for them. It's a matter for them. Senator Canavan has also written in the FN Review that using lockdowns in Sydney to save lives was an unjustifiable expense. Well, I would like him to tell us which life saved he thinks is an unjustifiable expense. Who should sacrifice a mother or a father or a daughter or a son because their life shouldn't be saved? It isn't precious enough to be saved. You know, when people say we should learn to live with the virus, what they're actually saying to Australians is be prepared for some of you to die from it. This government, this government has to stand up to those peddling disinformation, and their failure to do so demonstrates the same lack of responsibility this government uh, continues this Senator Prime Minister Wong, continues your to time have. Time has expired. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, we li Madam Deputy President, sorry. Uh, Madam Deputy President, we live in the most extraordinary of times, times that none of us would have imagined possible two years ago, uh, but times that we have to face uh, as a nation, as indeed the whole world. Has Australia got absolutely everything right all of the time through the course of managing the COVID-19 pandemic? No, we haven't, nor has any other country uh, on the planet. But we have, Madam Deputy President, managed as a nation to perform far, far better than most other countries of the world. Since the start of the pandemic, we've tragically seen loss of lives of at least 4.3 million across the globe. That's just the recorded numbers of deaths. Here in Australia, sadly, 944 people have lost their lives. Through the course of 2021, we've seen 2.5 million lives lost reportedly across the globe, no doubt many more unreported in many countries. In Australia, 35 have lost their lives. These are all a tragedy, Deputy President, but we should acknowledge the work, as this motion does, of the Australian people, of our healthcare workers, of our scientists, of our advisers, of all who have worked to keep Australians safe. From the very moment, on 1 February last year, when our government made the decision to close Australia's borders to China, and we made subsequent decisions to close Australia's borders to Korea, to Iran, to Italy, and then ultimately to the entire world. Those decisions were ahead of the declaration by the World Health Organization of a global pandemic. We were acting early and we were acting to protect Australians and to keep COVID at bay. And we've continued to act in concert with states and territories wherever possible. This year, the world has been thrown the curveball of the Delta variant. The Delta variant, Deputy President, uh, has created enormous new challenges to countries. At all stages of the vaccine rollout, it has exacerbated challenges to different nations. Uh, and the reality, Deputy President, is that we have to, as a country, continue to respond sensibly and practically to each of those challenges. The responses we all make, though, are not responses that can always be completely uncontested or go without debate or go without challenge. The opposition routinely challenges the government in relation to policy responses. And yes, other members and senators, other individuals across the nation equally challenge some of those responses. 
The government urges all, if they're challenging responses, to do so in a way that is responsible, to make sure that Australians hear consistent messages wherever possible in relation to respect for public health orders, to the need to get vaccinated. But we know that there are real debates that exist in this country and elsewhere, and we acknowledge that individuals will use their rights to engage in those debates. Deputy President, in this motion, the opposition acknowledges the heroes of the pandemic, as I said before. It also responds to comments made by the member for Dawson. The House of Representatives, indeed, already responded to those comments. I heard the Leader of the Opposition in this place say that the government didn't have the guts to call a division on that. Well, that's because the government was accepting the motion, Deputy President. And in relation to the member for Dawson's comments, we will accept the motion in this place too. But Deputy President, I note then the desire to singularly focus on certain members of the government, rather than acknowledging that indeed debates occur outside of this place as well. Debates occur with other candidates, for example, uh, the way Labor's candidate for Higgins has engaged on the question of the AstraZeneca vaccine, Shame. or indeed the way in which we've seen the Queensland Premier and the Queensland Public Health Officer undermine confidence in the AstraZeneca vaccine. Shame. I can't help but note that it took until 7 June for the Queensland Premier to be vaccinated. The South Australian Premier was vaccinated on 21 February, Deputy President. The West Australian Premier on the 2nd of May, at least. Why on earth don't we see the equivalence of approach taken from those opposite in relation to all of those, to all of those, to all of those who have acted in ways? And that, Deputy President, is why I move an amendment to the motion by the Labor Party that ensures we send a clear signal to all who use public platforms to all public officials, to all candidates, that all should be held to the same standard to support our health officials, to support our scientists and to support our response to this global pandemic. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. I'm going to go round the chamber, Senator Waters. Very much, Deputy President, and I rise to join um, in the comments to support the heroes on the front line of this health pandemic. To note that the scientists, the doctors, the nurses, the aged care and disability workers, the cleaners, those essential workers have been absolutely paramount. And they are not clowns, as Senator Rennick has described them. I might add they are mostly women and they are mostly underpaid. We should be paying them more, and we are all still here thanks to them sacrificing their potential safety being on the front line. Now, they are indeed putting themselves on the front line and sacrificing their own potential safety because this Prime Minister could not manage a proverbial. He has utterly botched the vaccine rollout. He has utterly failed to build quarantine facilities, and he has once again utterly failed to take responsibility for anything that is actually his job as the Prime Minister. Now, this Prime Minister just cannot show leadership because he simply is not a leader. He runs away from responsibility. He doesn't hold a hose. He doesn't have a plan. He doesn't have a clue. And that is the problem here. And he doesn't have the guts to stand up to the science deniers and the lunatics, frankly, in his own party many of which are on the back bench, some of which used to be on the front bench. Now, I note with interest that the government has circulated an amendment that uh, the Leader of the Government in the House just moved, uh, seeking to amend this motion to delete reference to Senator Canavan and Senator Rennick. They don't want these folk named. They don't want these purveyors of misinformation, these utterly unhinged folk who are contending that masks don't work, that lockdowns don't work. Maybe they don't even think coronavirus is real. And this government wants to delete reference to them, or well, doesn't want them named in this motion. It's nothing more than a protection racket once again from this government. There is not a badly behaved man in their ranks that they will not run a protection racket for. We've seen it with the treatment of women, um, and now we're seeing it with the treatment of the fringe dwellers in their party that do not understand the science, whether it's the climate science or whether it's the health science. Um, and this government doesn't want to admit 
and it certainly doesn't want to discipline these people. But they need to because these folk are doing real damage. Look at the bloke that just went up from Sydney to Byron because he doesn't think COVID is real and he doesn't believe in vaccinations. He has sent them into a lockdown. He is potentially endangering the lives of many people, young and old, as we now see, because we've had a man in his 20s and a man in his 30s now die from this virus, and I understand they weren't fully vaccinated. Disinformation about the effectiveness of vaccination is killing people. And this government's response is to say that they don't want to specifically name Senator Canavan and Senator Rennick, who are part of the cabal of disinformation in their own ranks. It is absolutely abominable. Take some responsibility. Call out these people. Send that message to the Australian public that they are desperate to hear from their government to show some leadership and tell them to get vaccinated and, what's more, order some bloody vaccines so that they can actually get the vaccine. The Australian public expect the government to run the country. If you need me to withdraw, withdraw the word bloody, I will do so. But the sentiment is clear. This government has not taken this crisis seriously. It's been everybody else's responsibility except the Prime Minister. He won't take responsibility to lead the nation, and he won't even take responsibility to call out the fringe dwellers within his own party. And I wonder why. It's because he's only got a one-seat majority. He can't afford to pull up these dangerous fools in his own coalition. But the result of that is that Australian lives are threatened. And through his silence, the Prime Minister undermines the work of nurses, of doctors, of aged care workers, of cleaners, of factory workers. His silence exposes them unnecessarily to this deadly virus. To the Prime Minister, the Greens say that protecting the lives of Australians from both COVID and climate collapse, I might add, is far more important than reinforcing those dangerous and deadly worldviews from those members of parliament through the Prime Minister's silence. They should be expelled from his party, and the Prime Minister should immediately call them out and distance himself from them. The lives and the safety of Australians depend upon it. Uh, Senator Hanson is seeking the call. Senator Hanson. Political stunt this is. It was handled in the lower house. It was raised by the Labor Party. It was put to the vote. The coalition government supported the Labor in their, in their um, move in the lower house. So it was dealt with there to throw George Christensen under the bus. But here, Penny Wong, she acts, Senator Wong, has to make her stance here to actually keep the debate going. So it's a political stunt as far as I'm concerned. And actually, Senator Wong, I feel a bit insulted that my name wasn't on the list as well, um, along with um, Canavan and Rennick. I, I just don't understand where you're headed with all this. And I know what it's like to have been thrown on the bus because it's happened to me over the years by politicians who stand high and mighty. People who have been elected to parliament have a right to stand up and have their say and have a view. As on Kyle and Jackie O's program last week, I was bleeped out from having an opinion. And Kyle said, what the hell is happening? He said, she is a senator, she has a right to have an opinion. Yes, we do have a right to have an opinion and have a say, as does Matt, Senator Canavan and Senator Rennick. We all have a right to say. We have been given misinformation all the way right from the very beginning. I don't think the health officers know exactly what they're saying because we've got one set of health officers telling one thing and another set telling us another. The people are so confused in this nation that it has been a, a, an absolute balls up with people. You're worrying about the health. I know I'm saying that it, it is real. I have not advised people not to have vaccinations. I have said, do your research and understand what is best for you. Here we have the Queensland Health Minister, um, Jeanette Young, saying, I wouldn't recommend AstraZeneca to anyone under 40 years of age. You've got more chance of dying from the vaccination than you do from having COVID. So here we have, oh, you can't say that. Have we had the truth about what people have actually died from the COVID vaccination or have they actually died with it? Where are the facts there? We have, we've had scientists, if you go even to climate change, we've had the scientists that have told us that uh, it's totally different climate change. 
These are things that the people are so confused in this nation that we're hearing from one set of scientists a different opinion to those on the other side. But what I'll say about it, and I fully support George uh, Christensen's comments and his right to say them, as I do with any other member of parliament. And I have stood true to my form, even with Fraser Anning, when you tried to bring the stunt in. He is a member of parliament at that time and had a right to say what he wants to, because they can't, don't come in line with your views and your ideology that everyone has to be thrown under the bus. Let the people judge us and what we say. But people want to see us stand up and have that difference of opinion and debate the issues, what is happening, not shut down because it doesn't go with your narrative and what you want us to say. A lot more members of parliament, and I'll tell the people this, a lot more members of parliament would dearly love to speak out, but they don't, in fear of not getting pre-selection or moving up the political ladder to become a minister. So you're controlled. People want true and honesty, truth and honesty from our politicians not leading the political line that suits their agenda. And this is all this is. It's just a political stunt by the Labor Party. It was dealt with in the, Labor, in the lower house. But I blame the Prime Minister. You allowed it to happen. You allowed one of your members to be thrown under, under the bus by the Labor Party. Now you have to wear it in the upper house. So I'd suggest to the, to the, the coalition, stand up for your members of parliament. And uh, it's not, there is nothing wrong what they have said. It is nothing wrong for anyone questioning the system because that is our job as members of parliament to question it. And then we will find the right answers. I, over the years, I've been trying to be shut down with immigration, multiculturalism, even climate change about the water issues, everything in Australia. We're supposed to be shut down because I don't have a right to have that opinion. It is so important that we are allowed to voice our opinions. As I said, the people want diversity. They want debate. We want the truth. That's all people are asking for with regards to this COVID. And if you're worrying about those people that may get infected, yes, it's more contagious than Delta, but it doesn't mean it's a death sentence. You are destroying people's lives, businesses. They are going under with suicide attempts. The kids of this nation don't know what's going to happen to them. You, we are destroying them and you don't even have the answers. It's about time you both work together to give people confidence in this country when they can get on with their lives instead of playing your political stunts. Thank you. Senator Wong. I'm happy to see to Senator Canavan. Uh, Senator Canavan. Giving me my voice. But have I got the call? Sorry? Yes, yeah, sorry. sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I, I rise to, to oppose this motion because this motion seeks to turn this House of Review into a House of Censorship. This motion seeks to silence people who are elected representatives of the Australian people from, spreading, from speaking about a particular viewpoint. That is our job. That is our job. Our job is to express views and opinions. Sometimes, sometimes we might even disagree with each other on those views and, and opinions, because God forbid, God forbid that this House would be a place of debate. God forbid that we would have uh, differences of opinion between each other and actually argue it out respectfully and put different views, because that's what this motion seeks to do. This motion seeks to make sure that we all continue to get paid during the pandemic. We just don't do our job. We just don't do our job anymore, because our job here is to debate different issues. And if you don't like someone's view, have, have an, you've got a voice, have an argument. Put the other perspective and convince people of the different opinion. Because Senator Wong, in her contribution here, Madam Acting Deputy President, Senator Wong spoke of weakness. Spoke of weakness. Well, how weak is it that you can't even have a debate? How weak is it that apparently the leader of the opposition is placed her greatest fear is a 90-second statement from the member of Dawson. How is it that, that that is not weak? How weak is that, that she can't even stand up and have a debate and put a different view? She instead wants to censor and silence people. We've been through tough times as a nation, Madam Acting Deputy President, and this is a tough time. And I do support the part of this motion that seeks to recognise the, uh, the efforts of frontline health workers. This is a very tough time for our nation. But we've been through tougher times. We've been through tougher times. During World War II, this place met. During World War II, this place had a debate about war strategy. During World War II, the Labor Party brought down an elected government with a vote of no confidence in the other place. 
During World War II, the House of Commons had, Nor had the Norway debates, where they debated for three days the war strategy of the Prime Minister at the time, Neville Chamberlain. And he lost his job at the end of it. We had debates. They were leaders. They were leaders. Where the Australian people is calling out for where are the leaders today? Because all of us are apparently cowering because the member for Dawson spoke for 90 seconds in the House of Representatives the other day. That is a joke. That is not doing our job. Because there's one thing that has happened. If there's one thing that has unfortunately happened during this pandemic, it is a complete lack of parliamentary accountability. We have not had accountability for the decisions that governments have made. Almost all the decisions that have been made under public health orders have not gone through this place. There has not been legislation. There has not been a committee. There has not been disallowable instruments. So all the businesses that have been shut down, all, all the restrictions that have been put on people's freedoms have happened without even a scintilla of parliamentary accountability. I, I think that's a big question for us post this, whether that's the right approach. But to even silence the limited abilities for parliamentarians to, uh, to try to hold uh, to account those who are making decisions over people's livelihoods and their freedoms, to then say even that bit, even a 90-second statement can't be made. We are not doing our job because our job, our job is to review the decisions of government. That's what this place is meant to be. That's what this place is about. And I don't want to turn us as senators into a bunch of noddies because many of us have been there at the press conferences behind other people where we just nod our heads in agreement. That's what this motion seeks to do. It seeks to turn us into a bunch of noddies, which all we do, apparently, all we do is just stand there and nod our head behind whatever the government or whatever officials are saying at the time. And those of us that are supporting this motion and who want to turn us into a bunch of noddies, you do not deserve the title of senator. And if you want to be a senator, you've got to be willing to get into the debate. You've got to be willing uh, to get into the fight. And sometimes your views will be held to account. Sometimes your people oh, yeah. might disagree with your views. But have the guts, show the leadership to stand up for your opinions instead of seeking to silence others. There is a great disconnect in this country. There is a great disconnect between what we do here and what people think and believe out in the public. And the reason for that, a big reason for that disconnect, is because there is a pale of censorship that has come over our political discourse in the last couple of decades. And if we support and continue that pale of discourse, we will only, only widen that gap between parliamentarians and the representatives of this country. The sooner we allow us to do our job and debate things again, the better for our Thank nation. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Your time has expired. Um, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. Well, this motion today, um, part A and part B, is absolutely to be commended because the true heroes of this pandemic have been our frontline workers. They have been our essential services workers. And I think everybody in this country owes a debt of gratitude to those people. Um, thank you, Senator Rustin. Senator Wong. Point of order. As part of the informal arrangements that the managers engaged in, the government agreed to take two spots. The government have had two spots. I'd ask the manager to, I'd ask the manager, uh, to uh, allow Senator Watt to speak, consistent with the arrangement she agreed to with my manager. It's a matter of courtesy. Senator Rustin. Order. Um, if uh, the Leader of the Opposition hadn't ceded her position to the, this side of the chamber, then that, those arrangements would have been in place. However, uh, I mean, I, Penny, uh, sorry, Madam, De uh, Madam Deputy President, I, I would have stood at the time had the, the Leader of the Opposition ceded the call to this side of the chamber. However, she was specific about who she'd ceded the call to. Senator Wong, you seeking the call? I am, I am going to say to the chamber that the arrangements that exist between managers are obviously not covered in the standing orders. Made clear, she, her intention was to silence Senator Canavan. Uh, my, my request is the government allow, by leave, Senator Watt to speak at the conclusion of the debate. Is leave granted? Chamber. Uh, I'm happy to speak for a couple of minutes and then allow the remainder of the time to be ceded to Senator well, Watt, um, if Senator, that would be satisfactory to the chamber. Thank you, Senator Rustin. Senator uh, Wong has sought leave for an additional five minutes. 
Is that agreed? If there's no objection, I'm going to assume it's agreed. I'm going to assume it's agreed. I haven't heard anyone disagree. And please continue, Senator Rustin. No, uh, Madam Deputy President, in the interest of saving time and returning to the important matters of business, I will cede my time to Senator Watt, but I would like my objection noted. Thank you, Senator Rustin. Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President, and thank you, Senator Rustin, uh, for uh, ceding your time. Uh, as this motion makes clear, uh, this, we are calling on the Senate, first of all, to applaud the incredible sacrifices made by the Australian people and the heroes of our pandemic, the essential workers who have kept our, us safe. Now, all Australians and these heroes of the pandemic have been profoundly let down uh, by a small group of government MPs who are determined to run a constant misinformation campaign about COVID. Uh, and they are also being profoundly let down by a weak Prime Minister who never takes responsibility. He never takes responsibility for bushfires, for vaccines, and he's not taking responsibility for ensuring that his own members of parliament and his own senators actually uh, contribute to the public debate in a way that keeps us safe. Now, of course, this motion focuses on the efforts of the member for Dawson, Mr Christensen, who for many months has been waging an online COVID misinformation campaign, building up his Facebook followers for his post-parliamentary career at the expense of the health and economy of Australians. Uh, this has culminated this week in his infamous speech uh, given to the House of Representatives, which I noticed that Facebook has now removed uh, from its videos uh, because it contained harmful health information in breach of its COVID misinformation policy. So a tech giant like Facebook, which is all about making money and, let's face it, has allowed the spread of a lot of misinformation over the years, even they are prepared to take action. Uh, to ensure that Mr Christensen's dangerous lies are not being spread into the community, but the Prime Minister won't take action, and nor will the Deputy Prime Minister as well. Now, this motion, of course, also focuses on the continued efforts of Senator Canavan and Senator Rennick to also engage in a misinformation campaign, which we all know is about them courting far-right votes in the community, dragging them back from One Nation, which is why Pauline Hanson, Senator Hanson, is so upset about what's going on as well. This is a deliberate tactic from Senators Canavan and Rennick to court far-right votes to make sure that they and their government get re-elected. Now, I have been asking for some time why it is that the Prime Minister won't take action and won't take responsibility uh, for the comments of his government members. And it has now been made very clear today by comments made by the Deputy Prime Minister on ABC TV this morning. When asked why Mr Joyce was not prepared to take action about Mr Christensen's disinformation campaign, he said, if you start prodding the bear, you're going to make the situation worse for us as a government, not better. And I'll say that to my colleagues. I can assure you that when you've got a thin margin, don't start giving reasons for a by-election. So finally, someone in the government has been honest about why they are not prepared to do anything about the constant misinformation campaign uh, conducted by Mr Christensen and also by senators such as Senator Rennick and Senator Canavan. It is because this government cares more about hanging on to power than about actually taking responsibility and making sure that its own members are not conducting a misinformation campaign. This government is more concerned about hanging on to their own jobs than about stopping misinformation being put into the community, which is endangering people's health and endangering the jobs and economy uh, that all Australians enjoy. This government is more concerned about their own jobs than about the jobs of tourism workers on the Gold Coast, in Cairns and every other place in the country that is now uh, at risk because of the poor vaccine rollout of this government, because of their failure to deliver quarantine and now because of their failure to take serious action about the efforts of their own uh, MPs. How can we expect the Australian people to listen to government messaging, to, uh, to comply with restrictions and take precautions if we've got members of the government out there day after day encouraging Australians to do exactly the opposite? 
How can the government expect any of the money that it's being put in, into its public information campaign to work when it is constantly being undermined by their own MPs? So this motion is a test for this government. It was passed by members of the government in the House of Representatives. It's clear that some members of this government won't back it when it's put to a vote in this chamber. It's clear that Senator Canavan, for instance, uh, won't be supporting this motion because he says that he needs to do his job. Well, unfortunately, it seems that Senator, for Senator Canavan and other members of this government, they consider to the, their job to be spreading disinformation rather than actually uh, engaging in a proper discussion and encouraging Australians to do the right thing to protect their health for themselves, for their families, for their communities and for the sake of the Australian economy. It is an utter disgrace that this government has allowed this misinformation campaign to go on. It's about time they took action and put other Order, jobs in Senator front of their White, own. time for the debate has expired. I'll put the Amendment moved by Senator Birmingham. Oh, sorry, Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I ask a question on the amendment that paragraph D. Um, I ask for the question on the amendment to paragraph D and the amendment to paragraph F to be put separately. So separately and together, or separately? So we have three votes. Do you wish? Separate. Yeah. So on the amendment. Um, oh, yeah. Sorry. Quite right. I've got, I've got the amended. Yeah. Two separate amendments. Okay. So I'll first put. Um, the amendment moved by Senator Birmingham to paragraph D of the motion. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. No's no. No. No have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells.
Stop the valve. Oh, sorry, the sand is still going. Stop the valves. The question is that the amendment to paragraph D of the motion that is moved by Senator Birmingham, the amendment that is, be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Smith tell off the ayes and Senator Urquhart tell off the noes. The result of the division is ayes 19, noes 17. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. So the motion has been amended in paragraph D. The question is now that the amendment to paragraph F be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. So the question now is that the motion as amended in paragraphs D and F be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Well, Senator Roberts. So President. the question is that the motion as amended, it has been amended in both paragraphs D and F in terms of the government's amendments. The question is the motion as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. The question is the motion as amended be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Smith, tell her for the ayes. Senator Roberts, tell her for the noes.
The result of the division is eyes 33, noes 4. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. I call on the clerk to call on business. Government business order of the day number one. Family assistance legislation amendment, child care subsidy bill 2021. Second reading debate and on the amendment moved by Senator Pratt. Chamber is someone seeking the call? Minister. Um, oh, I need to take this off, don't I? <laughs> um, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, well, firstly, in relation to the Family Assistance Legislation Amendment Child Care Subsidy Bill 2021, can I thank all senators for the contribution that they've made to this bill in the Chamber? Uh, the facts are that since we came into office, our record $10 billion investment in childcare is 77 per cent higher than it was under the previous Labor government. There are over 280,000 more children in childcare today, and women's workforce participation reached a record high of 61.8 per cent in March 2021, up from 58.7 per cent when Labor was last in office. This policy will make a difference for many, many Australian families. By removing barriers for second income earners, especially women who want to return to work, to work an extra day, the Treasury estimates around 40,000 mums and dads will get to work that extra day. This alone translates into $1.5 billion of a boost to our economy each and every year. By increasing the subsidy for families with a second or third child uh, five years and under, 250,000 Australian families will be better off on average by $2,260 per year. As an example, an average family today with two children in care and an income of $110,000 a year will be better off by $120 a week. That's $120 a week back in the pockets of hard-working Australian families. Our design of this policy is purposeful. We've targeted our support for families who need it the most. When they have two or more children in care and out-of-pocket costs to their family budget are at their highest. We're also removing the annual cap that is in place for families earning over $190,000, so there is no cap on subsidies. Our childcare system is designed to work for Australian families. On this side, we support families' choice. Our childcare system is fair for those who use it and fair for those who don't. We stand by the principles of our childcare system. Our system provides more support for those on lower incomes. Families earning over $350,000 don't receive any taxpayer-funded childcare subsidy. An activity test means you need to be working, studying or training to access the subsidy, and an hourly fee cap keeps downward pressure on fees. Around 87.5 per cent of services are charged under the hourly rate cap. Our policies have kept out-of-pocket costs low, with the out-of-pocket costs for family almost $1 an hour cheaper on average than before we introduced our package in 2018. Okay. Um, our changes are an investment in Australian families and our economy. Our plan is supporting parents, especially mums, to return to work or work more hours if they choose to. That's why the Business Council, Jennifer Westercott, says, and I quote, it's good for mums and dads, it's good for business and it's good for the economy. We are proud of our record of delivering for all Australian families and I commend this bill to the Senate. Thank you, Minister. Senator Waters. Yes, Acting uh, Deputy President, I uh, would like to move the second reading amendments, which uh, Senator Faruqi uh, did online. I understand that I need to do that given that I'm in person. So I um, so move the second reading amendment in Senator Faruqi's name on sheet 1383. And I also move the second reading amendment in my own name on sheet 1384. Okay. Um, Senator Waters, we already have um, a second reading amendment from Senator Pratt. That's the question before the chair at the moment, so we will deal with that and then deal with the amendments that you will be moving on behalf of Senator Faruqi, if that's all right. Thank you. Therefore, the question before the chamber is that the second reading amendment, as moved by Senator Pratt, be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. 
I think the noes have it. The noes have the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Uh, stop the bells. So the question is that the motion, the second reading amendment motion moved by Senator Pratt be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator McGrath as teller for the noes.
order, there being 15 ayes and 15 noes, the matter is negated. I think we'll now go to Senator Waters, I believe, to move uh, an amendment on behalf of Senator Faruqi. Senator Waters. Thank you very much, Deputy President. And I uh, move on behalf of Senator Faruqi amendment uh, on sheet 1383 in Senator Faruqi's name uh, relating to the fact that childcare should be free. So the question is that the motion as moved by Senator Waters on behalf of Senator Faruqi be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. Uh, I believe the noes have it. Division required. Um, ring the bells for one minute. Order, stop the bells. So the question is that the amendment as moved by Senator Waters on behalf of Senator Furuki be agreed to. The ayes should move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Seawitt as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order, there being five ayes and 25 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. And I'll go back to Senator Waters. Senator Waters. Yes, thank you. I've just broken my microphone. Anyway, um, uh, thank you, Deputy President. I now move uh, second reading amendment standing in uh, my name, uh, which is on sheet 1384, um, which pertains to the fact that we are in a climate crisis and our kids need us to deal with that properly. So the question is that the second reading amendment as moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute.
stop the bells. So the question is that the second reading amendment is moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Seawitt as teller for the ayes and Senator Chisholm as teller for the noes. Order. There being five ayes and 23 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I'll just allow senators who aren't participating uh, in this matter any further to leave the chamber and for others to get back to their seats. So the question is that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion. Oh, beg your pardon. Sorry, Senator Waters. I'm just indicating that Senator, uh, Senator Faruqi would like the call to uh, move a uh, committee stage amendment and to ask some questions. Okay, so we're just not quite at the committee stage yet, but we're nearly there. Um, so the question is that the bills be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to family assistance and for related purposes. So I believe uh, we have a committee stage. I'm just wait for. Thanks. Ta. So with the concurrence of the Senate, the statements of reason accompanying the request circulated for this bill will be incorporated in Hansard immediately after the request to which they relate. Uh, there being no objection, it is so ordered, and I believe Senator Faruqi is seeking the call. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. Um, I'd like to ask the minister. Um, my understanding is that in the bill as circulated, there's an error which means that families that earn between $70,000 and $175,000 would not receive the rate of subsidy as was announced by the minister as part of the budget. Um, could the minister please confirm that the government amendment, which was circulated last night, will address this problem? Minister. Thank you, um, Senator Faruqi. Uh, the amendment that is uh, was before the chamber this morning will address that issue. Uh, Chair, could I have the call again? Senator Faruqi, yes, you may. Minister, could I ask you when um, the government found out about this error and were you alerted to it by someone or did you realise it on your own? Uh, thank you, um, Minister. Uh, thank you. Senator Faruqi, I'm advised that, um, uh, that, th that we were made aware of it uh, yesterday morning uh, on advice from the office of the minister. Uh, Chair, Senator could I Faruqi. have a call? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks for that, Minister. Really, all I can say is that it is such a huge impact. The Greens will support this amendment, of, of course, because it was a terrible error that would, you know, even undermine the modest reform that the government has made. And what an embarrassment, really, for the government that your headline childcare spend, no matter how modest it was, was so poorly drafted. I mean, this government was dragged 
to the table to invest something in child care and you can't even get a very basic reform right and i think it tells you all you need to know about the government's incompetence and how much you really don't care about early education and learning thanks chair thank you thank senator you. faruqi i'm in the hands of the chamber um uh, Senator Pratt. Um, I just had a couple of questions. Thank you, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. In the context of these reforms and the sustainability of uh, childcare centres and in the context of sustainability of families' payments towards fees, I would note uh, that childcare providers currently have been told to stand down staff to save money uh, and that while the government has given permission to centres to waive gap fees, in many cases childcare centres have not been able to afford to do that because they know that they need to hang on to their staff and they can't afford to do that in any case. Can I ask the government why you've ignored pleas for support from childcare centres and indeed the pleas of families for the respite from gap fees being charged? Minister. Uh, thank you very much, um, Madam uh, Acting Deputy President. Well, first of all, um, can I absolutely categorically state that the government would never advise centres to stand down their staff? Um, and we also, uh, the government has provided um, unprecedented support to, to centres and to families. You know, we are backing families and the childcare sector simultaneously during this pandemic, and I believe we've acted very swiftly to ensure that the mechanisms are put in place to reflect um, the completely uncertain times that we find ourselves in. So, for instance, for families, we're allowing services to waive out-of-pocket costs and uh, have extended the number of days families are allowed to keep children absent before they lose access to the childcare subsidy. For childcare businesses, the Commonwealth has partnered in particular uh, with New South Wales to facilitate swift support through JobSaver to help businesses meet payroll costs if they've experienced a 30 per cent uh, decline in revenue. And for childcare workers, you know, an absolutely critical workforce um, for our economy, where a worker has had hours reduced, they are eligible for the COVID disaster payment of up to $750 per week. Senator Pratt. So you disagree that the government told lockdown providers sorry childcare providers in the lockdown to stand down staff um, it was the department of education as i understand it that advised that no the advice so childcare providers are wrong can can childcare centers if they are struggling can they currently stand down staff minister yeah yeah um, the, you've asked me two questions. Oh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. You've asked me two questions. Uh, my advice is very strongly um, that the government has not, at any time, instructed childcare centres to stand down staff. Um, whether uh, the actions of the centres themselves are a matter for them in relation to their uh, their staffing arrangements. Senator Pratt. Well, the amendments to the Fair Work Act enabling the standing down of staff in the context of uh, COVID no longer exist. So in the context of a childcare centre not being able to um, afford to waive fees to parents because otherwise um, it can't stay afloat, staff may frankly go and get other jobs because um, they can't you can't afford if you can't afford to pay them they have to leave. What advice are you giving childcare centres who are struggling? They've told us they are struggling. They've advocated this week that they're struggling. 
yes, you've given some measures, but they're saying it's not enough. What is the government doing about this? Minister. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, the government has um, allowed um, for the fees to be be waived, and but the government is still continuing um, to provide to pay the government um, uh, fees to the child care centres. Um, so even if children are absent from the child care centre, um, the government fees will still continue to be paid by the government to the child care centre. Senator Pratt. What proportion of centres have waived who are in lockdown zones who have had attendance collapse have waived their fees? Minister. Senator, I am advised that that information um, is not information that the Commonwealth um, has collected. So we would be unaware of the answer to that. Senator Lambie. Thank you. Just while we're on this question, I wonder, does the government have a um, at least childcare places make quite a substantial amount of money. So do you actually have their uh, is there somewhere I can find where how much money they've made over the last um, couple of years? Because I can tell you what, they're not screaming poor. So so I'm just wondering, does the government keep a list or can I find that um, somewhere of their profits that they've made over the past two years in these childcare centres? Minister. Uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you, Senator uh, uh, Lambie. Um, many of the childcare um, providers are large businesses and would be uh, producing annual reports. Uh, so I would certainly point you to, um, to looking at the annual reports um, of the big providers, uh, if you require um, further information about the, who those big providers are, um, I'm sure that we could uh, provide that information for you. Senator Pratt, what is the data around? We all know that yes, you get charged uh, the, the full fee, irrespective of when you, whether you do or don't attend normally. But if what's what's the change in attendance rates um, because of uh, lockdowns. How many families are paying the gap fee without attending? Minister. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, my advice is that we are monitoring the, um, the, the information that you are seeking very closely. Um, however, as it lags a couple of weeks, I'm advised that we don't have a full set of data to be able to respond to that question at this time. Senator Pratt. How can you say that you are helping families and helping childcare centres if you don't actually know who you are helping and who you are not? It seems that, yes, some parents will get some financial respite um, by not being charged those fees if they're not attending, but at the expense of the sustainability of some childcare centres. When do you expect you'll have that data? Minister. Well, thank you. Well, first, uh, first of all, um, you know, I want to reiterate the fact that we have um, responded um, in this pandemic by providing support to families, provide support to childcare businesses and to provide support to childcare workers. And I will continue to reiterate that. Um, I, we believe um, at the moment that on average um, a guaranteed 55 per cent of fees um, in the Sydney area are for children who are attending, uh, along with the regular fees for, for children who are attending, um, is at this stage our, our estimate of what, it, uh, what the situation is. However, we, as I said before, we will continue to monitor the situation um, to make sure that we um, are alive to the very important service that is provided by childcare providers um, during this pandemic. Senator Pratt. Can I ask, in the context of the legislation, what modelling the government did around workforce participation uh, when examining the income limits for eligibility in the legislation? Minister. Uh, thank you. Um, the income limits that, ha um, that ha are being used for the, for the changes that are being put forward by this particular amendment bill are the same um, limits that were in place for childcare um, in, in the past. 
Senator Pratt. Indeed they are. So you've paid no attention as to whether the current disincentives to work because of childcare fees, um, you've paid no attention to the need to address those in this legislation then, have you? Minister. No, not at, uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy. No, not at all. That is, that is completely un, uh, factually incorrect. Um, you know, obviously, um, uh, the Treasury continues to do modelling around many factors that exist, in, particularly in relation, as you are, are asking, around workforce participation. Senator Lambie. Oh, thank you, um, Acting. Madam Acting Deputy President, um, Minister, you found out about the drafting error yesterday. How is it that you were able to pass? How are you about to pass a bill with such a big mistake in there? Um, can you please explain to us how that actually happens? Minister, uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, Senator Lambie, I, I am not aware of the details of how this error occurred. Um, all I can say is that as soon as it was brought to the attention um, of the government, we sought to rectify it immediately. Senator Lambie. Yeah, I, I understand this is Minister Tudge, and I, I do apologise for putting you in this position, but uh, do you know if Minister Tudge's office spotted the error themselves, or did the government become aware of it because someone on Twitter commented about it about midnight on Tuesday night? Minister. Yeah, um, thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, Senator Lambie, um, I, I don't actually have that information. All I know is that as uh, when the bill was here, I, I was advised, or the, the Senate was advised, the government was advised in the Senate um, of the error um, from Minister Tudge's office yesterday morning. Senator Lambie. Thank you. Um, I just have one more question. Could you please tell us if we had have passed Minister Tudge's bill? Before, you'd, before the amendment was picked up, which was somebody probably on someone which was on Twitter, which I'd really like to know because it's rather embarrassing for either side, or Labor didn't pick it up either, that you have all these staff, all these things at your, at, at your disposal, and yet we're making massive mistakes. What would have happened if we'd have put this bill through without now amending it? Minister. Um, thank you. Um, Senator Lambie. Um, my understanding is that um, you know, it would have been a matter that would have been picked up when the IT build was, uh, was being undertaken, but um, I take your point. Um, you know, it was an error um, and it was sought to be uh, rectified as soon as possible. I'm in the hands of the Chamber. Senator Pratt. Um, can I ask, in the context of workforce participation, I've received significant impact, uh, um, significant advocacy from psychiatrists and others who are concerned about the return to work for women in, you know, reasonably well-paid industries, saying that it's currently a significant disincentive to them returning to work because um, of the rate of childcare fees. Um, sure, they probably receive a good income from doing so, but they have to you know, pay for the, the extra juggle that comes with um, taking child, children to childcare. Can I ask more specifically what assessment the government has really done to look at some of the critical workforce shortages that exist in Australia, particularly in this time of COVID, where we know we can't import um, labour from overseas? Have you actually addressed and considered where you need to pull the levers to lift workforce participation and why you haven't properly considered those issues in the context of the bill that's before us today. Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, one of the main reasons why we lifted the annual cap was for the very reason that you're, you're raising. Um, we also, more broadly, as a government, have been um, developing a very substantial skills package to make sure that we have got the, the workforce that we require going forward. So, um, you know, in the context of this bill, but more broadly in the context of the entire workforce, the government continues to work. Um, on modelling to make sure that we have the skills that, and the, of, of the workforce that we require to go forward. Senator Pratt. So, in that context, um, I ask uh, why this bill doesn't come into effect until 
the middle of next year if you're saying that it's to address workforce participation and shortages, that's when those changes come into effect, or have I read that wrong? Minister. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. If the bill is able to be implemented sooner, uh, oh, sorry, if that the actions of the bill are able to be implemented sooner, they will be. Senator Pratt. So what does that what does that mean? I know that the the Greens have sought to move forward um, with a request from the Senate in their amendment to bring forward some of those changes. Are you saying you might do that of your own volition as a government? Minister. Thank you. Um, because of the complexity of the systems build that's required for this to actually be able to be undertaken, uh, we wanted to make sure that it was a phased implementation approach, and that's why um, you know, Service Australia has uh, requested the, um, the, the, the completion time for the necessary systems um, would be uh, July 2022. Um, however, if, uh, if this is able to be um, brought forward uh, in the context of all the work that Services Australia is currently undertaking in relation to uh, many of the, the things that they're having to do to respond to the COVID pandemic as it is evolving, um, but of course, um, as soon as we are able to make the build, uh, to put the build in place, then we want to make sure that these policy changes are uh, in place uh, and that the Australian families can benefit from them. Senator Pratt. I think in that context, I'm not sure that the Greens have moved their amendment uh, yet, but I would note in that context that we encourage the government to get on with this as soon as they can because we need increased support for childcare. However, we can't support this amendment because we view it simply as a stunt, knowing that any request made by the Senate that has funding implications needs to be uh, done by the government and supported by the government. The Greens motion therefore gives families false hope. Uh, we encourage the government to bring forward their own um, changes in getting that system up and running. But I place on the record that only Labor has put forward a comprehensive plan for childcare that increases support. Uh, and it is simply an exercise in false hope, uh, really, to rely on this government to deliver anything. Otherwise, Labor looks forward to implementing its comprehensive package after the next election. Minister, Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much. And uh, can I just also add to Senator Faruqi's uh, questions? Uh, I can also confirm that I have been working uh, since the government announced this initiative with Minister Tudge, Services Australia and his department, and we have worked very closely on the timeline, but it does require very significant systems change to actually deliver. So we have always been uh, very cautious but very deliberate in our planning and our time frame. So as Minister Rustin has said, if we can uh, bring it forward, we will. But again, it's more important that we get this system right to be able to deliver it for Australian families. Thank you, Minister. Um, Minister, are you seeking to move the government amendment? I am. I, I, I seek to move amendments one and two and request uh, amendment three on government sheet PV119. The question is that the amendments and the request for an amendment as moved by the minister be agreed to. Uh, if we don't have any debate, oh, on, uh, we're preempting Senator Pratt. Um, if we don't have any debate um, on that motion, I'll put the question. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. <laughs> those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, we then have the uh, uh, minister. Thank you. Uh, I table a supplementary explanatory memorandum relating to the government amendments and request for an amendment to be moved to this bill. Uh, I've got a table. The uh, I need to table the explanatory memorandum. You may table it, minister. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and we have. Senator, Senator for move for, the Greens amendment. Ruki. Thank you, thank you. Um, I move the Greens request for amendment on sheet one three five three 
Um, this request for am an amendment is very simple. It brings forward the start date of the package by one year to 1 July 2021. As I foreshadowed in my speech on the second reader, families need more support and they need it urgently. During the debate in this bill, so many senators have highlighted, so many senators on this side of the chamber have highlighted the issues with childcare, how expensive it is and how difficult it is for families. So there is no good reason why the government can't prioritize getting more money into the pockets of families who continue to be slugged with some of the highest childcare fees in the world. It is the government's responsibility to actually do that, not say we will if we can. It's in your control if it is a priority for you and it should be a priority for you. Over the last 18 months, we have seen the rules rewritten entire government spending programs recalibrated or conjured from nothing as the pandemic has demanded swift and substantial policy responses. So in that light, it seems completely ridiculous to suggest that more than a full year is required in order to enact these changes through the existing government systems. We know that the government has said that it would like to start the scheme as soon as possible. Well, it's up to you to start it as soon as possible. It's up to you to start it now. And if that is indeed the case, it's time to get a clear commitment. And I think it's pretty bloody rich for Labour to stand here and say, this is a Greens stunt. This is, if the Senate agrees to this amendment today, it is going to send a very clear and very strong message to the government to make this change. That's what we're here for. This is not a stunt. Senator Pratt, this is actually trying to fix a problem that the families and children and women have had for a very long time. So I do call on Labour and the crossbench senators that actually if you do want to support um, childcare workers and educators, if you do want to support families, women and children, then at least agree to this Greens amendment, which will provide that support, however uh, modest it might be. Thank you, Senator Faruqi, the minister. Thank you. Uh, look, and can I first of all start by thanking Senator Faruqi for her incredibly productive engagement on this bill and for confirming her support for its passage. However, the government will not be supporting this amendment for the reasons that I and I think I understand Senator Rustin have outlined, because it does require significant uh, systems and software changes, which are not just uh, for Services Australia but also for third-party software providers uh, because of the interface with thousands of childcare providers. Thank you, Minister. If no other senators are seeking the call, I will put the question that the request for an amendment um, as moved by Senator Faruqi be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the noes have it. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. The question is that the request for an amendment, as moved by Senator Faruqi, be agreed to. Oh, as moved by Senator Waters on behalf of Senator Faruqi, be agreed to. Um, the ayes will pass to the right of the chair. The noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Seawitt Teller for the ayes and Senator Chisholm Teller for the noes. Order. The result of the division is ayes 5, noes 25. The question is resolved in the negative. The question now is that the bill as amended be agreed to subject to a request for an amendment. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The question now is that the bill be reported. The committee has considered the Family Assistance Legislation Amendment Child Care Subsidy Bill 2021 and agreed to it with amendments and requests. Senators, because the bill has been agreed to subject to a request, it will not be read a third time. A message will be sent to the House requesting that the House make that amendment. I call the clerk. Government Business Order of the Day No. 2, Counter-Terrorism Legislation Amendment, Sunsetting Review and Other Measures Bill 2021, Resumption of Second Reading Debate. I'll give senators a moment to vacate the chamber if they are not speaking on this bill. Senator Pratt. Thank you. Labor supports this bill. We have in this legislation a range of counter-terrorism and other police powers in the Crimes Act of 1914 and the Criminal Code Act of 1995, which are due to expire on 7 September 2021. The powers are declared areas, provisions, the control order regime, the preventative detention regime, and a range of stop and search seizure powers. This bill extends the sunset dates on each of these powers. It allows the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security to conduct a review of the operation, effectiveness and proportionality of declared areas provisions prior to the new sunset clause. Finally, the bill would amend the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor Act to give the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor more time to finalise their review of the continuing detention order regime. Control order prevention, preventative detention and stop and search seizure powers, uh, which are all due to expire on sep 7 September of this year, are currently under review by the Intelligence and Security Committee. We support the proposed extension of the sunset dates to 7 December 
of next year. This extension ensures that the Intelligence and Security Committee has sufficient time to complete its review prior to using the powers sunsetting, and the government will have sufficient time to work through and respond to any recommendations made by the committee. The declared areas provisions are in a different category. The declared areas provisions of the Criminal Code allow the Foreign Minister, sorry, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, to declare an area in a foreign country if he or she is satisfied that a list of terrorist organisations, sorry, that listed terrorist organisation, is engaging in hostile activity in that area of the foreign country and make it an offence for a person to enter or remain in a declared area subject to a number of limited exceptions set out in 119.2 of the Criminal Code, such as providing aid of a humanitarian nature, performing an official duty for the Commonwealth or visiting a family member. The committee recommended that the sunset date for those powers be extended to 7 September 2024 and that the Intelligence and Security Committee be empowered to conduct a review of those powers at any time prior to that date. The bill implements both of those recommendations. The Intelligence and Security Committee also recommended that the declared areas provisions be amended to allow Australian citizens to request an exemption from the Minister for Foreign Affairs to travel to a declared area for a reason not listed in section 119.2 of the Criminal Code. Labor notes that following extensive consultation with government agencies, including ASIO and the AFP, the former independent national security legislation monitor, Dr James Redrick, made a similar recommendation in 2017. The government has argued that this re recommendation could not be effectively implemented and monitored, and the time and re resources required to obtain information to assess the application would be significant and would divert security and intelligence resources from other national security priorities. Labor on this matter is not persuaded. We think that the government should implement the committee's bipartisan and unanimous recommendation. Labor rec uh, recognises the implementation. Uh, this is not without its challenges and that because of the, that complexity, and the national security context, we think it is an amendment that should be drafted following close consultation with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and Australia's national security agencies. So that is why uh, Labor moves a second reading amendment calling on the government to implement the recommendation and subject to that qualification, I commend the bill for um, the bill to the Senate, and I just need to get the microphone to move. The second reading amendment. We haven't circulated it. I note that Labor moved that second reading uh, amendment in the House of Representatives, and um, we'll reflect on that in the course of this debate. Senator Thorpe. Uh, thank you, President. I rise with disappointment, it must be said, as I sought to refer the Counter-Terrorism Legislation Amendment Sunsetting Review and Other Measures Bill to the committee. I would still like to do that because it is important that this parliament reviews this legislation and provides proper community consultation. That's what we're here for, right? We don't represent ourselves. We represent the people who put us here. So we have a duty of care to take it back to the people. I know the Liberals and the Red Liberals don't want to do their job today. And we know that the committee that uh, the previous Senator spoke about doesn't even have Greens representation on it. It's just a Lib Lab um, cosy affair that makes decisions for this country without the consultation of the people. So I remind you all uh, that you have to do your job, right? You get the com car to pick you up in the morning because they're taking you to do your job and you have to do your job.
Uh, and because you are failing in this regard, it's more the reason why we need to have more Greens in power so that we have balance of power so that we could make you all accountable. It was the Morrison government that just realised that the provisions are about to expire. Like, what government? What? Who's running this country right now that allows legislation to expire when we're talking about terrorism legislation? Like, wake up! What are you doing? But obviously, that's how you operate. The do nothing until the very last minute, and then try and look like you're doing something. Well. You can't con this little black gin. Order. Three Senator, Senator Thorpe, you'll be in continuation when debate resumes. It being 11.15, we proceed to housekeeping. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator Patrick. Mr. President, I give notice that in the next sitting, uh, on the next sitting day of, uh, on the next day of sitting, uh, in specific terms that I will provide to the clerk uh, in due course very shortly, um, um, I'll be moving a motion that relates to the Tax Commissioner's response to OPD, OPD 1196. Are there any other notices of motion? Senator Waters. President, out of an abundance of caution, in uh, case it has not reached the table's office in time, I give notice that on the next day of sitting I'll move a motion pertaining to uh, Beedaloo order for production of documents uh, that may yet be resolved in the interim. Yep, the clerk has informed me it has been received. So, are there, if there being no other notices of motion, I'll call for a report from the Selection of Bills Committee. Oh, sorry. I, sorry, no, no, I'm correct. Just Senator Smith. Mr. President, I present the ninth report of 2021 of the Selection of Bills Committee, and I seek leave to have the report incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? It is. Senator Smith. Oh, Senator, you're moving. Have we moved that the bill be a, report be adopted? Report be adopted. Thank you, Senator Seward. After Senator Thorpe, um, I move at the end of the motion add and in respect of the Counter Terrorism Legislation Amendment Sunsetting Review and Other Measures Bill 2021, the bill be referred immediately to the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislative Committee for inquiry and report by 30th of August 2021. Okay, we have that amendment. Um, I will, Senator Cash. Uh, I also move the following amendment at the end of the motion add and the following bills not be referred to committee. A. Counter-terrorism legislation amendments sunsetting review and other measures bill 2021 and B. Charter of the United Nations amendment bill 2021. Uh, all right. yes, Senator Seward. Pres, I'm aware that Senator Thorpe wants to speak oh, to Senator the Senator Thorpe report. would like. Right, so what I'm going to do, on advice from the clerk, is um, I'll take the amendment moved by Senator Cash, but lay it to one side. We will deal with the amendment you moved on behalf of Senator Thorpe first before I move to that one. Senator Thorpe to speak. Oh, Senator Seward. To that I know Senator Rice also wants to make a contribution sure. on the report itself. Sure. Okay. Um, we'll get to that after we deal with the amendments. I think um, Senator Thorpe to speak to your amendment. Thank you, President. Uh, the three provisions in this bill that are about to expire, and I do mean that they're about to expire in a matter of days, and the government has only just realised. This is terrorism legislation for this country. The government have just woken up and realised that parts of the legislation are going to expire. What are they going to do about it? It's because they didn't do their job. And the Red Liberals don't want to do their job either. They want to just rush these through. Some of these provisions that are about to expire have never even been used. So you're about to put, uh, extend something that has never been used. Why hasn't it been used? Shouldn't we be asking that question? Isn't that our responsibility? The previous National Security Legislation Monitor, Brett Walker, SC, is on the record as saying that he found, and I quote, sunset provisions are problematic and that a period of 10 years appeared arbitrary. 
stating that sunset clauses should either be really very short or not used at all. Who listens to advice in that place? In which case there would be trust in future parliaments to amend, repeal, leave in force laws as the future parliaments see fit in light of circumstances that cannot possibly be predicted at the moment. End quote. So come on, let's do our job, hey? Let's hear from the likes of the Law Council of Australia, the Human Rights Watch, Save the Children and Mr Brett Walker SC himself, among many others. We can get this done soon, but we all just need to do our jobs. Let's have a short hearing and air these issues out. Just because the Morrison government didn't do its job doesn't mean that we all now have to scramble. There are plenty of concerns with this legislation and we must air those out, not to mention that the preventative detention orders and the stop search and seizure powers that the government wants to extend with the help of the Red Liberals have, been, has, have never been used. They've never been used. Labor, seriously, why are you supporting something like this? I ask the support of the Senate, let's do our job. Roll your sleeves up. Do the right thing by the people. Let's take these proposals to the people and the experts by way of a committee. Let's do it now. It can be done. If these provisions that are about to, sub, about to expire are so important and critical to this country, then can't we just follow due process? I'm, I thought that was part of, you know, the democracy, right? Is it? Or do I need to learn something different about this place? So I call on my fellow senators, if you truly and genuinely represent the constituents you say you actually do, to roll up your sleeves, get the work done, hear from the people and the experts who are saying that this is problematic. Let's, let's find out why it's problematic. Labor, have you checked out why this is problematic or you just can't be bothered because you've got your eyes set on the next election? Like, don't get too cocky here. Fix the legislation, take it to the people and stop worrying about the next election because we have a number of crises happening in this country right now. I actually don't give us a damn who gets in next. I care about the people and that's why I'm here. So think about why you're here and next time you say you're here for the people, make sure that you're walking the talk and not just rushing through dangerous legislation that excludes the people that we are meant to represent. Thank you. So I'll make it clear on advice from the clerk. I'm going to deal with contributions on the amendment moved by Senator Thorpe, the amendment moved by Senator Cash, and the, the motion on adopting the report jointly. So just to let senators know, Senator Patrick. Mr. President, I'll just be very quick in my commentary. Uh, Senator Thorpe actually has a pretty good point, and that is that uh, it's well known that the uh, the um, legislation was to sunset. Uh, and it is uh, a little bit strange that the government hasn't brought this in a, a little bit sooner. And I'd be interested in hearing from the government as to why that might have been the case. Um, it just seems very odd to me. And a proper process suggests that, uh, well, firstly, it, it would seem that proper process hasn't been uh, afforded uh, the, the Senate in, in regard to uh, notice on this. And, um, uh, you know. I'd like to think that we could, in fact, examine this, particularly in circumstances where the legislation appears not to have been, or well, those provisions of the legislation have, have um, it appears as though they haven't been used. Senator Seward. Rice wants to make a contribution. Senator Rice. 
Thank you. Thank you, President. Look, I want to speak opposing the government's amendment to not send two bills off to committee, in particular the, the proposal to not refer the Charter of United Nations Amendment Bill 2021 to committee, which seems to be a case of the government really doing its best to avoid embarrassment, to not have transparency. Because what this bill seems to do is to fix up what's been quite a big boo-boo on the behalf of not just this government, but in fact previous Labor governments too, with regards, of our, with regards to our legislation sanctioning people who have been uh, of, of terrorists. It seems from the, the current situation of that and why this bill is being introduced, that that um, sanctions regime, sanctions on terrorists, has been operating for the last 20 years illegally, that we haven't had the appropriate legislative framework um, in place to be making our ability to sanction terrorists legal. Um, as the, the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights Scrutiny Report No. 8 said, that the legislative instruments were made between 2001 and 2020 but were only registered on the Federal Register of Legislation on the 26th of May 2021. They were previously gazetted but not registered, the effect of which appears to be before they were registered, the instruments did not apply to a person to the extent that they would dis disadvantage or impose liabilities on the person. And the committee has specifically asked the question of the minister, how many of the listings in these legislative instruments are currently valid? Um, this was covered in the Saturday paper last weekend, where they summarise the situation as saying the sanctions regime under which Australia freezes the assets of suspected and convicted terrorists appears to have been operating illegally for two decades because the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade failed to entrench it properly in law. Now, obviously, we want to fix the situation and fix these failings in our sanctions regime to make sure that we're complying with the UN frameworks. But where the, the government and the department have stuffed up, we reckon there needs to be a bit of transparency. We think referring this off to committee in order to have some transparency, to work out what went wrong, to make sure that such things aren't going to happen in the future, is a really important part of accountability and transparency. We don't think referring it off to committee would hold it up. It could be a very short inquiry. It could be done on the papers. But basically having that body of evidence and saying this is what's gone on, this is the failings that have been discovered. This is how we're going to fix it up. And this is how we're going to make sure that such failings don't occur again in the future. So the Greens very much think that, that this bill, the Charter of the United Nations Amendment Bill 2021, should be referred to committee. Right, the question is, I'll put, Senator Roberts. Uh, Mr. President, I'd seek uh, to, split, to split the Motion uh, in sep vote separately on parts A and part B. Okay, so that's on Senator Cash's. I'll put Senator Thorpe's amendment first. The question is that the amendment moved by Senator Seward on behalf of Senator Thorpe on the paper headed AG1 Thorpe be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Aye. Division required, ring the bells.
Dr Bells, the question is the motion moved by Senator Seward on behalf of Senator Thorpe be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Seward tell of the ayes and Senator Urquhart tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 6, noes 24. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senator Cash, can I just ask you to quickly stand? Senator Cash, can I just ask you to quickly stand? You can do it from there and formally move your amendment. Just move the amendment. I formally yes. move uh, the amendment. Thank you, Thank Mr. You, President. Cash. I've got a request from Senator Roberts to deal with Part A and Part B of this separately. Is that correct, Senator Roberts? So I'm going to put the question. The question is that Part A of the amendment moved by Senator Cash be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The, the Greens have recorded as saying no. I'll take it Senator Roberts as well, given that it was his amendment. Now the, the, the question is that part B of the amendment— oh, sorry, Senator Patrick. Just to confirm, that was to do with the uh, United— um no, this was the counter-terrorism legislation okay. amendment bill. Now the question is part B um, be agreed to. That is the reference to the Charter of the United Nations amendment bill. The question is that amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Aye. Division required or would people prefer to record their positions? I record that I did hear, mul yeah, I did hear multiple. I, I, I take it that Senator, Senator Roberts would like his position recorded against that amendment, and Senator Waters has expressed it on behalf of the Greens, and Senator Patrick on behalf of himself opposing that amendment. So the question now is that the report of the Selection of Bills Committee as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Senator Rustin. Government business orders of the day as shown on today's order of business be considered from 12.15 p.m. today and government business then be called on and considered till not later than 1.30 p.m. and general business notice of motion 1204 be considered during the general business today. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. I'll call the clerk to notify postponements and extensions. Postponement notifications have been lodged as follows. Business of the Senate Notice of Motion No. 2 for today to the 23rd of August and General Business Notice of Motion 1216 for today to the 23rd of August. Committees have lodged extension notification as indicated at item 7 on today's read. I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, are there any other, no are there any other notifications? There being none, I shall proceed to the discovery of formal business, and I'll commence with the motion in the name of Senator Kitching, Business of the Senate, Matter Number One, Senator Urquhart. President, I ask that Business of the Senate Notice of Motion Number One be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Senator Roberts. Yes, yeah, leave, leave, sure, leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. We, su we su initially supported Senator Kitching's uh, initial mo motion to deal with an inquiry into manufacturing. Um, it was withdrawn by the Labor Party, and now we've seen why it's come back, uh, phrasing a decarbonised world and, so and targeting only renewable energy. We cannot support that. 
We would support an inquiry if it is conducted into the impact of all energy uh, available, all energy options. We cannot support this. Question is the motion moved by Senator Urquhart on behalf of Senator Kitching be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Uh, I'll now move to matter number 1212 in the name of Senator Keneally. Senator Urquhart. On behalf of Senator Keneally, I ask that General Business Notice of Motion No. 1212 proposing the introduction of a bill be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move that the following bill be introduced a bill for an act to require the reporting of ransomware payments to the Australian Cyber Security Centre and for related purposes. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Urquhart. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. Bill for an act to require the reporting of ransomware payments to the Australian Cyber Security Centre and for related purposes. Senator Urquhart. I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Is leave granted? It is. Senator Urquhart. I table an explanatory memorandum and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard and to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. I'll now move to 1215 in the name of Senator Gallagher. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1215 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Gallagher. Thank you. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. To make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. Ah. Uh, this matter is currently before the courts and it would not be appropriate uh, for the government to comment. Likewise, debate on the terms of this motion would not be a, an appropriate use of one hour of the time set aside for government business in this chamber. The question is the motion moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Oh, sorry, Senator Patrick. I didn't see you there, Senator Patrick. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Just in response to Senator Dun Dunham, uh, the decision to prosecute is an executive decision. It's, it's not a matter that is before the court, and as such, it is quite appropriate to debate whether or not it is in the public interest to prosecute. I'm not dealing with any of the issues that are before uh, the court. The question is: the motion moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Stop the bells. The question is that motion number 1215 in the name of Senator Gallagher be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart tell for the ayes and Senator Smith tell for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 16, no 16. The votes being equal, the question is therefore resolved in the negative. Senators, that concludes the discovery of formal business. I might say that senators may be aware of developments in the ACT. There will be some public announcements, I understand, at 12.15 um, from the ACT authorities, um, and we'll hopefully have something to say following that in the, with respect to this place. I thank senators. I have received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Australian Organ and Tissue Donation and Transplantation Authority Amendment Governance and Other Measures Bill 2021 for concurrence. Senator Rustin. That this bill now may proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. The Australian Organ and Tissue Donation and Transplantation Authority Act 2008 and for related purposes. Senator Rustin. This bill now be read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? It is. Senator Rustin. I move that debate now be adjourned. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. So now, in no further messages, I'll call, I'll call the clerk. Business of the Senate Order of the Day number one, a report from the Community Affairs Legislation Committee. Senator Smith. For the Community Affairs Legislation Committee, I present the report of the Committee on the Provisions of the National Disability Insurance Scheme Amendment, Improving Supports for At-Risk Participants Bill 2021, together with accompanying documents. The question is, I'll call the clerk. Government Business Order of the Day number two, Counterterrorism Legislation Amendment Sunsetting Review and Other Measures Bill 2021, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Thorpe, you are in continuation. Thank you, uh, President. Here we go again, because the Morrison government didn't do its job again. All of us here are now expected to pick up the slack. I rise to speak on the counter-terrorism legislation amendment, sunsetting review and other measures bill 2021. There are three particular measures in this bill that are about to sunset. The do nothing Morrison government did not do its job. That's why we're here, right? Because the prime minister forgot that the terrorism legislation was about to expire. That's why we're all here debating why we should let the, the, per the kid that came with his homework late, didn't do the reading, didn't do the research. We're here to now discuss uh, the problems with it that Labor are supporting to just push through. Unbelievable. The do nothing Morrison government obviously hasn't done their job and Labor can't be bothered either, so let's just rush it through. Uh, but you've only just realised that these provisions are about to expire. Prime Minister just realised they're about to expire. Uh, now you're scrambling to do something about it. That's, what kind of leadership is that? Who's running the country? 
But, you know, that's how you operate. Uh, do nothing until someone uh, makes it an issue, like the Greens are the only ones that are going to pick up and actually talk to the human rights uh, body and those that are interested and understand the problems with this bill. Uh, I'm not sure whether Labor have picked up the phone or even the government in, the, in this fact, but obviously you haven't done your homework, you haven't done your job, and you're too lazy to even uh, have a conversation about it and allow uh, further scrutiny. Anyway, the three provisions in this bill that are about to expire, and I do mean that they're about to expire in a matter of days, uh, are the declared areas provisions in section 119 of the Criminal Code, two, the control order regime in division 104 of the Criminal Code, and three, the preventative detention orders regime in Division 105 for a further 15 months. There are also amendments to the Intelligence Services Act as well as the Crimes Act to extend the operation of the stop, search and seizure powers in Division 3A and Part IAA. I will deal with these in that order. Section 119.2 of the Criminal Code makes it an offence to enter or remain in a area declared by the Minister for Foreign Affairs, who is also the Prime Minister for Women, apparently. I note that a person is still allowed to travel to those declared areas for legitimate purposes, like providing aid, uh, performing official duties either for the governments of this country or for international organisations like the Committee of the Red Cross. Journalists are also able to travel to declared areas if they are acting in a professional capacity as well as people visiting or reuniting with family. These provisions were part of a number of legislative measures that were introduced in the Counter-Terrorism Legislation Amendment Foreign Fighters Act 2014. The explanatory memorandum of that act, Labor, you should listen because you haven't done your homework. Understand what the people are saying and the experts are saying because that's who we're listening to. The explanatory memorandum of that act did not really articulate why the length of the sunset provisions was prescribed. In fact, the former independent national security legislation monitor, Brett Walker SC, is on the record as saying that he found, and I quote, listen Labor, sunset provisions are problematic and that a period of 10 years appeared arbitrary stating that sunset clauses should either be really very short or not used at all. Labor, you wake up, wake up. In which case there would be trust in future parliaments to amend, repeal, leaving force laws as the future parliaments see fit in light of circumstances that cannot possibly be predicted at the moment. End quote. You awake, Labor? There are some key concerns with the declared areas provisions. I expect this from the Libs, but seriously. Ah, the Australian Human Rights Commission, I'll send you their number if you like, has made clear that the expectations should be reframed to operate more broadly instead of shopping a shopping list of purposes as appears now. Human Rights Watch, I'll give you their number two, Labor, also expressed concern that the proposed list of exemptions fails to recognise that during times of war and conflict, there are a number of legitimate reasons for people to travel to areas involved in armed conflict. These include doing business, Labor, selling property, Labor, or working for a civil society organisation, Labor. For running or voting in an election. And for religious reasons, 
Where are you, Labor? Get out from under that desk. Like pilgrimages. <laughs> Struggle with that word. Haven't been totally decolonised. English language is very violent sometimes. For example, Labor, during the Sri Lankan conflict, a number of Australian Tamils returned to sell their possessions, but then assisted civil society groups advocating against the war or were forcibly held by the Tamil Tigers. None of these acts is covered by the exemptions at the moment, and they should, seriously. The offence of remaining in a declared area is particularly problematic because when an area becomes a declared area, it's an, it's an Australian citizen, resident or a holder of an Australian visa who has to leave the area. An area could be an entire country. So instead of fixing this flawed legislation and rolling your sleeves up and doing what's right for the people, Labor, I expect it from the Libs but didn't expect it from you fellas. Well, instead of fixing it, they're seeking to extend the sunset clause until well past the election. They want to completely disregard the processes of, a, of and procedures of making laws, including committee review and proper debate and scrutiny in the Senate and the other place. That alone should cause everyone concern and it's not clear that the government has fixed the issue in the legislation but instead trying to kick it down the road for hopefully, hopefully a new government to deal with but geez, you fellas have got to do some work and do the right thing by the people. But I say no. The control order regime in Division 104 of the Criminal Code allows a court to impose obligations, pro prohibitions and restrictions on a person. Restrictions may be imposed on the basis of a low standard of proof, the balance of probabilities, instead of beyond reasonable doubt, and even on the basis of secret evidence. The police are not obligated to provide any information that would prejudice national security. These control orders can be put on children as young as 14. Labor, I'm telling everyone that you are supporting this. Children as young as 14. It's not our mates. Only 20 control orders have been issued to date. The Morrison government is considering changes to the control order and prevent and preventative detention framework to make it even worse it than it is now with the Counter-Terrorism Legislation Amendment High-Risk Terrorist Offenders Bill 2020. Human Rights Watch, got the number here, has expressed concern that control orders are imposed on individuals in a cumulative manner so as to be tantamount to indefinite detention. Australia's Independent National Security Legislation Monitor has previously recommended the repeal of control order provisions. If only the Morrison government was paying attention and your buddies on the other side. The preventative detention orders regime under Division 105 of the Criminal Code allows a person to be taken into custody for up to two days to prevent a terrorist attack or preserving evidence. The, the issuing authority for an initial order is a senior AFP member. Since the orders have been legislated, they have never been used. Never been used in the whole time. Yet you want to extend them. Since the orders have been legislated, they haven't been used. I just need people to understand that, right? We're going, Labor and Lib want to extend something that's never been used before. They don't want to take it back to the people. They just want to rush it through. We had terrorists, literally neo-Nazis, burning crosses on Garrawood, my country, Gunditjmara, Warrnambool, the colonisers call it Hall's Gap. It's called Garrawood. Those terrorists and neo-Nazis 
danced on my ancestors and burnt a cross. What happened to those fellas? Nothing. If these orders were so good at preventing terrorism, they would have been working, right? But they haven't. Stop search and seizure powers, Division 3A of Part IAA of the Crimes Act allows a police officer to stop, question and search people as well as seize items without a warrant as long as a police officer suspects that someone is committing or about to commit a terrorist act. That says a lot about human rights. These powers have not been used at all since they were legislated, but you want to extend them anyway. The Greens don't support this. The Greens are for the people, grassroots democracy. I've given you 15 months to come back, fix some of these issues, that, particularly in regards to uh, declaring uh, areas, the area provisions. I need the Senate to support this so that our people can have a say. All Australians need to have a say, and Liberal and Labor are stopping that from happening. I can keep going if you want. No. Um, Senator's time has expired. Call Senator Urquhart. Uh, thank you. I just want to move the second reading amendment um, that Senator Watt on sheet 1380, so I formally move that. Thank you. Thanks. Senator, Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Madam Acting Deputy President, fundamentally the role of the Australian government is to ensure that all Australians are safe, secure and free from the threat of violence so that they are able to pursue their individual interests. It is the government's responsibility to ensure that our sovereign rights remain untainted by malicious actors and groups. Australia's current national terrorism threat level is listed as probable. This means that there is credible intelligence assessed by our security agency that indicates individuals or groups have the intent and or capability to conduct a terrorist attack in Australia. Unfortunately, the harsh reality is that we live in a world where there are those who wish to take what we have and destroy what we have built. We have world-class intelligence, security and law enforcement agencies who work day in and day out to protect us from these threats. These agencies are equipped with some of the brightest and most dedicated minds in Australia, using some of the most advanced technologies to fight these threats. To ensure Australians are safe, we must ensure that these agencies have, uh, have correct legislative frameworks to ensure they can do their job effectively and help us ensure that all Australians are safe. This is why the Counter-Terrorism Legislation Amendment, Sunsetting and Other Measures Bill 2021, is vital and must be passed without delay. To delay passing of this bill could threaten the lives of every Australian. This bill provides for the continuation of key counter-terrorism powers that have helped since its enactment to protect the lives of Australians and our communities. In response to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security and its 2021 review of declared area provisions, the bill will extend the sunsetting of declared area provisions in the Criminal Code Act of 1995 to 7 September 2024 and amend the Intelligence Services Act 2001 to provide for the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security to review these provisions by 7 January 2024 ahead of their new sunsetting date. The declared areas of the declared areas offence forms an integral part of Australian government's efforts to stop the flow of foreign fighters and also mitigates the risk that returning foreign fighters pose to Australians. The bill will also extend the 7 September 2021 sunsetting of AFP counterterrorism powers until 7 December 2022 and emergency stop search and seizure powers in the Crimes Act. 1914. Control orders are an important tool in preventing a terrorist attack or foreign incursion and for managing the risk posed by persons who continue to present a risk to the community. It is important to note that control orders must be issued by a court. 
the Australian Federal Police can apply to the court to issue a control order against someone and must also have the consent of the Minister for Home Affairs. Preventative detention orders are also an important tool in preventing an imminent terrorist act and preserve vital evidence in the aftermath of a terrorist act. Emergency stop, search and seizure powers ensure police are able to respond consistently and effectively to a terrorist incident or threat. This bill seeks to extend those powers for a further 15 months. These powers allow for police to request information, conduct a search and seizure uh, of property where they suspect the person might have committed or be about to commit a terrorist act. I cannot stress enough that if these powers were to sunset, particularly those with respect to control orders, all control orders would cease to be in effect, which would significantly inhibit agencies' ability to manage individuals who pose a risk of terrorism and threaten our way of life. If anyone in this House is OK with that happening, then they are essentially saying that they are OK with Australians' lives being placed at risk. I commend this bill. Thank you. Minister. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting uh, Deputy President. And I rise to sum up the debate on the Counter-Terrorism Legislation Amendment, Sunsetting Review and Other Measures Bill 2021. And protecting the Australian community from the evolving threat of terrorism is and will continue to be among the Morrison government's highest priorities. This bill will provide for the continuation of key counter-terrorism powers to keep Australians safe. The declared areas offence is an important part of the Morrison government's efforts to stop the flow of foreign fighters to overseas conflict zones and to mitigate the risk that returning foreign fighters pose to Australians. Control orders and preventative detention orders are important tools used to prevent terrorist acts and manage the risk posed by persons who continue to present a risk to the community. The emergency stop, search and seizure powers ensure that police are able to respond consistently and effectively to a terrorist incident or threat. The extension of the reporting date for the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor Monitor to review Division 105A of the Criminal Code will enable the Monitor to engage in interstate consultations which were disrupted, as I think we all know, by COVID-19 travel restrictions and provide a greater body of evidence to draw upon in his review of the practical operation of the provisions. The Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security is currently conducting a statutory review of control orders preventative detention orders and the stop search and seizure powers. This bill ensures these powers do not cease while this important review is going on. The committee's separate review of the declared areas provisions was tabled on 25 February 2021. This bill implements key recommendations made by the committee in this review, including that the Criminal Code Act 1995 be amended to provide that the PJCIS may review the operation, effectiveness and proportionality of the declared areas provisions by 7 January 2024, ahead of the new sunsetting date of 7 September 2024. I note that the committee also recommended, and I note that the uh, opposition has moved a second reading amendment in this regard, that the Criminal Code Act 1995 be amended to allow Australian citizens to request an exemption from the Minister for Foreign Affairs to travel to a declared area for reasons not listed in section 1192 of the Act, but which are not otherwise illegitimate under Australian law. The government does not support this proposal. It is unnecessary because the legislation already provides for a range of carefully defined exemptions, including for bona fide visits to family members, journalism, a range of official duties and the provision of humanitarian aid. There is also an ability to prescribe additional exemptions through regulations. The government is not aware of any cases where a person has sought to travel to a declared area 
for a reason otherwise legitimate under Australian law and was unable to do so to the current scope of the legitimate purpose exemptions. The proposal would create a scheme which would undermine the intent of the legislation, which is to keep Australians safe and prevent travel to extremely dangerous conflict zones where terrorist groups are active. The government has strong concerns that if such a scheme were put in place, it could not be effectively implemented and monitored, and it would directly contradict the government's approach to travel advice. The government would have limited information to assess an exemption application, including to consider whether the intended travel was for a genuine reason. Moreover, the time and resources required to obtain information to assess an application would be significant and would divert security and intelligent resources from national security priorities. In putting forward this proposal, the committee recommended that the Minister for Foreign Affairs' decision to grant or not to grant an exemption be exempted from merits review. However, decisions made by the Foreign Minister, even if exempt from merits review, would still be reviewable by the courts. There would also be significant practical difficulties in monitoring the movements of a person authorised to travel to a declared area, and it would be difficult to ascertain whether a person had complied with any conditions to which their travel authorisation was subject. Declared areas are, by their nature, dangerous conflict zones, and persons who travel there do so at significant risk to their personal safety. The government sees no rationale for creating a scheme of this kind, which runs counter to the policy intent of the provisions and gives rise to significant practical challenges. Given we are not aware of any real-world instances where a person has been prevented from travelling for legitimate reasons, it is safe to conclude that such a scheme would result in little benefit for the cost required to set up and implement it. Again, in summing up the debate, the bill reflects the government's ongoing commitment to protecting the Australian community from the threat of terrorism and ensuring our law enforcement agencies continue to be able to manage the evolving national security threat environment. And with those words, I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Cash. And the question is that the amendment moved by Senator Urquhart on behalf of uh, Senator Watt uh, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the no. noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Urquhart for Senator Watt. Second reading amendment number 1380 be agreed. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Chisholm as teller for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith as teller for the noes. Order. There being 15 ayes and 18 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Just allow people to get back to their places, and I'll put the question on the second reading. So the question is that this bill now be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. The bill for an act to amend the law relating to counter-terrorism and for related purposes. Government business order of the day number five, education services for overseas students, registration charges, amendment bill 2021, and three related bills, resumption of second reading debate. Uh, Senator Brown, I believe you're, you have the call. Senator Brown, on the oh. Education Services for Overseas Students yeah. Bill. Okay. Right. Uh, thank you, um, Deputy President. Labor supports these bills, which aim to streamline cost recovery arrangements for regulation of education providers who provide services to international students. The Education Services for Overseas Students Registration Charges Bill repeals and replaces current charging provisions with a new framework. Although most details will be set through regulation, continuing a pattern of this government trying to avoid transparency and accountability for its decisions. The three related bills make minor and consequential amendments arising from the registration, registration charges bill. The bills are all part of a broader shift to full cost recovery for the regulation of higher education providers, including the Tesca cost recovery and cha charges bill that, are in this, that were in the Senate this week. Labor is not opposed to the cost recovery in principle if it is well thought through and justified. Labor has opposed the Tesco uh, cost recovery legislation as we believe now is not the, not the appropriate time to remove to full cost recovery for higher education providers who have been forced to bear the brunt of the COVID pandemic for the most part without any government assistance. Labor will support the legislation being debated today, while we have opposed parts of the broader shift to, to expand at cost recovery for higher education providers. This piece of legislation is expected to reduce charges on international education providers and prevent providers from being double charged for the same regulatory activity. Thank you. Call Senator Faruqi remotely. Um, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, I speak to the Education Services for Overseas Students, Registration Charges Amendment Bill 2021 and other cognate bills in front of us right now. I mean, I state from the outset that the Greens will not be opposing these bills. The bills update the model for registration charges for the Commonwealth Register of Institutions and Courses for Overseas Students, known as CRICOS. The bills do so by replacing the annual registration and entry to market charges. 
with an annual charge payable by providers who are registered on CRICOS and impose a charge for applications by schools for initial registration and renewal of registration on CRICOS. Following the 2020-21 budget announcement, the Department of Education, Skills and Employment consulted with the international education sector on this revised cost recovery model. The consultation period ended on the 1st of June. And I note the explanatory memorandum to the registration charges bill indicates that no substantive issues were identified during the consultation period that warranted changing the model. I mean, that is all fine, but there is an extraordinary lack of transparency in the way this government is operating. The, the department has not made any submissions to the review public, which is a very worrying pattern. The way these charges will work Indeed, even the formula to calculate the new charges sits outside of the bills in front of us. The bill gives the minister power to exempt providers from charges, yet there is absolutely no clarity in the bills as to how and when these powers may be exercised. The government's repeated attacks on public providers and their cozying up to private providers worries me that these broad powers may be used to benefit private providers over public. Indeed, the scrutiny of bills committee mirrored these concerns when commenting on the registration charges bill, noting that this bill provides the minister with broad discretionary powers to exempt providers from the requirement to pay a charge by legislative instrument in circumstances where there is no guidance on the face of the bill as to when these powers may be exercised. Unlike the current provisions relating to CRICOS charges, the registration charges bill does not specify the amount of indexation arrangements for the charges. Instead, the amounts, any indexation and any exemptions of one or more classes of provider will be specified through regulations. We know that the Senate cannot vote on regulations in the same manner um, we, um, in, as we do on bills. We know that the same level of scrutiny cannot be applied to regulations and ministerial decisions. And this is precisely why the government is continuing to put up bare bones legislation day after day where important matters sit outside the bills. From our discussions with the minister's office, we understand that the effect of the bills in front of us today is to reduce charges for institutions to register as providers for overseas students. So we're not opposing these bills, but I want to remind the chamber that these bills come off the back of terrible bills like the TEXA charges, like the TEXA charges and cost recovery bills, which impose further levies on providers of higher education who are already struggling. So while these bills may provide some small relief, the government's agenda to decimate public providers of higher education remains very obvious and very stark, and that must be pushed back and fought against. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Peruki. I call the minister. Uh, Acting Deputy President, I thank Senators for their contributions on these bills and commend the bills to the Senate. The question is that the bill now be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Education Services for Overseas Students Registration Charges Amendment Bill 2021, Education Services for Overseas Students TPS Levies Amendment Bill 2021, Education Services for Overseas Students Amendment Cost Recovery and Other Measures Bill 2021, Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency Charges Amendment Bill 2021. No amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require the committee stage? If not, I shall call the minister. I move the bill be now read a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Education Services for Overseas Students Registration Charges Amendment Bill 2021, Education Services for Overseas Students TPS Levies Amendment Bill 2021, Education Services for Overseas Students Amendment Cost Recovery and Other Measures Bill 2021, Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency Charges Amendment Bill 2021. Government Business Order of the Day number two, Counterterrorism Legislation Amendment, Sunsetting Review and Other Measures Bill 2021, Resumption in Committee of the Whole. Senator Cash. But, Minister. No? Thank you. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? 
there being no objection, is so, <coughs> it is so ordered. Is there anyone seeking the call for consideration of this bill in committee? Senator Seward. Thank you. I'm not sure what order our amendments are in, but I move amendments uh, on sheet 1380. Oh no, sorry, they're the wrong ones. I beg your pardon. Sorry. 1376. Um, in the name of Senator Thorpe, I seek leave to. Uh, I, I move those amendments. Is, are you seeking leave to do so? Yes. Senator Seward, is I'm leave granted? Yes. Leave is granted. Senator Seward. I move uh, Senator Thorpe's amendments to this bill. Do you get up and talk? Senator Brown. Um, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Labor opposes these amendments. The Intelligence and Security Com Committee recommended that the sunset date for the declared area provisions be extended to 7 September 2024 and that the Intelligence and Security Committee be empowered to conduct a review of those powers at any time prior to that date. This bill implements both of those recommendations. By contrast, the amendments circulated by Senator Forbes and moved by Senator Seawood would provide for a more limited extension of the sunset date in relation to the declared areas provision to 7 December 2022 and require the Intelligence and Security Committee to undertake a further review of those provisions by 7 June 2022. Labor supports the provision of the Intelligence and Security Committee the Intelligence and Security Committee completed a review of the declared area provisions in February of this year. It is unnecessary and, given the extraordinary workload of the committee, inappropriate to require the committee to complete a further review by the middle of next year. In any event, I note that the bill would enable the committee to commence a review of the declared areas provision at any time prior to 7 September 2024. In other words, the bill, as drafted, would empower the committee to complete a review within the time frame su suggested by Senator Thorpe, but it would not require it. Separately, the amendments circulated by Senator Thorpe would see the preventative detention order and stop search and seizure powers expire, expire on 7 September 2021. We strongly oppose those amendments. The Intelligence and Security Committee is currently undertaking a review of those powers. The whole purpose of that review is to evaluate the operation, effectiveness and implications of those powers. I would therefore be wholly, it would therefore be wholly inappropriate and defeat the purpose of that review for the parliament to allow the powers to expire while the review is ongoing. Instead, Labor supports the proposed extension of the sunset dates to 7 December 2022. This extension will ensure that the Intelligence and Security Committee has sufficient time to complete its review prior to the power, the power sunsetting and the government will have sufficient time to work through and respond to any recommendations made by the committee. Minister. Thank you. And the government does not support these amendments. They are reckless. They would undermine the intent of the bill, greatly impeding the, the ability of Australia's law enforcement agencies to keep Australians safe. The question is that the amendments one and sorry, Senator McKim. Thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. I, I won't uh, hold the Senate up uh, unduly, but uh, I will make the point that uh, once again. The, uh, the major parties in this place are in lockstep on uh, an erosion of rights and freedoms in our country. Uh, this legislation, like so many other pieces of legislation that have passed uh, through this parliament and uh, state and territory parliaments uh, in the last couple of decades, uh, erode fundamental rights and freedoms. And it is worth pointing out yet again that Australia remains the only liberal democracy in the world that does not have uh, some kind of charter or bill of rights, whether constitutionally enshrined or legislatively enshrined. And it is the absence 
of such a charter or bill of rights that makes it so much more easy for the major parties to collude to walk us ever further down the dangerous path to a police state and a surveillance state. We have seen well over 200 pieces of legislation passed through Commonwealth, state or territory parliaments in the last two decades uh, that do erode fundamental rights and freedoms uh, in the name of counter-terrorism. And it is worth pointing out that many of those pieces of legislation are introduced in the name of counter-terrorism and then the powers and often the very intrusive powers contained in those pieces of legislation are used for, um, for uh, intelligence gathering or data harvesting that has got nothing to do with counter-terrorism. I'll just give one example to colleagues, and that is the metadata retention laws being used uh, not to keep us safe from terrorists, but in fact used by local governments to gather evidence to prosecute their ratepayers for having unregistered pets. That is where we find ourselves today, colleagues. These powers uh, that we uh, consistently grant through our parliaments because the major parties are in lockstep on these issues are dangerous. They have not uh, been argued for comprehensively. Our, our terrorism threat level is unchanged over many years in this country, and yet we continue to see pieces of les legislation come in uh, to this place and pass with um, the support of both of the major parties. And that, uh, unfortunately, is what we are seeing today. Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator Seward. Senator Thorpe wants to make a contribution, I believe. Uh, Senator Thorpe, remotely. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy. President, uh, mine will be short and sweet, but basically the committee that you're talking about, Labor and Libs, uh, you two are only on it. So if that's not a closed shop, if that is failing the democracy that's meant to be happening in this country, what, what is this about? How can you have a committee filled with Labor and Liberals shutting the Greens out, the only party, grassroots democracy that represents the people, no dirty donations, no favours for our privileged mates, no mining jobs when we leave. Like, I thought this was about raise the eyebrows. I can see ya. Like, are we meant to be working together for the betterment of the people in this country? Acting Deputy President, are you okay? Uh, I, I believe that Deputy you might be attempting to reflect on the chair, that. Senator Thorpe. Oh, I just sure. remind you to. Uh, use language that is parliamentary, avoid using the word you, show some respect for the Senate, and if you want to continue your con contribution, I will give you the call. But I do expect you to adhere to the standards that are fit for this place. Senator Thorpe. Thank you. Thank you very much. You've raised a very good point there, Acting Deputy President. Senator Thorpe. I, I, I warn you again not to reflect on the chair. Whether it's a positive or negative comment is not required. Okay. Please My make your contribution if you wish to, to do so. Senator Thorpe, you have the call. My apologies, uh, and I do take that very seriously. So thank you, because I do believe that the Senate is there for the people, and I do believe in accountability and transparency to the Australian population. And in this case, I do not believe that the Labor Party and the Liberal Party and the National Party are acting in good faith and being respectful to democracy in this country because they won't allow anybody else to sit on their private little committee. 
So in terms of democracy, I'd like to please tell me what that means because I am not seeing that in my new job as a senator for Victoria. And I've been put here to call for accountability, to call for transparency, and the Labor Party and the Liberal Party get together, have their little committee meeting, make their decisions, bring it to the Senate and, accept, and expect the Australian people to accept their dodgy little committee findings, two of which, may I remind you all, two have never been used since legislated. So why are you continuing two parts of this legislation that have never been used before? Wouldn't you ask yourself as an elected representative on behalf of the people that put you there, wouldn't Senator, you say... Senator Thorpe, can, can I remind you once again that Oh, Your use you. of the word saying. you is highly okay. problematic in, in regard to established okay, standing orders for the Senate. Word. So I, with that reminder, I will give you the call again. Senator Thorpe. Thank you. Wouldn't a normal person in their right mind, particularly those that are part of the Liberal Party, the National Party and the Labor Party, uh, would wouldn't you just think that you'd ask that that the committee would have asked themselves in the name of transparency and accountability why haven't these two parts of the legislation ever been used why should the labor party and the liberal party be allowed to extend two parts of this legislation that have never been used before so that is not accountability, that is not transparency, that is not democracy, it's a breach of human rights. We've seen the Human Rights Watch come out, we've seen other experts come out and say that it is problematic that these two parts maintain uh, to be part of that piece of legislation and to be extended even though they've never been used before. So I really struggle with how the Labor Party and the Liberal Party and the National Party come up with their closed decision making because the Greens aren't there to hold them accountable. And that's a problem in the Senate, right? You can call us what you like, greenies this, greenies that, latte sipping greenies. I've never had a latte in my life, mind you. Well, I've seen more Liberal Party members have lattes in that place than I've seen happening in Northgate. So come on. We are there to hold you all account, all to account, right? I know you don't like it because we speak truth. Senator Thorpe, oh, you, you were on a pretty good roll for a while there. I, I, I acknowledge that you're making an effort to avoid using the word you, but I just remind you once again that, that it is unparliamentary to use that word in this okay, context I'll in the way that you're using it. it. Senator Thorpe, please continue. Thank you. I will practice. I will practice. Anyway, it's a dodgy deal that's being done between the Labor Party and the Liberal Party uh, to exclude the Australian people and take it back to a committee to further investigate why two parts of the legislation have never been used and you're going to just roll it on anyway. Uh, I find that lazy and I find that um, disrespectful, in fact, to those experts who uh, we have spoken to, who've given us the advice to provide to the Senate to make an informed decision that ensures accountability and transparency. So shame on the Labor Party and shame on the Liberal Party uh, for closing shop and not allowing the Greens to make you accountable. So. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Um, the, the question is, is that the amendments now? one and two uh, be agreed to. I haven't finished. I'm sorry, Senator Thorpe. I thought you'd completed your remarks. 
No, I was just going to say one more sentence, and that is that Senator, we need Senator to Thorpe. Thank you. Because we need the Greens in balance of power, right? It's the only way we are going to hold these two accountable. They are running roughshod across this country, making bad decisions together. Labor's trying to keep up, you know, scraping to the bottom uh, to catch up with the libs on their bad policies and their bad leadership of running this country. So we need the balance of power. The only way we're going to get there is get rid of this government. Um, yep, Labor can come in, but Labor, you're not coming in there without us because you'll be just as bad. And I'm finished with my contribution. Thank you very much, Chair. The question is that amendments one and two, uh, sorry, Senator Patrick. I've got a brief question for the minister, um, and it just relates to the timing of the, of the bill. Um, I, I think the PJCI uh, reported in February, and uh, this bill was introduced on, I think, the 4th of August. I, I'm just wondering, uh, and it's in the context that perhaps uh, it could have been introduced earlier, what, uh, or perhaps what the delay is, because I, I say that as a crossbencher who has to deal with a lot of legislation and, um, and the ability to potentially consider these, the, the bill uh, more closely. Just, just curious as to um, what, you know, what the sequence or timing was in terms of when the committee reported, when the government received a draft bill and uh, 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 when the bill was finalised and, and perhaps some details around that. Thank you. Minister. Uh, thank you, Senator Patrick. And in relation to the report of the PJCIS and its recommendations, uh, one of the requirements is for the government to actually consult with states and territories, and as you know, that can take some time. Um, and as such, uh, we introduced the bill uh, in August when you said, and we're obviously seeking to pass it today. Senator Patrick. So just confirming that the, the, the delay between the two was simply one of engagement with the, uh, uh, with the states. Um, maybe if you'd just take on notice, Minister, the, the dates in which that was concluded and uh, uh, a date when the, the, the drafting was finalised, I'd be appreciative of that. Minister? And certainly, Senator Patrick, I can take on notice the relevant dates for you. Uh, yes, uh, in relation to part of the bill, it was the states and territories. In relation to the part of the bill on the AFP powers, um, that is something that we are still awaiting for the PJCIS to report upon. But I will get you on notice the answers to your questions in terms of the actual dates. The question is that amendments one and two be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against? No. No. The noes have it. A division required? Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. Uh, the ayes shall move to the right, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Chisholm as teller for the noes, and I appoint Senator Seward as teller for the ayes. Uh, there being five ayes and 26 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. The question is that parts three and four of schedule one stand as printed. Uh, all those in favour say aye. Those against no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question now is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The committee has considered the counter-terrorism legislation amendment, sunsetting review and other measures bill 2021 and agree to it without amendments. Minister. I move that the report of the committee be now adopted. The question is that the motion moved by— Hear the question. There's too much noise in the chamber. Could you please order, repeat order the question? Order, senators. It is, is unruly to be um, so noisy in the chamber in the middle of a matter. Senator Patterson. Just draw your attention to complaints from your colleagues about the noise in that region. Um, I, I only named you because you're in the front row, but you had friends in the conversation. I acknowledge. So, Minister, I move that the report of the committee be now adopted. The question is that the report be now adopted. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Minister, I move that the bill be now read a third time. The question is that the bill be now read a third time. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against. The ayes have it. Uh, is a division required? Ring the bells for one minute.
stop the bells. Uh, the question is that the bill be read a third time. The ayes shall move to the right, the noes to the left. I appoint uh, Senator Davey as, as the teller for the ayes and Senator Seward as the teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 22, noes 5. The question is resolved in the affirmative. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to counter-terrorism and for related purposes. Government business order of the day number three. Offshore petroleum and greenhouse gas storage amendment, titles administration and other measures bill 2021 and a related bill. Second reading debate. Order. Could I ask senators who are not participating in the next debate on the offshore petroleum and greenhouse gas storage amendment bill to quietly leave the chamber? I call Senator Brown. Um, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise today to support the offshore petroleum and greenhouse gas storage amendment, titles administration and other measures, and the offshore petroleum and greenhouse gas story reg regulatory let Levies Amendments Bills 2021. On behalf of the, Labor of the Labor Opposition, in doing so, I move the second reading amendment on sheet 1363, standing in the name of Senator Watt, and, and ha which has been circulated in the chamber. And at the end of the motion, add, but the Senate notes that, one, the government has known about the impending decommissioning of a range of offshore assets in Australian waters since it was first elected eight years ago. Two, why this legislation compels the National Offshore Petroleum Safety and Envir Environmental Management Authority to regulate the financial assurance capabilities of offshore oil and gas producers. The government has not provided any additional funding to the agency to undertake this critical task. Three, the current legislation fails to include a comprehensive definition of what, of what the permitted alternatives to complete removal requirements will be, making it possible for pipelines and concrete structures to be left in place without certainty over environmental safety and, and well integrity outcomes. And four, the government's lack, lack, lackadaisical approach to decommissioning reform has resulted in Australian taxpayers footing the bill for the Northern Endeavour fiasco, which has to, which has to date wasted $210 million of public money. I, for one, uh, I, for one, am glad that the government has finally accepted the need to reform in this crucial policy area the decommissioning of offshore oil and gas assets. The minister has argued that the time is now for Australia's regulatory framework to catch up with demand. But I would ask the minister why now, why not two years ago? You see, as with all things with this government, they are far more concerned with sexy announcements and political stunts 
than meaningful reform in the interests of all Australians. This government, who has been in power for nearly a decade, had to wait for the Northern Endeavour, to, Endeavour bailout disaster to address the, the glaring, obvious reformation, reform needed here. If the government weren't the ones to foot the bill, would they have act, acted at all? The Australian taxpayer is $210 million, Acting Deputy President, in the red and counting, might I add. But I will get to that the, uh, palaver in due course. Let's start from the top. By way of background, decommissioning is the process for which all equipment, infrastructure and wells associated with petroleum, petroleum activity are safely removed when no longer used or required. Currently, the complete removal of infrastructure and the plugging and abandonment of wells is the default decommissioning requirement under the Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Act. This is consistent with Australia's international obligations, primarily, primarily under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea and the London Convention Associated Protocol, to remove disused installations and structures and to preserve and protect the marine environment. Options other than complete removal may be considered. However, the title holder must demonstrate that the alternative decommissioning approach delivers equal or better environmental, safety and well integrity outcomes compared to complete removal, and that the approach complies with all other legislative and regulatory requirements. However, this is, this, however, this is set out in the guidelines only, and the legislation at hand does not adequately define the criteria by which alternative decommissioned approaches will be permitted. The risk here is that unscrupulous Facility owners will seek to avoid costs and will seek to leave pipelines and other structures in place. This opens the door for producers to undertake less than complete removal, where they opt to repurpose petroleum exploration to become an artifi artificial reef. On the face of it, that sounds kind of OK, but we cannot let producers have free reign to use a pretend environmental fig leaf to cover up what they have, they have put on the seabed to avoid their responsibilities at, 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 the, at great expense. There is no doubt that leaving infrastructure in the sea is less ex, a, a less expensive option for producers. However, it does carry environmental risks that need to be rigorously assessed. I accept that in the right, right circumstances, artificial reefs that build up, up over gas infrastructure can provide a habitat for a range of different species. Once algae, corals and invertebrates make themselves at home, they produce additional biomass in the food chain, creating a food source for fish and other species. For example, Western Australia currently has six purpose-built artificial reef, reefs which lo with locations spread from Esperance to Exmouth. Nevertheless, it is critical that the complete removal of assets remains the undisputed objective of proper decommissioning. Currently, it is the title holder, holder that identifies, then collates the information necessary to assess or evaluate the different options for decommissioning petroleum infrastructure via an environmental plan. As you can imagine, maintenance of and subsequent decommissioning of offshore petroleum assets is a costly enterprise. That's why government oversight is critical to ensure that title holders have the financial capacity to do it. Until now, business deals brokered by cowboy operators have been able to go on unabated, with little attention to the point of negligence on behalf of the government. One such example of this was evidently too big to ignore. The Northern Endeavour, Northern Oil and Gas Australia, the Lamcor oil fields are situated approximately, or the Laminara. Coralina, which Lamcor oil fields, are situated approximately 550 kilometres offshore of Darwin and the associated Northern Endeavour floating production storage and offtake facility, the chief infrastructure for extraction and development. Production of Northern Endeavour and associated wells commenced in 1999. By 2015, the title holder for the fields was a joint venture of Woodside and Talesman Oil and Gas, with Woodside operating the Northern Endeavour. 
In 2015, Woodside announced its intention to cease, cease production from the Northern Endeavour in the second half of 2016 and moved to decommissioning the field soon after. However, before this decommissioning could occur, Woodside sold its share to JV partner Talesman, later Timor Sea Oil and Gas, who had been acquired by Northern Oil and Gas, who had been acquired by Northern Oil and Gas Australia. The sale was facilitated through NOPTA and was perfectly allowable in the current legislative environment. NOPSEMA identified concerns about its capacity and capability and capacity to respond to an oil spill, an obvious and fundamental title hold, holder responsibility. This led to formal intervention and enforcement just three days after Tosoga became title holder. Tosoga and its contractors were unable to convince NOSEMA that it had identified the baseline of the corrosion hazards on the facility, nor undertaken subsequent assessment, prioritisation and planning to address those risks. By 2019, NOSEMA had lost confidence in the ability of the title holder and the operator to fulfil their statutory obligations and resolve the identified concerns over the adequate safety and environment environmental management of the ageing Northern Endeavour facility. An, envi an environmental inspection identified that Tosoga could not demonstrate sufficient financial assurance to cover its liabilities in case of an oil spill, and this required prompt enforcement to resolve. As a result, Nosema issued a prohibition notice on Tosoga's con contractor, UPS, on 10 July 2019 and a general direction on Tuscoga on 18 of June 2020, enforcing the cessation of production on the Northern Endeavour until a range of long-standing serious issues were resolved, particularly related to corrosion. The loss of production until the prohibition notice and the general direction were resolved had serious implications for Tuscoga's cash flows. The Noga Group was was loss-making and had not generated a net profit after tax for the past four consecutive financial years. Essentially, the companies could not afford to maintain, let alone decommission, the asset. On 20 September 2019, the Northern Oil and Gas Australia Proprietary Limited Group of Companies went into voluntary administration and subsequently on 7 February 2020 into liquidation. The government had to step in. The Commonwealth set up the Northern Endeavour Temporary Operations Program, taking control of the Northern Endeavour un until a longer-term solution could be agreed. To date, it has cost at least $200 million to maintain the vessel all taxpayers' money. This is at a time when the industry is battling on multiple fronts against extremists with their own agendas and where a social licence to operate is pivotal. They are faced with a cleaning up cleaning up the mess by a negligent government themselves via a proposed levy on industry. This bill, however, does not impose any such levy, and as I understand it, consultation is ongoing and a levy is proposed to apply to the industry to fund the decommissioning of the Northern Endeavour and relevant legislation will come to the fore in due course. Labor recognises the key role gas plays in creating economic growth and export income earnings for Australia. Labor recognises the many thousands of jobs the industry creates and sustains. We understand the importance of gas as a critical feedstock for Australia's manufacturing industry as well as in electricity generation and in providing the gen energy that millions of Australian households need for heating and cooking. Labor recognises the role of natural gas as a transition fuel in capitalising on renewable energy opportunities, and we support opening up new gas reserves subject to independent scientific assessment, assessments and effective environmental regulation. Gas will play a major part in reducing Australia's carbon emissions and it will assist our regional neighbours on their own journey to decarbonisation as they seek cleaner burning fuels as part of their energy mix, which is why the government's neg negligence on this issue, issue is so callous and why it's high time they introduce meaningful reform in this place. The bill strengthens Australia's offshore oil and gas regulatory regime to ensure that an emerging deed commissioning challenges facing the industry and are able to be managed effectively and addresses a loophole that, that failed to ensure that the cost of decommissioning an offshore project remain, the, remain with the entity or entities who are, who are or were responsible for or had the capacity to influence. This bill aims to strengthen the decommissioning framework from cradle to grave and better protect the marine environment and the taxpayer from bearing the cost. 
These are important objectives, but I would also point out that tightening decommissioned sta standards will result in significant jobs in the highly specialised oil and gas workforce. In pursuing successful decommissioning and the jobs it creates, we must also be mindful of the workplace safety requirements that will need to be enforced to keep th this work for workforce safe. This bill increases regulatory oversight and scrutiny by providing for specific decision-making criteria at decision points across the OP. GGS Act to ensure entities are sub suitable on entry into the regime and remain suitable throughout the life of the project. It also expands the type of, types of information that may be requested by the relevant decision maker from the applicant or applicants seeking to either enter into or progress through the regime. There are four key pillars of the, of the bill. Provi uh, the bill provides for oversight of changes in control of title holders. The sale of offshore project is meant to be captured as a transfer of the title or titles related to, to the project, project, which is also provided under the Act. But it is also common for the industry, both in Australia and overseas, for an offshore project to be transferred via the sale of the shares in the, co in the company that, that is the title holder. Such transactions are not currently captured by the OP. GGS Act because there are no transfers of the interests of the title or titles. It provides for specific decision-making criteria and expanded information and gathering powers to assess the suitability of ent entities wishing to enter into or progress through the regime. It includes minor and technical amendments to improve the operation of the Act. It mandates trailing liabilities, expanding existing powers powers to call back previous title holders to decommission infrastructure and uh, remediate the marine environment in the title area where the current or Im immediate former title holder is unable to do so. It aims to ensure that risk and liabilities of petroleum activities remain the responsibility of those who held or had the ability to influence operations under the title and cha change industry behaviour by increasing the due diligence undertaken by companies regarding who they sell their assets to. Madam Acting Deputy President, I, I'm running out of time, so I will just wind up. So why it has taken a long time for the government to act and, uh, to and to improve to ensure full removal of facilities at the end of their life. Labor supports the legislation to ensure Australians receive the insurance they require to ensure offshore oil and gas facilities are safely and appropriately decommissioned and removed. Thank, Thank you. you. Senator Wish Wilson. Thanks, Dep uh, Acting Deputy President. I'll, uh, I'll get to Labor's uh, shameful admission in this chamber just then on their support for fossil fuel industry and a gas-led recovery. In fact, I look forward to looking at the exact words in Hansard that uh, Senator Brown used uh, and promoting and publicising those. I think it's very important that the Australian people see there's the lack of difference between the Labor Party and the Liberal Party on the use of fossil fuels, especially in a week we get the IPCC report warning of a code red facing humanity. Uh, we're on the edge of an irreversible disaster if we don't immediately and rapidly reduce our emissions. And the idea that Labor would come into this chamber and say that gas is an important way of reducing emissions is literally abominable. And uh, I'll get to that in a little bit more detail shortly. Um, let's talk about a perfect scam. Let's talk about a perfect scam. Um, I'm a big petroleum company, uh, you know, a multi-billion multi dollar company, and uh, I have these ageing assets that have been written off to nothing in my, uh, in my balance sheet. Uh, I've never had to pay petroleum re resource rent tax uh, because of a very generous scheme set up, uh, interestingly, by, I think, uh, one of the architects was uh, Dr Emerson from the Labor Party. But nevertheless, I've been, I've been claiming up, uplift of 15 per cent per annum on all my expiration and 5 per cent per annum on all my operating expenditure. And now I'm part of a $350 billion tax offset, so I never have to pay petroleum rot rent tax uh, for the life of my project. And I'm getting to the end of the life of this project, and guess what I discover? I've got a multi-million dollar if not potentially hundreds of millions of dollars worth of liability to clean up these 
giant rusting rigs in the ocean. What would I do? What would be the perfect scam, senators? What could we do? Perhaps if there was a little bit of oil and gas left in my field, I might be able to sell this petroleum licence. And who would want a petroleum licence at the end of its life with a liability for potentially hundreds of millions of dollars? Probably a nice penny dreadful listed on the stock market. I can go out, I can raise some capital, I can say I'm buying an exploration and production licence from Woodside Petroleum. For example, my share price goes up, I can sell my shares and make millions of dollars, and I can squeeze every last bit of oil out of that field. And then, when the liability comes along, I declare bankruptcy. Bob's your uncle. Everybody wins. Everyone's a winner. Oh no, sorry, there's a loser. The taxpayer. Okay, so you think that's a theoretical example? I don't think so. I think there is a very real scenario here where a large company, Woodside Petroleum, sold off an ageing asset to a very small company. Surely they must have known this company wasn't capitalised to deal with that liability. That company purchased the asset and, lo and behold, wasn't able to meet its commitments for maintenance. And sure enough, the whole thing goes pear shape. And the taxpayer has to step in and foot the bill, which is exactly what's happened. I've asked questions multiple times on this scenario to Nopsema and to the government at estimates. And I know other senators have as well. And I know that there's environment groups out there like the Wilderness Society that have been doing a lot of work on this. And I'd like to uh, acknowledge in the Senate today uh, the Australian Wilderness Society uh, and in particular uh, Jess and Tim Bashara for the work that they've done on making many senators in this place, and not just the Greens, they've been talking to all political parties, aware of this impending problem. And this is just the tip of the iceberg, what we've seen. Um, of course, uh, Senator Brown talked about the Northern Endeavour, but there's a raft of ageing assets out there in the ocean, rust buckets, that are potentially pollutants that need to be remediated and fixed. And we've got to get on top of this now. I heard the proposal that maybe one of these you know, rusting, uh, ageing production platforms might make a good artificial reef. Why don't we literally take a, a giant welder to it and cut it to pieces and dump it in the ocean? Make a habitat for fish? Well, that's a, I'm not sure what the cost would be of that. I haven't actually looked at the numbers. Um, but I'm sure uh, even if it was acceptable from an environmental point of view, which I very much doubt, I'm sure it would be a cost-saving measure. On behalf of companies, senators, that make a lot of money they make significant returns on equity and significant returns on capital. They are some of the most profitable companies on the planet. And getting tax out of them, getting tax out of them is like getting blood out of a stone. And I have sat on numerous inquiries over many years on this exact issue. And I can tell you that the Australian Tax Department themselves calls them quote unquote systemic non-payers of tax. Now, interestingly enough, I will acknowledge that Woodside Petroleum does pay tax. Okay? Woodside Petroleum does pay tax. They're one of the few that haven't been dragged through the courts by the Australian Tax Office. But that doesn't go for the petroleum resource rent tax, which all the fossil fuel sector have uh, managed to uh, experience that large S over many years without paying the Australian people for the extraction of super profits uh, from our publicly owned resource. But there are a number of companies out there that aren't paying their tax. Uh, we're all familiar with the, high, the tax department's high court case against Chevron, for example. And believe me, uh, there are many others. So, of course, we will support any pathway towards 
levying some money out of the fossil fuel industry to pay for the clean-up of their own assets, which they have exploited over many years and made billions of dollars of profit on. Of course, that makes perfect sense. Just this last month, in the middle of the G7 meeting, which is predominantly focused on looking at taking climate action, the Prime Minister sneaked off and presented directly to the Appia conference in Perth, the Australian Petroleum Production Exploration Association. And what did the Prime Minister do when he spoke directly to that conference via video link from London while the rest of the world was talking about acting on climate change? He announced 80,000 square kilometres of new ocean permits for the fossil fuel industry—80,000 square kilometres of new permits, new areas of ocean to be opened up to the fossil fuel industry, to be burnt to produce carbon dioxide and add to global warming, in a climate emergency, in the middle of a conference discussing action on climate. That's our Prime Minister. That's this government. That is a national disgrace and a shame. So how many more of these assets are there going to be for future generations to decommission? There are hundreds of production platforms around this country, including in Bass Strait, off the coast of my home state of Tasmania. So this is very important to get right. But while we're at it, let's not kid ourselves. There is enough reserves of fossil fuel, petroleum and gas already discovered around the world that if we were to burn them would push us above two degrees of warming. Remember, the IPC said we have to limit warming to one and a half degrees, and we've only got five and a half years left of our carbon budget before we hit one and a half degrees. In other words, if we keep going as business as usual, we will exceed the target we all signed on to as an international community at the Paris Agreement. So why are we still risking our oceans with dangerous seismic testing, with dangerous offshore oil and gas drilling, for a product that, when we burn it, it is killing our oceans, it is warming our oceans, it is acidifying our oceans. It is the definition of insanity. It is the definition of insanity, and I think it is criminal that we are still pushing ahead. And when you hear the government spin this week, you hear them talking about uh, the fact that they have you know, exceeded their Kyoto commitments, uh, that they have somehow reduced emissions by 16 per cent since 2005. Well, if you take out the Kyoto clause and land clearing, which Australia very sneakily snuck into those negotiations. Our emissions are actually up 19 per cent in real terms. Australia is the third highest emitter of greenhouse gases per capita in the world, the third highest. We are also the third biggest exporter of fossil fuels behind Saudi Arabia uh, and Russia. We have failed to develop any long-term mitigation strategy to tackle climate change in the last nine years uh, under this government. Australia is the only country in the world to have legislated and repealed a carbon pricing mechanism, the only country in the world. And that's a shame and an international disgrace. We have no meaningful policies in place to electrify transport. We have no commitments to net zero emissions by 2050. We have a 26 to 28 per cent 2005 reduction target for our 2030 milestone. When the IPCC report said this week we now need to make that 75 per cent reductions if we're going to meet our targets. We've had a deputy prime minister, the second most powerful man in the country, just yesterday saying it's not up to the government to have a plan. It's not up to the government to protect Australians from fires and flood 
and famine from this climate emergency. It's the government's number one role to protect its people. And yet we hear that from the second most powerful man in the country. We have been constantly criticised by experts right around the world for having no nationally determined contribution under the Paris Agreement since 2015. We have consistently ignored recommendations on climate targets, such as the Climate Targets Panel report at the University of Melbourne, to continue to cut emissions. We have tried to gut and we ultimately reduced the renewable energy target. Only last week we shamefully allowed a clean energy investing government body set up by the Greens and Labor to invest in fossil fuels. We repealed a carbon price that did drive down emissions the first time ever by 7 per cent. We are pursuing a gas-fired lead recovery, even though there are better options with renewable energy. And we know, including from the IPCC report, that burning gas is not the solution. Indeed, they specifically singled out gas in their report as not something you want to do. Yet here we have the Labor Party in here peddling the line of the fossil fuel industry, joining with the Liberal Party to support a gas-led recovery in a time of climate emergency. If we do not have the Greens in this place and in the other place, we have no chance of holding either of these two parties to account. I am at least pleased that Labor have made it very clear today for their support for the fossil fuel industry, which cuts across all the best available science. And I hope uh, that some in the environment movement out there are listening to what was said in here today. And the Labor Party make it very clear that they support more gas, more exploration, more development uh, in the middle of a climate crisis. I'll just finish by saying one word, and that's leadership. If I could ask for anything from this parliament, from this institution, that I think has dismally failed their duty of care of future generations, it is leadership. We used to be a leader a decade ago. It's so sad to see the Labor Party walking back that leadership and supporting the government in a gas-led recovery. We need leadership to stand up and say we have to transition. The costs of inaction by far outweigh the costs of action. We have to do this not just for our economy, for our community. We have to do this for future generations. And it can only be done in this place. Climate change is an environmental problem, but it is first and foremost a political problem. It is politics and governments that have failed on climate change. This is the only place we can fix it, and this is a small step Thank you, Senator Wish towards Wilson. that. Your time has expired. Senator Scar. Um, Madam Acting Deputy President, I do wish to rise to speak in favour of this bill, and I want to really pay compliment to uh, Minister Pitt in relation to how he's managed a very difficult issue in relation to Northern Endeavour. And Senator Wish Wilson is correct insofar as this was an old piece of infrastructure that was sold by Woodside to a purchaser. Woodside had made the decision—I'm saying this as a Woodside shareholder and that's on my register of interests—Woodside had made a decision that the production life of that asset um, it didn't want to extend that production life, and it made that decision. Then it went out in the market to sell that asset. I have a firm view, a firm view as someone who's worked in the mining industry, who's been involved in transactions in the mining industry, that if you own and operate mining assets or oil and gas assets, you have a very strong obligation arising out of legal requirements, but also your social licence to operate, that when you, when you transfer that to someone else, the person you transfer it to has both the financial and technical capability to discharge their legal obligations. That did not occur in this case. Northern Endeavour went under. Northern Endeavour went under, and instead of instead of all the Australian taxpayers having to meet that huge liability, hundreds of millions of dollars associated with decommissioning that that platform, it is fit and proper. It is fit and proper that the oil and gas industry needs to bear its share the lion's share of meeting that cost. And it's right that the oil and gas industry should look towards Woodside and ask Woodside's senior executive team, how did it come to this? How did it come to this? How did it come to this that you've sold this ageing piece of infrastructure to a company that didn't have the technical or financial uh, capacity to 
to, to meet its obligations. And in that context, in that context, you've now resulted, you've now caused a levy to be imposed upon the whole industry. And Woodside needs to reflect on that very, very carefully. Second point I want to make is this. There was a gaping hole in this legislation before this bill that would allow someone to be the subject of an upstream takeover where someone acquired the shares in a holding company and didn't have to necessarily meet the technical and financial capability obligations of the actual tenement holder. And when oil and gas companies set up special purpose vehicles to hold oil and gas tenements, you can't just look at the special purpose vehicle, you've got to look up the corporate tree. So it is fit and proper that an added obligation be added in a takeover context for the ultimate holding company to prove that it has the financial and technical uh, wherewithal to discharge its obligations. We've got $52 billion of these contingent liabilities on the horizon, and we must make sure, we must make sure that the commercial operators who are legally, morally responsible as part of their legal requirements but also their social licence to operate do exactly all that they need to do so that these facilities are safely decommissioned for the benefit of all the Australian people and for the environment. Thank you. Senator Hanson Young. That's, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I'm just giving notice that I need to seek leave uh, before the two minute statement starts. So I'm just getting your attention. So what did you need to seek leave for? Um, I missed the introduction of uh, giving notice of a motion, so I would, uh, I'm seeking leave to give notice of a motion. Leave granted? Yes, leave granted. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I give notice that on the next day of sitting I will introduce uh, a private member's bill in relation to insurance for the arts industry. Thank you. So it is now being 1.30. I will move to set two minute statements. Senator Polly remotely. Thank you very much. How good are Tasmanian athletes? It's not a question we really have to ask if you had the honour of being able to watch the 2020 Tokyo Olympics. I think we can all agree in this place that Australia has done all Australians very proud. I, like many Australians, have been an armchair expert over the last three weeks, watching much of the coverage of these games. I'm sure you would agree, Madam Acting Deputy President, that it has been so inspiring to see so many Tasmanian athletes on the world stage representing our state. We have been blessed to see 12 Tasmanians compete in a total of nine sports, including swimming, hockey, soccer, track and road cycling, triathlons, basketball, rowing, athletics and canoeing. All of these athletes, regardless of whether they are fortunate enough to bring home a medal, all deserve all the success that will come their way. They have represented their nation at the highest level in sport and something that no one will ever be able to take away from them. I would like to acknowledge Tasmania Sports Administrator, fellow Launceston resident and examiner columnist, uh, columnist Brian Rowe for his time at the Games officiating at the Athletics Tokyo 2020. It's been providing hope and inspiration to all of us during a very trying time globally and at home in our own state of Tasmania. So congratulations to all of them. But in particular, Ariane Titmus is now a household name and I'm sure all Tasmanians and Australians are looking forward to welcoming her home along with her medals. The footage over the past couple of weeks has displayed raw emotion and the power of sport to bring communities together. It is extremely gratifying to watch athletes in peak condition compete and endure success and endure and be successful you, to Senator prepare Polly, themselves time mentally has expired. and to... Senator Canavan. Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy. Uh, President, I, I rise today to encourage Australians to help save lives by uh, registering to donate their organs. The last week of July was uh, Donate Life uh, Week, uh, uh, where it was very important to remind uh, all Australians how important it is that some of us do choose to donate our organs at the end of our lives, because that means that we can save other lives. I joined uh, a gentleman in Rockhampton, Lee Brisky, who is a successful local mechanic, uh, and his life he's only continuing to be a successful mechanic thanks to a liver transport transplant 10 years ago. I joined him and his wife Sandy and daughter Maddie, uh, and they were so uh, thankful uh, to, the, to the people who did donate organs to help uh, Lee still be here. 
uh, with us. There are about 1,800 Australians, though, that remain on a waiting list uh, for uh, an organ, and there's around 12,000 Australians who are on dialysis machines that could benefit uh, from a kidney transplant. Uh, so it's very important that Australians do consider uh, registering to donate their organs. Uh, unfortunately, during COVID, there was a 16 per cent drop in the number of Australians signing up to be organ donors. Uh, so it's something this year we should reconsider to do. In fact, I was under the misapprehension before I was contacted by Joe Reach from Donate Life that in Queensland, if you'd registered to donate on your driver's licence many years ago, in my case, you were on the register to donate. That is not the case. It is very important to remind all Australians that all you need to do is go to donatelife.gov.au slash register uh, and ensure that you are on that register uh, so that that can happen um, when it might be in need. Uh, I did that on that day as soon as I found out. So, Blank Shaw, you do think about it. Talk to your loved ones about it. Make sure they know what you want and go to donatelife.gov.au slash register. It takes two seconds and you could help save a life. Thank you. Senator Thorpe, remotely. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Last Saturday, a young black man from Walgett was released from Bathurst Prison. The ABC reports that he was tested while imprisoned and, re and was released before his results were known. We're talking about COVID testing here. Because Bathurst Prison didn't, and let's be honest, could not provide our communities with proper culturally safe medical care, Bathurst Prison put our people in grave danger. While he was tested only one week before his release and released anyway, Walgett and surrounding towns have high First Nations populations, around 40%. And our people were the best prepared and responded quicker than any government to the pandemic, only to be absolutely let down by the New South Wales government and their officials. In fact, the first Aboriginal health service in this country was born in New South Wales. That mob have been looking after us for 50 years. Now our communities and our old people, the keepers of tradition, culture and song, could be at risk because Bathurst Prison did not do their job. That's why we need Greens in power, balance of power. And we'll be pushing the new government, hopefully, to make sure that a culturally safe and well-resourced oversight mechanism of prisons via the OPCAT is established urgently. We will make sure imprisoned people have access to Medicare and good medical care. This is why this is important, because without these things, people will die. That person Senator, isn't let out your time a has expired. Vote. Senator Walsh has a call. Thank you. Uh, integrity, accountability, delivery of these three basic tests of leadership. Prime Minister Scott Morrison fails all of them. Integrity. Let's talk about integrity. Recently, the Prime Minister has been caught out in yet another government pork barrelling exercise, caught out on another colour-coded spreadsheet, caught out spending taxpayer money like it's Liberal Party money, and more than 600 million taxpayer dollars spent to build car parks in Liberal and marginal seats. Accountability. Let's talk about accountability. A true leader has to stand up and front up to what they've done. They have to answer the tough questions. But this Prime Minister, he just walks away from them. He literally walks out on journalists who are trying to hold him to account. And he denies knowledge of anything. What colour-coded spreadsheets? Which minister can I pin this one on? How can I spin this one? And delivery, let's talk about that. The Prime Minister can't even deliver on his government's own pork barrelling. Just two of these mm -hmm. rotted car parks have actually been built. Just two. If this Prime Minister and his government can't even deliver on their own rorts, how are they going to deliver for the people of this country? How can they deliver Australians through this pandemic? How can they deliver Australians good, secure jobs? How can they deliver Australians a future that they can count on? 
Australians need a real leader. They need a leader who is ready to stand up for them and fight for them. They need a leader with integrity. They need a leader who will be accountable to the people of this country and a leader who will deliver for the people of this country, not for themselves. Prime Minister Morrison fails on all Thank three you, Senator counts. Walsh. Your time's expired. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. I deliver this speech on behalf of Senator Roberts. I'll discuss Parliament's shoddy governance on COVID, lack of learning, lack of planning and lack of oversight. Vaccine proponents claim COVID injections are safe like the polio vaccine. Here's real data. In the polio vaccine's early days, it caused deaths. The Qatar incident, incident in 1955 was called one of the worst pharmaceutical disasters in US history, with 164 permanent paralysis cases and 10 deaths among vaccinate, vaccinated individuals and contacts. Many Australians fear the government has only one COVID solution, experimental gene therapy injections. Already, vaccine efficiency is plummeting. Lancet last month showed vaccine efficiency is falling twofold between 21 to 41 days and 70 days after the second dose. 63% of Israelis have had both Pfizer doses, yet Israel recorded 3,372 new cases on Monday, 10 times what it was worth a month ago. 10, 10 times what it was a month ago. Deaths are increasing. Israel's health ministry studies how Pfizer vaccine is now only 39% effective against infection. Pfizer recently admitted that immunity from its two-dose vaccine is waning and will seek FDA authorization for a third booster shot. Randomized control trials show no evidence of the provisionally approved vaccines have any prolonged efficiency. The experimental vaccines manufacturers demand and got indemnity from the Australian government demonstrating a lack of faith in their own product. We do know that vaccinated Australians have been harmed or have died. This government, Labor and the unions who supported compulsory injections without workers' informed consent have lost people's trust. Australians deserve to know the injection significant short-term risk Thank and unknown long-term side expired. effects for us. And Senator O'Sullivan. Every Australian should have access to world-class health services, particularly in WA. We have massive surplus and booster GST receipts delivered by the Morrison government. But sadly, it's not the case. Yesterday on 6PR, Premier Mark McGowan's health minister, Roger Coot, gave an extraordinary interview. When asked why our health system was in crisis, he blamed Western Australians. He blamed them for coming to hospital now with chronic and long-term health conditions that weren't appropriately treated over the last 18 months. He admitted GPs are telling him that because our health system is geared towards the pandemic, Western Australians are now generally sicker than they were before it started. Tumours have gone undiagnosed because of our health system, because it can't walk and chew gum at the same time. We have record hours of ambulance ramping, 5,200 hours for June alone, and we've seen tragic stories coming out of our hospitals, families who will be grieving for a lifetime. As a direct result of his leadership, we have a health system in crisis. We have a system that can't cope with business as usual, let alone a public health emergency. He is out there spruiking over a billion in spending to upgrade the system and to get more health staff in WA and still refuses to admit that we have a problem. Gareth Parker on 6PR put him on, uh, put him on yesterday, a reason, put to him a reasonable proposition. He asked if this situation gave the minister and other health leaders cause to reflect on their own performance over the course of the pandemic. And the minister's response was he thought that their performance was outstanding. Staff working in our health system and the public who use it deserve a minister who wants to get stuck in and sort this mess out. Sadly, that's not what they're getting with Roger Cook. Okay. Senator Farrell. Thank you, uh, Madam uh, Acting uh, Deputy uh, President. And, uh, I rise uh, uh, this afternoon uh, to speak on the uh, wonderful announcement uh, this week by Netball Australia uh, to campaign for netball uh, to be included in the 2032 Olympics. Uh, as uh, you would know, uh, Deputy, uh, um, Deputy President, um, Australia has been successful 
um, and in particular Queensland has been successful in uh, gaining the uh, 2030 uh, Olympics and wouldn't it just be a wonderful treat for uh, that event in Australia and for the first time uh, for netball to be included uh, as a, an Olympic uh, sport. In fact, um, <clears throat> I guess the surprising thing is, given its popularity, particularly in Australia, uh, that it hasn't already been included uh, as an Olympic uh, sport. I've taken this uh, opportunity uh, as the uh, opposition's uh, shadow minister for sport uh, to write to uh, the CEO of Netball Australia, uh, Kate Ryan, and welcome this uh, terrific uh, uh, initiative. Uh, netball has an iconic place in Australia's sporting community. Um, every night, every day, all around Australia, uh, you'll see women and girls uh, playing this, uh, this terrific sport. Uh, and uh, as you, I suspect, know, uh, uh, Deputy President, <coughs> Acting Deputy President, uh, netball is the top sport for female participation in this, uh, in this country. We've already um, set to host the 2027 Netball World Cup, so if Netball Australia is successful with their campaign, a generation of young uh, Australians will get to see their heroes not once but twice on uh, Australian uh, Thank soil. You, Senator, Senator McMahon. Thank you, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, in this chamber this morning, Senator Wong moved a motion condemning the comments of the member for Dawson. You will note that I voted against this motion. Now, the reason I voted for get against this motion is it that I agree with the comments that he made. No, I certainly don't. I disagree. But I, like Senator Canavan, respect his right to have debate in this place and in the other place. That is what we do. We come here to debate ideas. He believes that what he said was true and correct. I don't agree, but I respect his right to say that. And If we look at why an intelligent, educated person would say something that's contrary to the views that are held by science, we look at the science itself. It wasn't very long ago that um, scientific reports and papers were in scientific journals. It took a long time. It was very hard to get these papers published. Nowadays, there are so many platforms, including online, that Karen from Melbourne can go and have her paper on whatever she likes published. And there is a lot of stuff out there, and it's available to the general public. This didn't used to be the case. <clears throat> it's very easy for some of these complex studies and papers to be misinterpreted. If we look at the wearing of masks, there is a paper that says masks do nothing to stop you catching COVID. Uh, the study proved that. However, what they didn't look at was does it stop you spreading it or does it stop spread in the community? Because they already knew that masks do stop you spreading COVID, they do stop community spread. All they said was in this particular one study, it doesn't stop you from catching it. So we need to interpret you, these Senator things McMahon. with scientific advice. Senator Patrick. Thank you, uh, Madam uh, Acting Deputy President. We know that uh, the, uh, the future submarine project and the future frigate program is a, is a mess, both from a cost perspective and from a delivery perspective. That may well have a ripple effect through all of the naval shipbuilding programs. And in the context of what is happening to our north, there is a changing geostrategic situation um, uh, developing. We need to make sure that we are able to field our, uh, our defence force assets. And in particular, I want to talk about submarines because they are a very strong deterrent, a very capable uh, military asset. We cannot afford to not have our submarines available. We have a situation where still on the table is the prospect of those of the submarine full cycle docking work being shifted to Western Australia. We need to understand that if that were to occur, only about seven per cent of the workforce would go to, to Western Australia. We would lose an incredible amount of corporate knowledge 
and that would affect submarine availability. Everyone can remember back in the days of the Gillard government where we had no submarines able to go to sea. We need a decision on the full cycle docking and it needs to stay in uh, South Australia where we can do the life of type extension. It's the one stable element, it's the one working element of our naval shipbuilding program. We do not need to be taking the advice of those who have led us into the mess we have with shipbuilding that we should be shifting something that's working. It would be catastrophic for national security. Uh, we need to give workers in Adelaide uh, certainty and we also need to give the supply chain certainty. Make the Thank decision, you, Minister. Patrick. Time's expired. Senator Sheldon, remotely. And thank you, Acting Deputy President. Yesterday I spent an hour on ABC radio listening to an awful litany of stories from Australian workers at the roughest end of this country's broken employment system. People who are victims of in the insecure work disaster. Gig work, sham contracting, labour hire and other indirect employment arrangements, part-time work with zero hour, hour arrangements, fixed term contracts where the work goes beyond the term of the contract. Caller after caller on the program spoke and told the human story of a grim reality. What used to be solid middle class jobs have been stripped of the middle class pay, conditions and rights that once defined them. Teachers at schools, TAFEs and universities, mine workers, aged care workers, cleaners, hospitality workers. People like Jen who said she had given up custody of her 11-year-old son to his father so that she could say yes to her last-minute shifts as a casual. She eventually lost shifts, couldn't pay her rent and had to move out of her house. Or Jack, a casual TAFE teacher for 30 years who said, my pension plan is the lotto. That's it. That's my pension plan. Or Margaret, a 68-year-old casual teacher who fought for 20 years to have her job made permanent. Of course, she doesn't receive the super she needs. And she says, this rarely happens to any of my male colleagues who retire with very lucrative super packages. Or Ian, who said, my son, uh, who is a casual in the disability care industry, had his first vaccination and had some side effects like a headache and couldn't work until the next day. So he got no pay. Now, these are just the tip of the insecure work iceberg. Faced with a choice between starvation wages or starvation, people Thanks, will choose Senator starvation Sheldon, wages. Your time's it's expired. No choice at all. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. Access to affordable sexual and reproductive health care, including abortion and contraception, is part of everyone's right to control their own body. Campaigns for reproductive rights have been hard fought over many decades, and I pay tribute to my Greens colleagues across the country and to long-term advocates like Beryl Holmes in my home state of Queensland for their tireless efforts. The decriminalisation of abortion across Australia, including in Queensland in 2018, finally recognised that reproductive choice is a health issue. Yet we are seeing conservative governments in many states of America recriminalising abortion and defunding services. And just this week, uh, Mr George Christensen introduced his nonsensical and regressive Children Born Alive bill into the House in another attempt to push the anti-abortion agenda. Now, I hope that bill will never be debated, but it has the backing of the Queensland LNP conference and Senator Canavan, uh, which says a lot about the LNP's attitudes to women. The Greens will continue to work at federal and state levels to ensure that abortion is safe, accessible, free and legal in all Australian states and territories. Despite decriminalisation, abortions can still be expensive and difficult to access, particularly for those in rural and regional Australia. Um, access has been made even harder with the recent closure of Murray Stopes clinics in regional Queensland and northern New South Wales. Abortion care should be available in public hospitals across Australia, and telehealth services for reproductive health care should be a permanent feature of our Medicare system. The Greens will continue to support safe zones so that people accessing abortions are not subjected to harassment for undergoing medical procedures. I was pleased to see WA pass legislation for safe zones earlier this week. And we'll make sure that unbiased professional counselling is available to all uh, who want it but is never mandatory. 
The Greens will always support the right to safe, legal and affordable thank access you, to Senator reproductive health care. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. On today's date, 200 years ago, a Gadigal man named Nambury died, and I'm pleased to have his name recorded by Hansard for the first time on this, the bicentenary of his death. Nambury was laid to rest by his friend, the convict brewer, James Squire, and was buried at his own request in the same grave as this continent's first foreign envoy, Benelong. As the Australian historian Dr Keith Vincent Smith notes, there could be no greater mark of respect. Nambury was brought into the Sydney colony as a nine-year-old boy suffering smallpox eruptions from head to toe. He was taken into the surgery of John White at the rocks and nursed back to health. He was nursed by another Gadigal man, Arabanu, who was being held in chains and forced to learn English so he could be used to act as a translator. Arabanu also contracted smallpox and died. Both the Nambury's parents died of smallpox, a disease that killed 50 per cent of the Sydney Aboriginal clans and an unknown number west of the Blue Mountains. Nambury joined Matthew Flinders on his 1803-1804 circumnavigation of the continent he would name Australia. King Boongari remained on board for the entire voyage. Flinders called them both fine Australians. When Bennelong returned from London, he was invited by James Squire and 100 Aboriginal people to share the 30-acre land grant that Squire had been given. They farmed that land cooperatively and grew it into a 1,500-acre land grant. A testament, a testament, Madam Acting Deputy President, to positive race relations and a symbol to all modern-day Australians of what can be achieved when we work together in a spirit of friendship and where our First Nation people are provided opportunity and care, dignity and hope. Thank you. Senator Wong. Every day Australians wake to a country deeper in crisis, a crisis caused by Mr Morrison's character. Cases of COVID are spreading and they are spreading through an Australian population that is mostly unvaccinated. And too many Australians are unvaccinated because Mr Morrison didn't act until it was too late to get vaccine deals, and he didn't do enough deals. And then when he found, got found out, he tried to make the excuse, it's not a race. Greater Sydney remains in protracted lockdown, which Mr Morrison pressured the New South Wales Premier to avoid. Pressure that only led to a bigger, longer lockdown and pressure that helped see the outbreak spread beyond Greater Sydney. South Australia and much of Queensland have been in and out of lockdown. Melbourne is in lockdown. The ACT is in lockdown. Much of regional New South Wales is in lockdown in the Hunter, Northern Rivers, including Byron Bay and Tamworth, and Armidale. Dubbo, Bogan, Burke, Gilgandra, Walgett and Warren, all in lockdown, and many others. It's long been said that character is destiny, and as long as Mr Morrison remains Prime Minister, Australia's destiny is weighed down, held back by his character. We saw it in the bushfires. He said it didn't matter that he went to Hawaii because he didn't hold a hose. And we see it now. It didn't matter that he stuffed up the vaccine rollout because it's not a race. He always leaves it too late, and then all he offers is excuses, or he blames someone else, or he just dodges the issue. And it is Australians who suffer the consequences. Australians are owed more, and they deserve better from a government. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr President. We are certainly in a national race to get vaccinated. Modelling from the Burnett Institute highlights the need, frankly, to preserve public health measures as a key line of defence in our nation even when we achieve vaccination rates above 80 per cent. In fact, we need to get something more to something more like 95 per cent. And they model 95 per cent as uh, including uh, 95 per cent for people over um, 60 and even vaccination rates of 70 and 80 per cent uh, for even for children. It is only under these circumstances that if COVID were to be rife in our community with open borders between states 
and uh, the globe that we would be able to prevent mass deaths. Their modelling showed that if, for example, uh, COVID had let rip in Victoria with only 60 per cent of people vaccinated, then over a year we would have some 16,000 deaths. So what this shows is a need for extreme caution when we look at the Prime Minister's attempts to sell uh, his plan for a four-stage path out of lockdown to return to freedom. It cannot be achieved at the vaccination levels the Prime Minister has currently suggested. So I encourage senators and all Australians to listen clearly to the evidence, uh, including the evidence uh, and research from Australia's Burnett Institute. Senator Smith. Oh, thank you very much, Mr President. I'm delighted to stand up today to congratulate the Indian Society of Western Australia on what I understand was a fantastic Sangam 221 celebration at the Perth Convention Centre on the 7th of August. Sangam, coordinated by ISWAR and its member associations, features magnific magnificent cultural performances showcasing India's diversity while celebrating India's uh, unity. The diversity of Perth's Indian community and member associations is highlighted by the many dance and music performances presented at this important cultural event. The event also raised important funds to support the provision of essential equipment and services to those impacted by COVID-19 in India. I congratulate again the Indian community in Western Australia for the wonderful work that they are doing in celebrating their diversity and making Western Australia such a wonderful place to live. Thank you, Senator Smith. If I could just make an announcement, Senators. Senators will be aware of the announcement by the ACT government of a COVID-19 case being detected in the ACT overnight and the consequent announcement of restrictions applying to the ACT. Before I deal with the arrangements flowing from today's developments, can I again strongly urge all to continue to abide by COVID safe practices, distancing, wearing masks, checking for symptoms and isolating and testing if they appear at all. Regarding developments today, first, I urge all senators and all staff to urgently check and constantly recheck the exposure sites listed on the ACT Health website and follow all ACT public health directives, both with respect to the local restrictions generally and any that may specifically apply to individuals impacted and required to test, isolate or quarantine. Second, under the ACT public health directives, Parliament is an essential workplace. Senators and members and staff will continue to be allowed to work from Parliament House to serve their constituents and fulfil parliamentary duties. Media and journalists are also essential workers and entitled to continue their essential work out of this building. We will expand the measures already in place that we put in place for this fortnight regarding staff working from home, especially as Parliament is not sitting next week for the period of this lockdown. Third, with respect to returning home and then to the ACT for the resumption of Parliament. Further details will be circulated as they are determined by state and territory officials following consultation with the Commonwealth. However, as well as the existing requirements in place for Victoria, South Australia and Western Australia, I understand announcements have already been made by Tasmania and the Northern Territory. Um, I also understand that an announcement is likely to come regarding Queensland, but I do not have information about that yet. Importantly, it is likely that some of these additional state requirements will be made retrospective in nature, so senators intending to return to their home base should be aware of that possibility. I remind all that this building has been operating under extremely strict conditions since these sittings commenced, as strict as any time during the pandemic, with many members and senators participating remotely, around two-thirds or more of built regular building staff working remotely, catering being restricted to takeaway only, use of the check-in app, social distancing and masks inside the building with marshals, and, they have, and extensive pairing arrangements and spacing in the chambers. These have been substantially above the local requirements of the ACT prior to this incident, specifically to reduce the risk of any transmission in this unique workplace. Again, I would like to thank both Commonwealth and ACT health, health officials for their assistance and cooperation in this matters. And I'd particularly like to thank senators and all staff in this building for their cooperation 
with the evolving requirements and rules, it has been critical to maintaining the operation of the national parliament. I thank senators. Questions without notice, Senator O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. President. And my question is to the minister representing the prime minister, Senator Birmingham. Today, the COVID-19 crisis continues to grow. 345 new cases have been reported in New South Wales, with 93 deaths resulting from the current New South Wales outbreak. Does Mr Morrison now regret pressuring the New South Wales Premier to avoid a hard and fast lockdown? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. I thank the Senator uh, for her question and indeed acknowledge it continues to be a very challenging day for uh, people across many different parts of Australia, uh, as it is uh, for people across many, many different parts of the world. Uh, I reject the assertion made by the senator in terms of pressuring. Uh, it, is, uh, it is well known uh, that, uh, that throughout uh, the management of the COVID pandemic, uh, New South Wales had uh, shown an extraordinary capacity in terms of uh, their uh, testing, COVID tracing uh, and isolating regime to be able to get on top of multiple outbreaks uh, through that time. Clearly, as is publicly acknowledged and as the Prime Minister has publicly acknowledged, the Delta variant uh, has created an additional challenge for systems uh, and in relation to the increased rate of transmissibility that comes with the Delta variant. Uh, indeed, it's estimated the Delta variant results in a 100 per cent increase in relation to transmission. And with those changed uh, circumstances, so too, as we've had to right throughout the pandemic, uh, the advice and the approach changes appropriately too. The advice and the approach changes appropriately too. Order. Uh, we want to see Order. the New South Wales lockdown succeed. We want to see New South Wales get on top of it. It is why, as a government, we have been offering additional resources and assistance along the way to New South Wales, be that in the form of additional contact tracing support or additional support in relation to enforcement uh, of the lockdown uh, through the supply of Australian Defence Force personnel to work alongside of New South Wales Police. We will continue to deliver the support we can to assist New South Wales. Senator O'Neill, a supplementary question. In New South Wales, in addition to Dubbo, towns with very high Aboriginal populations like Walgett, Burke and Brewarrina have today been plunged into lockdown. Does Mr Morrison regret that despite promising First Nations Australians that they would be a priority Order. in the vaccine rollout, only 10 per cent have been vaccinated more than 18 months into the pandemic? Order. I'm going to insist. Uh, order on my right. I need to hear the question. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks Mr President. Uh, well, indeed, the government is acutely aware of the uh, reality of uh, different regional communities uh, facing uh, lockdown and cases of COVID-19. Uh, as we've been aware in terms of communities with uh, higher rates of Indigenous populations of the consequences such as when the Northern Territory uh, has faced uh, lockdown conditions uh, as well. Uh, where possible, we deploy additional support and resources in relation to those communities. Uh, the Senator asked a question about uh, vaccine availability and, uh, and prioritisation. Uh, as is being well canvassed, uh, vaccine availability has been a challenge at times. Uh, however, I'd note that uh, in terms of some of those cohorts who have been amongst the first eligible to receive a vaccine, uh, we have seen in many of those cohorts uh, them uh, undertake that activity uh, of their own volition in numbers that have achieved very high uptake. And I urge all those uh, who are in cohorts Order, that may not have achieved such high uptake the answer has uh, to seize every opportunity. Order, Senator Birmingham. Senator O'Neill, a final supplementary question. While Melbourne's in lockdown, Sydney and large parts of New South Wales are in lockdown, Canberra is going into lockdown. Coalition MP Mr Christensen is saying, and I quote, we need to end all of these ridiculous zero risk, anti-freedom, anti-privacy pandemic restrictions right now. 
Does Mr Morrison regret putting his political interest ahead of the health of Australians by refusing to rein in Mr Christensen? Again, on my right, on my right, I need to hear the question. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, well, Mr. President, the government has made clear, both in uh, the other chamber and in this place, uh, views in relation to uh, uh, the comments made uh, by Mr. Christensen. Uh, the uh, the approach of the government is clearly to make sure uh, that uh, we emphasise to Australians the importance of abiding by public health orders, by restrictions in place, uh, following advice in all circumstances, and that includes advice in relation to uh, the. Uh, vaccination rollout as well. Um, it's been deeply frustrating at times that different things uh, have indeed uh, hurt public confidence in the vaccination rollout. Uh, I've noted Professor uh, Dorr from the Kirby Institute's remarks that, uh, that we will look back on anti-AstraZenecanism uh, as one of the greatest public health failings in many years. And, uh, and whilst uh, the health advice uh, has ebbed and flowed, if you like, in relation to AZ. It's certainly been disappointing that some have exacerbated Order, that Senator in Birmingham. more extreme Time ways. For the answer has expired. Order. Senator Van. Thank you, Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Can the Minister advise the Senate how the Australian response to the COVID-19 pandemic, from our frontline and essential workers to our small businesses and farmers, is helping Australia address the ongoing challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic. The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, well, from the very start uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic, indeed before the World Health Organization declared it to be a pandemic, uh, we have had uh, frontline workers, uh, be they those working on our borders, in our health systems, uh, or indeed the many scientists and others uh, that we rely upon for advice and information, uh, doing an incredible job in the service of our country. And it is the work of all of those uh, that has enabled governments across this country uh, to achieve world-leading outcomes in terms of protecting Australians, keeping people safe uh, and achieving outcomes in the saving of lives uh, that are far in excess uh, of uh, the tragic, terrible circumstances we've seen in so much of the rest of the world. Uh, Mr President, uh, many of those are today uh, engaged in activities across the country in helping with testing, in helping with contact tracing uh, or in helping with the vaccination rollout. And we extend our thanks to all of them for all that they are doing in helping uh, the country. We extend our thanks to the many essential workers uh, in food, manufacturing, production, distribution and other industries uh, that have been so important, as well as the other care sectors who have had to step up at times when restrictions have been imposed on so many other activities. I want to acknowledge uh, the many Australians continuing to turn out in record numbers to get vaccinated. Uh, we have seen in the last 24 hours 262,314 vaccines administered across Australia. This once again, Mr President, is another daily record. Uh, to administer those vaccines, we have many GP clinics opening late at night, additional hours, alongside increasing numbers of pharmacies, uh, putting in extra hours alongside those working in state clinics or seeking to get into specialist centres, aged care, remote populations or otherwise. It's a huge effort by those individuals in the largest peacetime Order. logistical Senator undertaking our nation has, has seen. Expired. Senator Van, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, how is the health response by Australians, including through the vac vaccination rollout, providing the foundation for us to chart our way back from COVID-19? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, with the record number of doses administered in the last 24 hours, we now see uh, close to 14.5 million doses administered across Australia. Uh, our country is administering vaccines to the tune of, uh, of being able to provide a jab to the entire population of Adelaide uh, every single week. Uh, it has uh, been a huge scale-up, as I indicated before, and in doing so we have seen uh, some of the most important cohorts who had primary access uh, turn out in record numbers, taking responsibility for themselves in doing so, but responding to that call. Those 70-plus uh, Australians, uh, those aged over 70, some 82.2 per cent of them have now received their first dose. 49.9 per cent have now received their second dose 
uh, of vaccine amongst those aged over 70. Of the entire eligible population aged over 16, some 46 per cent of all Australians have now Order. received at least Senator that Birmingham. first dose. Senator Van, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, how has the Liberal and Nationals government's economic plan supported Australian jobs and businesses through the pandemic? Senator Birmingham. We've always been very conscious of the reality uh, that responding to COVID-19 has been about saving both lives and livelihoods. Uh, and despite the many difficulties and uncertainties that Australia and the rest of the world have faced, uh, we've continued to outperform the rest of the world in terms of saving uh, the lives of Australians, in terms of saving the jobs of Australians, the businesses of Australians and the fundamentals that will enable Australia to come out of this pandemic and more strongly than so many other nations who have been affected so much worse. Uh, prior to uh, the recent challenges of additional lockdowns across the country, uh, we saw unemployment having dipped below 5 per cent to 4.9 per cent, a comeback in terms of unemployment far exceeding expectations and, uh, and the strong jobs growth putting Australia in a position of seeing uh, employment at levels uh, in excess of pre-pandemic. Our economic responses have helped achieve these outcomes, and we continue to deliver record Order. support Senator to families, Birmingham. households Time and businesses for the answer to get has them through expired. this. Senator Ayres. My question is to the minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator McKenzie. When asked about Mr Christensen's disinformation, Mr Morrison's Deputy Prime Minister, Barnaby Joyce, said, and I quote, if you start prodding the bear, you're going to make the situation worse for us as a government, not better. What does Mr Morrison's Deputy Prime Minister mean? The Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator McKenzie. Well, thank you very much, Mr President. I thank the Senator for his question. Um, I listened to Barnaby Joyce's interview, uh, as so many Australians did, on RN uh, yesterday, where this question was canvassed, and he was very clear that he does not go to Mr Christensen for advice on how to uh, protect his family and his community around COVID. He does not agree with uh, George Christensen's views on lockdowns, masks and other things. But what he does do is absolutely support Mr Christensen's right as uh, a citizen of a free country and as uh, a community member to have an opinion and to express it. Now, we have, not, we have seen numerous times in this place uh, individuals take to Facebook, take to public platforms to express views which we don't agree with, whether it's supporting criminals like uh, those to my right, order. the Greens. Senator Wong on a point of order. Mr President, um, the direct relevance, Senator Ayer's question was to ask the person who represents Mr Joyce in this chamber what, a direct quote, if you start prodding the bear, you're going to make, make the situation worse for us as a government, what he meant. So on the, on the point of order, um, it is a quite a broad question, but in my view it does need to be restricted to meanings or potential meanings or imputations of that particular comment rather than observations on others to be directly relevant. Um, but it is very broad, I, I must say, in that sense. So I call Senator McKenzie to continue. <laughs> Thank you. And as I was saying, um, people in this place, on their Facebook pages, on the floor of this chamber and in public. Order. Senator Wong, on the point of order, I can probably, minister, I can probably guess it. The, yep. the, the minister, Mr President, she can't just ignore your ruling. I, I'm going to ask Senator McKenzie that um, I did say that observations on others I didn't think were in order when the question was what does the Deputy Prime Minister mean. That is a broad question, but I do believe that it needs to be limited to meanings, potential meanings or otherwise of that statement rather than observations upon others. Senator McKenzie. Uh, well, as to, I think what, uh, if I could paraphrase what I think uh, the Deputy Prime Minister and was talking about, was reflecting on Mr Christensen's comments uh, in the chamber and clearly articulating that he didn't support them, that he uh, supported 
following the medical advice, and uh, he himself is also following the health advice right now as he is in lockdown in Armidale, uh, New South Wales, as a result of uh, a state health order in that state. So Barnaby Joyce, as the Deputy Prime Minister, has been clarified those comments. He doesn't agree Order, with Senator George McKenzie, Christensen, but he agrees answer. with his right has to say five. it. Senator Ayres, a supplementary question. The Deputy Prime Minister has also said, and I quote, and I'll say that to my colleagues, I can assure you that when you've got a thin margin, don't start giving reasons for a by-election. Did Mr Morrison's Deputy Prime Minister give that advice to the Prime Minister? Senator McKenzie. Uh, well, I'm obviously not in ev privy to every conversation that the Deputy Prime Minister and Prime Minister have, and nor should I be. Uh, so I'll have to take that on notice. Senator Ayres, a final supplementary question. Why does Mr Morrison continue to prioritise protecting his own job over protecting the jobs and lives of ordinary Australians? When will he finally take responsibility and stand up to the extreme elements of his own party room who are spreading dangerous misinformation. Senator McKenzie. Well, I completely reject the premise of Senator Ayres' question. How absolutely ridiculous. The Prime Minister, our government, and I would have hoped the entire parliament here in Canberra's one focus for the last 18 months should be assisting Australians to get through this global pandemic together, making sure we encourage people to get vaccinated, even AstraZeneca. We've got a chief medical officer in Queensland who can't even say the word AstraZeneca, where there is no vaccination shortage if you're going to actually choose to that particular vaccination working with states and territories. We've got millions of Australians right down in lockdown, lockdown, and they're not able to get to work. It is our government that is actually supporting them with individual disaster payments should they lose hours of work. It is our government, in partnership with both Liberal and Labor state governments, supporting those small businesses who are subject uh, to lockdown. So Order, that when Senator McKenzie. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. My question is to the Leader of the Government representing the Prime Minister. The IPCC report released this week was the code red for humanity. We are on track to tip over one and a half degrees of warming this decade unless we drastically change course. The Morrison government has nowhere left to hide, and you've even been singled out by the US government for not lifting your targets. Will you lift Australia's 2030 targets? Or will you keep us in the sole company of petro states Russia and Saudi Arabia? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I thank, uh, thank Senator Waters uh, for her question and the opportunity, indeed, to, uh, to talk about uh, Australia's targets, our commitment as a country to meeting our targets, our delivery as a country and exceeding our targets, and our determination to maintain uh, that sort of track record in relation. To Australia's emissions reduction targets, uh, because as a country uh, we can, should, contrary to what comes from uh, those in that corner or indeed the misinformation from those opposite, we should hold our head high about the fact that as a nation, when we've made commitments to the world about our emissions reduction targets, we've delivered on those commitments and we've exceeded uh, those commitments. Uh, and that's been a constant pattern for Australia uh, in terms of uh, our Paris targets, our commitment is also to be able to meet and to exceed those targets. That's our determination in relation to what we're doing, building off the fact that since 2005 Australia has seen a 20 per cent reduction in our emissions. That's been faster than Canada at 1 per cent, Japan at 10 per cent, New Zealand at 4 per cent, the US at 13 per cent. As I've said before in this chamber, I don't mention that as a criticism of those places but simply to put into perspective what Australia has been able to achieve. It's been done with transformation across Australia in terms of Australian industry transforming, uh, the energy generation mix transforming and, of course, uh, Australian households transforming their behaviour as well. That's seen, for example, in 2020 some seven gigawatts of renewable energy generation capacity installed in Australia in 2020 alone. That's at a rate around eight times faster than New Zealand or Japan or Italy, 
It's around three times faster than in Germany, the US, China or the EU. Uh, and indeed, one in four Australian households now have rooftop solar showing that rate of trans, trans, uh, transition that Australians are helping Order. to make. Senator Birmingham. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Thanks, President. The US Deputy Climate Envoy said overnight that Australians' targets are, quote, not sufficient and that we should be considering at least 50 per cent by 2030. That is an unprecedented public rebuke. You copied the US target in 2015, albeit giving yourself five extra years to meet it. Will you now copy the US and double Australia's 2030 targets? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, we're going to get on with ensuring that we don't just talk about targets, but in exceeding those targets, we do it by investing in the technologies to actually reduce emissions, to achieve the outcomes that reduce emissions. You know, Australia uh, generates around 1 per cent of global emissions. It's important that we do our part. But it's even more important in terms of achieving a reduction in global emissions that we help to achieve the breakthroughs in technology and the transformations that mean we are acting in concert with other nations, like the United States, but also like China or India or other nations who have higher emissions profiles than Australia. Our intention is to make sure that we deliver on the $20 billion of low emissions technologies and commitments we've made for the decade ahead. Uh, that's part of building on our partnerships we've signed with Singapore, Japan, Germany, the UK to deliver the technologies that will help the US, Australia and many other partner Order, nations Senator and others Birmingham. around the world Time for the to reduce our emissions. Expired. Senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Thank you, President. The Deputy Prime Minister yesterday on ABC Radio called on someone to do a plan to reach net zero. Putting aside the fact that uh, he has been in government for seven years, have any departments been instructed by any ministers to do any planning for this crucial life-saving work of a plan to reach net zero? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. The answer to that is absolutely. Absolutely uh, they have. That's precisely what our technology investment roadmap is all about, getting the breakthroughs in technology to enable us to be able to achieve emissions reductions, to enable us to chart that course to net zero, to enable us to do it in ways that maintain Australia's competitiveness, maintain the employment uh, and opportunities for jobs for Australians, maintain position for Australian businesses. That roadmap outlines the work that we are pursuing, our target to achieve clean hydrogen of under $2 per kilogram, our targets to achieve energy storage at under $100 per megawatt hour, our target to achieve carbon capture and storage at under $20 per tonne of CO2, our target to achieve low carbon steel of under $900 per tonne or low carbon aluminium of under $2,700 per tonne, our target to be able to measure and achieve soil carbon improvements at under $3 per hectare. Getting those targets achieved is how you make Order. transformation Senator here Birmingham. and Time abroad. The answer has expired. Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you. Um, well, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. In defending his own disinformation campaign, Senator Canavan has declared today that throughout the pandemic there has not been, and I quote, even a scintilla of parliamentary accountability. Does this minister agree with Canavan when he says that the Morrison-Joyce government has been completely unaccountable through the pandemic? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. No, Senator, I don't agree because you're taking the comments quite significantly out of context. I was sitting in the chamber when Senator Canavan was making those comments. I was sitting in the chamber and I know full well, I know full well that Order. in making those comments, Senator Canavan was challenging public health orders issued by states and territories that are made by regulation, by edict, without reference to their parliaments. Now, it's up for each of those state and territories to defend their positions, and indeed I know many of them have probably in cases, of course, presented in parliamentary committees or other formats. Uh, but in terms of the Morrison government, we've made sure we're here today answering your questions. We've made sure through the establishment of the COVID uh, Select Committee that we have fronted up countless times our officials have fronted up to answer the questions of the opposition, to answer other questions, to submit ourselves to the scrutiny of this parliament and of the processes and procedures, as is only reasonable, Mr President. We front up, 
We handle that scrutiny. We submit ourselves to it. That's exactly what we're doing right now. But contorting or twisting words out of context, put pitching them in terms of pretending somehow that this parliament hasn't had scrutiny, hasn't had opportunity to do so, that's just not true. This parliament has. I don't believe that's what Senator Canavan was suggesting in his remarks. I believe he was making references to other decisions elsewhere. That's for him to defend, for others to engage in. But Senator, I think, but Senator, I think you are misleading in terms of the construct of the question that you have put. We are here, engaged in the scrutiny and accountability. I'm sure you, Senator Sheldon, have pursued the opportunities at estimates and otherwise to hold the government to accountable. And I've got no doubt that all of you, in particular Senator Gallagher as chair of the Select Committee, will continue to do so throughout the course of the pandemic. Senator Sheldon, a supplementary question. Now, Senator Canavan has defended himself, saying spreading disinformation is, and I quote, Order. speaking about a particular viewpoint that is our job. Does Mr Morrison agree? Senator Birmingham. Oh, and, uh, Mr President, I didn't quite catch the quote that was, uh, that was referenced then. Um, I mean, it is the job of members and senators to uh, indeed bring perspectives uh, to this parliament from their communities, on behalf of their communities, and to do that. I urge, the government urges everyone to do that in the most responsible way possible. We don't control the words that come out of the mouths of every member or senator, uh, but I urge them to do so in the most responsible way possible. I urge all of those who engage in public discourse across this country to engage in it in the most responsible way possible. I referenced concern about the vaccine rollout in an earlier response and the fact that we've seen this anti-AstraZeneca um, mythology built up by some, led, sadly, by even some public health officials, such as the incoming governor of Queensland. That's disappointing that we've seen those sorts of mistakes in terms of the language used by others made, and I'd Order. urge them all Senator to make sure they apply the temperate, has thoughtful. Expired. Senator Sheldon, a final supplementary question. One of Mr Morrison's own cabinet ministers told Nikki Sava that Mr Morrison's philosophy is, and I quote, if you see a problem, throw money at it. If you see a problem, walk away from it. If you see a problem, duck sharp to somebody else. Isn't the dangerous disinformation campaign been run from his own party room just another problem Mr Morrison is walking away from? Order. Order. <coughs> Senator Birmingham. Thanks, thanks, Mr President. Well, I, I reject the premise behind that question. I reject the assertion in Ms Sabah's article uh, and, of course, you know, having a question uh, from a member of the opposition about throwing money at a problem is really, of course, quite an astounding proposition, quite an astounding proposition that those opposite uh, would decide to hone in on an anonymous quote and suggest that, uh, that somehow throwing money at a problem is a bad thing. Well, Mr President, those opposite know no other solution to most problems than to throw money at it. Of course, you know, whilst pretending to take a bipartisan approach to issues in the pandemic, they have also been none too shy in terms of saying that the government should not bring JobKeeper to an end, but then criticising the spending on JobKeeper. Uh, they have you know, come out with policies such as last week's thought bubble around the $300 uh, payments to all Australians, including the millions who have already been vaccinated. And of course, we know they want to talk about cabinet process. That one didn't even go through the shadow cabinet process. It was a surprise Order, to Mr. Butler, Senator the Birmingham shadow health minister of all people, didn't question. even know about it. Answer has expired. I will now then move to Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the minister advise the Senate how the Liberal and Nationals government economic plan is supporting workers and businesses to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic and get to the other side? The minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President. I do acknowledge that One Nation did have the call. Um, yes, but they're— Is it on the screen? Uh, my understanding oh, is my Senator apologies. Hanson I had, had the call. Sorry. 
Um, I will go then to them next. I had Senator Roberts on the list provided to me, so I didn't see you, Senator Hanson. I will come to you next. It'll just be a switch. Um, the, yeah, I wasn't advised of the change, and I didn't see you trying to get my attention. My apologies. So if I'll go to this question, then I'll do that question next. That'll just be a, an easy switch. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And, uh, I thank Senator Hughes for the question. And in particular, I acknowledge Senator Hughes' um, work that she's done in relation to ensuring that uh, regional businesses and rural businesses in Australia are supported throughout COVID-19. Uh, Mr. President, as I think we would all acknowledge, small and family business uh, are well and truly the lifeblood of the Australian economy, but in particular uh, our communities, now rural and rental communities. And, and these businesses have been and are the key to Australia's recovery from COVID-19. And without a doubt, those small businesses will be the key to our future economic success. Mr President, when we look at what happened, has happened in the ACT today, small businesses have not had it easy throughout COVID-19. They have faced many challenges with lockdowns and restrictions severely impacting their operations. But Mr President, any of us who have dealt with a small business we know that they have faced up to those challenges and they are doing their best to get through COVID-19. And the Morrison government is backing them every step of the way. In terms of the support that we have been able to provide uh, small businesses, it's around $300 billion in direct health and economic support since the pandemic began has reached our shores to support these businesses, to support the essential workers, but also to keep Australians in jobs throughout the pandemic. This extensive economic support, and this obviously includes JobKeeper, the apprentices' wage subsidy, and that important cash flow boost, giving back to small businesses uh, what they themselves have actually earned. That saw Australia's unemployment rate come down to a record low of 4.9%. Mr President, the Morrison government, we will continue to back small businesses every step of the way because we know they're doing it tough, but we want them to prosper and grow Order, and create Cash. more jobs. Senator Hughes, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, how is the government supporting businesses and protecting jobs through the current lockdowns and restrictions resulting from the pandemic? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, as the outbreaks that we are currently sealing illustrate, uh, Australia and Australians were not out of the woods yet. The Morrison government, we continue to work with the states and the territories to help their businesses and to support their staff that are impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. This week, in partnership with the South Australian government, we have provided a $40 million support package for around 20,000 businesses in South Australia. In July, we reached agreement with the Victorian government, and we are providing around $200 million to help support Victorian small and medium businesses. And in New South Wales, we have an agreement with the New South Wales government, where businesses with a turnover of up to $250 million who have lost 30 per cent or more of turnover or have just seen a decline of 30 per cent or more in turnover, they will be eligible for payments of up to $100,000 per week. Again, we are providing the economic support, working with states Order. and territories, Senator Cash, to Senator help Hughes, these businesses. A final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, whilst uh, those opposite are clearly supporting the airlines by fleeing lockdown as quick as possible and not sharing it with Canberra, how can every single Australian help small and family businesses and their workers to not only get through the current challenges but ensure our economic recovery from COVID-19? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, I think we all acknowledge in this place that everybody's personal circumstances are just that, their own personal circumstances. Uh, and certainly, we also all know that in relation to uh, small businesses, uh, the best thing that we can do at this point in time is to assist them by getting vaccinated. The Prime Minister alongside the states and territories, have worked to develop our fourth place plan to see us through COVID-19 and to get us out the other side. As more and more Australians get vaccinated, and it is pleasing to see that the vaccination rates in Australia uh, they are accelerating. It took us, I think, six days to get from 13 million to 14 million. What we are doing there is we are protecting Australians against 
the virus. Getting vaccinated, as we all know, it protects you, it protects your family, and it protects your community. We want to see small and family businesses in particular prosper and grow, and one of the things we can do collectively Order. is Senator get vaccinated. Time for the Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Senator Hanson, once again, my apologies. We'll come to you now. Problem. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is on behalf of Senator Roberts, and, it, and it's for Senator Colbeck, representing the Minister for Health. Despite having over 63 per cent of Israel's population vaccinated for both Pfizer doses, on Monday, Israel recorded 3,372 new COVID cases up from less than 300 a little over a month ago, an 11-fold surge. The effect of COVID vaccinations may be wearing off, with studies in Israel on the effectiveness of the Pfizer vaccinations showing it is only 39% effective. Pfizer recently admitted that immunity from its two-dose vaccine is waning and will seek FDA authorization for a third booster dose. Randomised control trials show no evidence of the provisionally approved vaccines having any prolonged efficiency. Minister, do you agree or acknowledge these facts? If not, then what Order. is the vaccine Senator efficiency? Hansen. The minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, and thanks, Senator Hanson, Young for the, Hanson for the question. My apologies. Um, Mr. President, the, the concept of requirement of booster vaccines has, is something that the government has had as a part of its strategy for a considerable period of time. As you would be aware, uh, the Moderna vaccines that, are current, that have recently been uh, approved, uh, a proportion of those are under consideration for utilisation as booster doses. Uh, the fact that this is a new virus, the vaccines for the virus are new. Uh, the concept of the, 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 the life of the vaccine and the period that antibodies were retained in the, in the human body was always a question. So, Mr. President, the, the concept of a booster vaccine uh, has always been something that we've been considering. Uh, and we have plentiful supplies in our vaccine supply strategy for that. Uh, as we see the evidence that comes from these other jurisdictions, that have higher vaccination rates and have vaccinated before us, we will clearly consider that information. And we will incorporate the learnings from that into our mechanisms for the completion of the, or the continuation of the vaccination rollout, whether that be the Moderna dose or whether that be a variant of the vaccines that are being proposed, considered and developed by a number of other vaccine manufacturers, Mr. President. So the concept of requiring a booster vaccine uh, is not a new one. It's something the government has always been considering. It, it sits already as a part of our considerations. Uh, and of course, Mr. President, once we get to the stage of, of understanding that better through the evidence that we are receiving from other jurisdictions around the world, uh, the requirements for that the operation for that. Order, Senator be Colbeck. Time for the answer has justice. expired. Senator Hanson, a supplementary question. Minister, in light of what you, your comments there and saying it's new, and, and I acknowledge that, the fact is that we don't know how often the vaccine is going to have to be administered. Can you give it, uh, the people any indication of how often that vaccine will have to be administered and at whose cost? So every time it is administered, is that a cost to the taxpayers? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, at this point in time, the government is running a national vaccination program that provides access to a vaccine to every Australian who wants one. That is the program that we're running. Uh, and, it, and it may very well be that the vaccination program needs to continue for a period of time until we get to the stage where um, we've, at a global level, dealt with this virus. Um, there are some questions that we don't know the answer to. If you'd spoken to anyone six months ago, the concept of the Delta virus and the impact that it's currently having across the world, uh, as you've quite rightly stated in your question, uh, was clearly not understood. The virus continues to mutate. We're not going to understand uh, in advance of 
its, its mutations, what those mutations might be, and we have to be prepared to move quickly to adapt to those things uh, as it continues to evolve, Mr. President. So the vaccination program uh, will go for a considerable period of time, and the taxpayer, Order, the Senator government, Tolbeck. Uh, Senator to Hanson, a final supplementary question. Well, thank you very much. By the if we're dealing with the uh, Delta strain now, um, what is the government's plan of moving forward if this Delta strain changes into another strain? So how, what is your plan in actually moving forward with that? And can you assure the people that the vaccinations that have been given now, which indicates in Israel they haven't got the same immunity rate, what is your plan to move forward and to deal with the next strain that comes through? Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator Hanson, for her question. Uh, we will continue to follow the latest science in the development of vaccines globally uh, to ensure that we can offer to Australians safe and efficacious vaccines. Uh, that's what we've done with the, with the programs that we have underway right now. And we can, as you've heard many times in this chamber, we continue to expand uh, both the volume of each vaccine that we have and the availability of different types of vaccines, Mr. President. And I'm sure that the medical fraternity will continue to do as they've done over the last 18 months, which is continue to research the new variants of the virus as they evolve and as they emerge. And they will continue to adapt the vaccines to deal with those. We are very fortunate in this country right now, Mr. President, we have uh, access to very good vaccines that are safe and provide protection against death, hospitalisation and serious illness. Senator Faruqi, remotely. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Cash. As of yesterday, Fortress Australia has further tightened its borders. Under the strict new rules, even Australian citizens and permanent residents who ordinarily live in another country will need to seek exemptions to leave Australia if they come back temporarily and could very well be denied the exemption. The changes have been made without warning and have caused anxiety and fear. As it is, 38,000 Australians are still stranded overseas with many desperate to return home. Minister, why are you inflicting unnecessary pain and further anguish on people who are already separated from their loved ones and some with seriously sick family members and who will now be further restricted from coming here because they may not be able to return to the countries that they live in? The Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And uh, Senator Faruqi, uh, you and I are going to have to differ in relation to uh, the government's response or your opinion of the government's response to keeping Australians safe. Australia's strong border control system has undoubtedly, Mr President, been a major factor in our success in managing as a country COVID-19, in particular when you look at the global situation. The Morrison government acted swiftly at the commencement of COVID-19 to ensure that Australians remain safe. Mr President, in relation to the border and travel exemption regime, of course, I think it's without a doubt, the closed border and travel exemption regime are underpinned by a system of quarantine designed to ensure that people returning do not present a threat to the community. In relation to the changes uh, to the outbound travel arrangements that Senator Faruqi refers to, as a government, we have sought unap unapologetically to take measures that combat the virus whilst also respecting the rights and freedoms of people. The government's pandemic response is consistent with legal and with health advice and is targeted at most effectively protecting Australians from COVID-19. We work closely, Mr President, as you know, with the states and the territories through National Cabinet to ensure that our COVID-19 response is both measured and appropriate. And in fact, Senator Faruqi, I note that the federal court has consistently found in favour of the government in previous challenges to Australia's border restrictions. Mr President, in relation to the changes that Senator Faruqi refers to— Order. This... Senator Cash. Senator Faruqi, a supplementary question. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, we are a nation with close to 30% of the population born overseas and a further 20% who have at least one parent born overseas. Do you accept that these unnecessary and harsh restrictions are hurting tens of thousands and will disproportionately impact people from multicultural backgrounds? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, what I would say to Senator Faruqi is this. COVID-19, Senator Faruqi, affects everybody. I mean, you've seen in the ACT today a seven-day lockdown. It is affecting people in the ACT. It will affect people more broadly. But when it comes to decisions in relation to Australia's borders, it is a fact, Senator Faruqi, that our strong border control system has undoubtedly, undoubtedly been a major factor in our success in managing COVID-19. In terms of the changes that you have referred to, as you would be aware, it does not stop Australians who normally reside overseas from leaving Australia. All we have done is remove the automatic exemption. Australians who genuinely reside overseas and are seeking to return to their country of residence, they are still able to do so. But we can't make apologies Order, for our Cash. strong Senator border Faruqi, control system. Senator a final system. supplementary question. Minister, your government has put in another barrier for people living overseas to come back here because they fear that they won't be able to go back to their place of residence. All this while the rich and the famous, the well-connected and far-right trolls are allowed to swan in and out of Australia. Minister, do you think it's fair that the rich and famous are allowed in while ordinary people are left to suffer in silence? Senator Cash. Well, again, Senator Faruqi, I don't agree with the assertions that you have put in place. Anyone who seeks to come into Australia or, at this point in time, exit Australia, uh, they are decisions that are made by the appropriate authorities in Australia. Mr President, again, Australia has put in place strong border control systems and they have undoubtedly, undoubtedly been a major factor in our success in managing COVID-19. Our role as a government is to keep Australia and Australians safe. That does not mean that every measure is going to be supported by, as you can see here, the Australian Greens. But our role as a government is to keep Australians safe. And in terms of the measures that we have put in place in relation to our strong control, our strong border control system, they have undoubtedly been a major factor in keeping Australians safe. Order. Senator Farrell. Mr President, my question is to the Minister for Emergency Management and National Recovery and Resilience, uh, Senator McKenzie. And I refer to the Minister's statements last week in relation to her role in the Community Sports Infrastructure Grants Program. As the former Minister for Sport, did the Minister provide the Health Department with permission to access documents created in her office in relation to the Community Sports Infrastructure Grants Program for the purpose of those documents being provided to the Secretary of the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet, Mr Philip Gaitchens. The Minister for Re uh, Emergency Management, National Recovery and Resilience. Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Well, Mr President, uh, there has been copious public commentary around sports grants. I have given a 6,000-word uh, submission to the inquiry from this place. I've uh, attended a Senate inquiry. I will let my comments on the public record, which are order. Uh, Senator McKenzie, very exhaustive, I have Senator uh, Farrell stand. on a point of order. Senator Farrell on a point of order. Well, I was seeking the call while the minister was um, still speaking, um, but it was a very specific question um, which could have easily had a yes or no answer. I can't instruct the minister how to answer a question. If the minister is referring to a minister's previous comments, that can be directly relevant. Um, I'm not in a position to judge it otherwise. There is an opportunity, as always, to debate questions after question time, but I can't instruct the minister the terms in which to answer a question. Senator McKenzie, have you concluded? Yes. You have. Senator Farrell, a supplementary question. Yeah, I, I do have a further question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, based on his analysis of the grants awarded, 
and the list of marginal and targeted seats included in those documents, Mr Gaitens claims that grants were awarded at a similar rate across other electorates. Uh, the minister herself has uh, repeated those claims. Does she still stand by those claims? Senator Mackenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator, for your question. Uh, I stand by all my public commentary uh, around the sports grants, and I refer you to my previous statements. Senator Farrell, a final supplementary question. Look, I do have one. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, well, if that's the case, uh, will she now give permission to the Health Department to provide those documents that I've been referring to to the Senate? And if not, why not? Senator Mackenzie. Uh, Mr President, I have nothing more to add uh, other than my very copious uh, public statements on this matter. Senator Davey. Thank you, uh, Mr President. My question is also to the, um, Senator Mackenzie, the minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister. Um, can the minister please update the Senate on how regional Australians are doing their bit as part of the Australian response to the health and economic challenges through the COVID-19 pandemic. Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Mackenzie. Thank you very much, Mr President. I'd like to thank, thank Senator Davey for her question and her long-standing support for rural and regional New South Wales. We are standing with your communities, especially those in regional New South Wales uh, who have currently been put into lockdown. COVID-19 has been an unprecedented uh, impact not only here in Australia, but right across the world. More than four million lives have been lost globally, and we're facing the largest global economic shock since the Great Depression. Early and decisive action by our government, in conjunction with state governments, saved 30,000 lives and millions of jobs. We closed our borders, the Prime Minister established the National Cabinet, and we invested over $291 billion in direct assistance to individuals and businesses to reduce the impact. We know these measures have had a significant impact on all Australians, both mentally, socially and financially, and no one knows that better than those that live in rural and regional areas. The ongoing impact of COVID-19 and the stop-start, sporadic nature of lockdowns, especially in regional New South Wales, with Hunter, Valley, Tamworth and Armidale just recently being declared Commonwealth uh, hotspots, uh, does take its toll. However, this frustration pales to the difficulties we'd face if we didn't do everything we could, could to stop the spread. Regional Australians are doing the right thing, lining up in droves, pulling up their sleeves, getting vaccinated, with over 3.7 million Australians in rural and regional Australia uh, being, getting their jabs. That's increasing day on day, each and every day. Our First Nations people are also rolling up their sleeves. And as of this morning, more than 160,000 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians, nearly 30 per cent, have received at least one dose. Community pharmacies right across the country have kept their doors open and are now playing their role in regional communities rolling out the vaccine. Our government has allocated nearly $48 Order, million. Senator dollars. McKenzie. Senator Davey, a supplementary question. Thank you. Uh, Minister, how is the Liberal and Nationals government supporting rural and regional communities as we chart our way back from COVID? Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr. President. Our government has provided a raft of support to regional communities through the COVID-19 pandemic. That's why we're delivering highly targeted financial assistance through the COVID disaster payment to workers who live or work in a Commonwealth declared hotspot. It's specifically tailored to workers impacted by those lockdowns. And Services Australia has already processed more than 1.8 million COVID disaster payment claims, paying out more than $2 billion to workers to date. And we will not stop standing with individuals as they feel in a very uh, individual way the impact of those lockdowns and when they're doing the right thing and staying home and stopping the spread. In addition to this, the pandemic leave disaster payment supports those who would have who've been directed by a state official to isolate for more than 14 days. We've also ensured that staff at Meatworks have been identified as a high priority job role in the first two phases of the vaccine rollout so that we can actually support uh, our agricultural Order, industries. Order Senator McKenzie, Senator Davey a final supplementary question. Thank you. Minister, why is regional Australia so critical to the success of our economic recovery post-COVID? Senator Mackenzie. 
Regional Australia is critical to driving our economy post-COVID. We know that agriculture and mining are key industries that stabilise our economic growth. We know that uh, by supporting the agricultural industry, we're not, uh, we've supported international freight tasks as supply chains have been challenged by COVID-19, and additionally when our own domestic supply to supermarkets, particularly last year, was challenged. It was by setting up uh, transport, uh, transport arrangements, making sure that we could get food from farm to distribution centre uh, to supermarkets so that Australia's who were in lockdown could still access high-quality food. We've negotiated an agricultural visa, uh, which we look to addressing some of those workforce shortages that are as a result of our international uh, border closures. Every single step of the way, our government is supporting Australians in rural and regional Australia uh, to get through this pandemic and to come outside stronger. Senator McAllister, remotely. Thanks very much, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. It's reported the Morrison Joyce government's COVID-19 information on the Health Department website, which comes in more than 60 languages, has not been updated for almost eight weeks. Does the Minister agree with the Health Department that failing to update information eight weeks out of date is, and I quote, a short delay? When will this be fixed? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thanks, Senator McAllister, for the question. Uh, can I say, Mr. President, I do agree with Senator McAllister that ensuring that Australians have access to updated information with respect to vaccines and the elements of how they might protect themselves from the COVID-19 pandemic through utilisation of a vaccine is extremely important. I would agree with her that it's a very important thing to do. Uh, Mr. President, that information has in fact been updated. Uh, but I, can I say it should have been updated sooner. It should not have taken eight weeks. I, uh, and and uh, Mr. President, uh, the Department of Health understand the perspective of the ministers uh, in the portfolio with respect to that information, Mr. President. Mr. President, we don't only rely on the Department of Health website for the engagement with cold communities. Uh, this is a very, very important part of ensuring people understand uh, what's available to them with respect of um, getting a vaccine, Mr. President. So in, in, the, in that context, uh, the Arm Yourself TV commercial has been translated uh, into a number of languages um, and has been running since the 1st of August. Uh, there are 20 languages covered in videos of multicultural health professional, religious and community leaders from Sydney on the importance of staying home, getting tested and getting vaccinated, specifically for the Greater Sydney region. Uh, Mr President, uh, there is a, an established called communication working group uh, that was set up at the start of the, the pandemic. It's chaired by the Deputy Chief Medical Officer, Professor Michael Kidd, and meets regularly with uh, providing advice both to the Department of Health and back out to communities, Mr. President. So communication is extremely important, uh, and this information should have been updated sooner. Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. The Arabic translation on the Morrison Joyce government's Department of Health website doesn't even mention that adults in Greater Sydney should strongly consider getting any vaccine. Why? Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, th thank you, Mr. President. Thank you to Senator McAllister for the question. Um, Mr. President, as I've indicated, the materials on the website have been updated. Um, is, that is the advice that I've been provided. Mr. President, uh, the objective of this government is to ensure and to encourage every Australian who is currently eligible and who becomes eligible to receive a vaccine, to have access to the most up-to-date information and to encourage all Australians to get a vaccine. The thing that we do know about the vaccines that we have available in our uh, vaccine strategy at this point in time is that they are safe and they are highly efficacious. They will protect you against death, hospitalisation and serious illness. So we're encouraging everyone to get 
a vaccine uh, as soon as they possibly can, Mr President, and that will remain a focus of our campaigns. Senator McAllister, a final supplementary question. Thanks. Uh, Dr Ken McCrory, a GP in the southwestern Sydney suburb of Campbelltown, said there was a clear link between low vaccination rates and poor public health messaging. He said this, we are at a serious state of despair with the website being way out of date. Will the Morrison Joyce government take responsibility for its failure to order vaccines, its failure to distribute vaccines and its failure to give timely and accurate advice to the millions of Australians languishing in lockdown? Senator Colbeck. Uh, Mr President, the government has clearly stated on many occasions that it is responsible for the supply and delivery of vaccines to Australians so that they can access um, a vaccine in a timely way. Mr President, as I've indicated uh, to the Chamber already, the information on that Department of Health website should have been updated in a more timely way. It has been updated now, uh, Mr President, and we will continue to, do, uh, to work with uh, communities across this country through various mechanisms to ensure that Australians have access to high quality information uh, in a way that they can uh, readily receive it so that we can continue to encourage them to access the vaccines because we know the vaccine program is going to be one of the most important ways we work with Australians to come through this COVID-19 pandemic. Senator Birmingham. President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. I have received a message from the House of Representatives returning the Family Assistance Legislation Amendment Child Care Subsidy Bill 2021 and informing the Senate that the House has made the amendment to the bill that the Senate requested. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. I move that this bill be now read a third time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. Amend the law relating to family assistance and for related purposes. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. And I rise to take note of the answers given by Senators Birmingham and Mackenzie to the questions asked today by Senator Ayres and myself. I, I want to commence my remarks by um, acknowledging the ripple of fear and shock and distress that's rippling through this place here today as the ACT goes into lockdown. It's been uh, miraculously avoided here, and now the anxiety that has gripped the Victorians for so many months and is now in its eighth week uh, in New South Wales coming on, we know how difficult this is, but we hear the problems of Australians being cast aside in the responses that we received from Minister Birmingham today. He will drop his voice and be very serious and sensible in his, his elocution of the government's continuing failing response. The Morrison-Joyce government has let this virus get away from us, and it is now running rampant right across the country and out into my great state of New South Wales and into very, very vulnerable communities. It's no wonder that the disapproval rating for the rollout is nearly at 60 per cent. Malcolm Turnbull, actually telling the truth, said, I can't think of a bigger black and white failure of public administration than this, and that is about his own colleagues with whom he shared a party room. The Liberal National Party, in government for eight years, supposedly great managers of the economy, People trusted them to do the right thing, and here we are at this juncture in this country where the place is literally ravaged with COVID-19 spreading at an extraordinary rate across the entire country. The virus has spread, certainly to Dubbo, to Walgett. That's nearly eight hours away from Sydney, and I know it's not as far as some of the distances that are driven in Queensland and the Northern Territory, but it's still a pretty big state. Walgett, Bathurst, Dubbo, the Shires of Bogan, Burke, Brewarrina, Coonamble, Gilgandra, Narromine and Warren, all now in lockdown. And do not forget that this experience of lockdown, this inaccessibility of vaccine, was brought to you by the stars of the show, Mr Morrison and Mr Joyce. They're the two leaders 
who are responsible for the decision-making that has led us to this day. 345 people in New South Wales were found to have, uh, have acquired COVID in the last 24 hours. We know just in the last two months since this most recent outbreak, there have been 36 deaths and 93 deaths from the current uh, outbreak. We know that this is a huge toll on families, on businesses, on communities. And part of the reason we're in this situation is because the golden girl, the Premier Berejiklian, was encouraged to hold out against going into lockdown. We've got Indigenous communities right across this state, including those in Dubbo, who are in a great deal of worry about being able to access, their, access services and get the vaccinations that they so desperately need. I was in uh, the seat of Dubbo, uh, in Dubbo in the seat of Parks uh, earlier this year and I met with the Aboriginal Medical Service. They're funded, they're funded for four full-time GPs. They've only got one. They can't roll out to the Aboriginal community. I met with the group in Daniloquin, the Daniloquin Health Action Group, Marion McGee, who's been there for 32 years as a general specialist. What are their concerns? Health professional staffing, the ability to provide medical services to children, access to medical services. That is the disaster, the context into which this failed government is actually embedding further and further problems. And those opposite might smile and think that this is some sort of a joke, but it isn't. My colleague on the Central Coast, the great Labor member Emma McBride, and I have been fighting, fighting to get a vaccination hub for the 350,000 people on the Central Coast. That's bigger than the population of the Northern Territory. What did the Liberal member Newsy Week say? We don't need it. The GPs are enough. Not good enough. This is what's happening on the Central Coast and the ignoring of 350,000 people in one area, the failed delivery of leadership by this Liberal National Party, is a warning to the people of Dubbo. I want to encourage the uh, great work of Councillor Stephen Lawrence, the Mayor of Dubbo, for his great leadership and his contribution to public debate this morning. And I urge all Australians to stay safe, because if you don't look after yourself, this government is Thank not you, looking Senator after you. Thank you, Your time has expired. Um, Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam uh, Deputy President. Well, I said yesterday it was like Groundhog Day, and here we go again. I mean, we know where this vaccine hesitancy is coming from, and it's certainly got nothing to do with supply. We know that there is more supply throughout Australia for any Australian that wants it. We know that day after day, including yesterday, the day before and the day before that, we saw record days of vaccinations occurring. Over a quarter of a million Australians are being vaccinated every single day. There is no supply issue. But what we do know is when you look across some of the states is there's vaccine hesitancy, there's brand shopping. And why would that be, considering the Otago advice is now that all of the vaccines, whatever vaccine you can access, are equally effective, are equally safe, and are equally hundreds of thousands of times more, less likely to injure and kill you than COVID. But those opposite persist and continue to persist with this absolutely you know, hyperbole around supply. But really what they're talking about is, we don't want to talk about AstraZeneca. We don't want to support Australian jobs. We don't want to support Australian manufacturing. We want to continue a fear and a smear campaign around vaccine brands. I mean, it is just ludicrous. The opposition leader, or the current opposition leader, can barely bring himself to even say the name. And the fact that he then raced out as quickly as possible to find a candidate for the seat of Higgins who has been active and out there suggesting people not get the AstraZeneca. This is against all health advice. Thank goodness we have sensible commentators like Dr Nick Coatesworth who are encouraging Australians to get vaccinated, who know that the best vaccine for you is the one that is, in, that is available. We are seeing Australians out in record numbers getting their vaccination and ensuring that Australia can open up as soon as is possible, but also keeping Australians safe. As we enter into lockdown here in Canberra, as those, and I would like to acknowledge my colleagues who have all stayed put today, that understand that they need to be here to support 
the Canberrans as they go through this, but also to ensure that Parliament is able to continue to conduct itself as best as possible. But as we stay here in Canberra and enter this lockdown, we know that Canberra and the ACT has done extremely well when it comes to it vaccination rate. In fact, it is getting very close to 30 per cent at full vaccination. It is over 50 per cent of one dose. But what is even more impressive is when you look at the vaccination rates going into those vulnerable cohorts. We are looking at numbers in the 80 and 90 per cent range. So I think there can be some confidence when we look at the ACT with a seven-day sharp lockdown that because of the compliance that we're likely to see, because of the way that people will conduct themselves over the next seven days, the fact that the contact tracers are already working hard with the gentleman that's been affected and ensuring that those close contacts are identified as soon as possible. But the fact that there are significantly high vaccination rates within the ACT, the chance of people contracting the virus, the, people, the chance of people infecting others with the virus, and the fact that people are less likely to get majorly ill or find themselves in hospital or worse still on a ventilator or die via the, via the uh, virus is significantly reduced because of these levels of vaccines and the vaccination rate that we need to keep encouraging. And we need to keep encouraging people to get out there. I am intrigued as to whether or not we'll start to see another fear campaign, because we know you guys just can't stay away from them, and whether or not we're going to start to see a move away from the Pfizer, and now you're going to be out there starting to encourage people that they should just really be looking at the, the Moderna. I mean, this spoilt for choice. You guys aren't going to know which way to go, how to scare Australians. I mean, disgracefully today, on Capitol Hill on ABC when I was there with Senator McAllister, yet again, today, at, after half past one this afternoon, there Senator McAllister was spreading more information about a lack of supply. It is absolutely shameful behaviour. It is time that it stopped. It is time that you started to get behind Australians, the Australian economy, and ensure that we can open up as soon as possible, and that is through vaccinations. And it's not through brand shopping. It's not through creating vaccine hesitancy. It's through real information, factual information, not scare campaigns, and not actually out there confusing Australians that are trying to do the right thing. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Senator McAllister. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. Well, a Kinsley gaff is when a political figure accidentally tells the truth, some obvious truth that isn't supposed to be voiced. And this morning, we saw just such an example because the Deputy Prime Minister really belled the cat, didn't he? When pressed on why he wouldn't be reining in Mr Christensen about his, call it, his comments, Mr Joyce said this. I can assure you that when you've got a thin margin, don't start giving reasons for a by-election. It was a moment when the Deputy Prime Minister accidentally told the truth that he and the Prime Minister were always keeping an eye on their political interests, even when it involved a member of the government spreading dangerous disinformation about vaccines and about lockdowns. The two public health tools that we have to fight the Delta variant. And just to really prove that Mr Joyce meant what he said, the government then that tried to use its numbers in the Senate today to protect Mr Christensen and Senator Canavan, Senator Rennick from being called out for their comments. Well, today, while the government was busy trying to protect its political interests, the ACT joined New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland in lockdowns. More than half of Australia's population is now under some form of COVID restrictions. Now, while the risk of a by-election might be front of mind for Mr Joyce, I doubt that it is a concern for the millions of Australians who would just rather that the Morrison government concentrate on doing its job. These are Australians who will lose their chance to say goodbye to a loved one. These are Australians whose children will be learning from home without contact with anyone their own age for months. These are Australians who will struggle financially because of the economic consequences of the Delta wave that this Prime Minister has overseen. 
Now, we would not be in this position if the Prime Minister had just done his job. In Newcastle, in my home state of New South Wales, there is an outbreak in an aged care facility and only a third of the staff have received even one dose of the vaccine. These workers were meant to be fully vaccinated by Easter under the Prime Minister's plan. New South Wales towns like Walgett, Burke and Brewarrina have been put into lockdown and these towns have large First Nations populations. But despite the Prime Minister promising that First Nations Australians would be a priority in the vaccine rollout, only 10 per cent have been vaccinated. The Northern Rivers, where I grew up, Lismore, Bangalore, Bar and Casino, locked down. We have been left dangerously exposed by this government's failure to effectively roll out sufficient volumes of the vaccine and to take responsibility for establishing an effective national quarantine system. And Senator Hughes's disgraceful and dishonest contribution just now unhappily is typical of the government's response. It's always someone else's fault. It's the opposition's fault, it's the community's fault, it's the workers' fault, it's the Italians' fault sometimes, it's Atagi's fault, it's the Premier's fault. Perhaps today it's my fault if you listen to Senator Hughes. But the truth is, this is the responsibility of this government. They are responsibility. They are responsible for the vaccine rollout and they are responsible for hotel quarantine and for a national quarantine system. This government struggles to get the basics right. Official public health information for core communities, two months out of date. This outbreak is affecting communities in southwestern Sydney, migrant communities who may not be confident reading official documentation in English. Despite this, the Arabic translation of the Department of Health's vaccination information doesn't mention that all adults in Greater Sydney should get any vaccine that they can access. Australians are scared. They are scared for their livelihoods, they are worried about their family's health. They are wondering when they'll be able to leave the restrictions and the lockdowns behind them. Don't worry. Mr Joyce and Mr Morrison got it in hand. And as they made clear this morning, their number one priority is doing whatever it takes to make sure there isn't a by-election. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Uh, Senator Askew. Thank you, Madam De Deputy President. Well, as we come to the end of two weeks in this place, while so much of our country is in lockdown, including here in the ACT from later today, those on the other side continue to repeat the same questions every day and the same attacks. Senator Hughes' description of Groundhog Day couldn't be more appropriate. While they continue to spread lies and mistruths, our government is focused on getting on with the job of keeping Australians safe. While the opposition continues to undermine the rollout, we are getting on with that job and delivering record amounts of over 250,000 shots a day. In the last seven days, over 1.4 million doses have been delivered and over 14.2 million doses have been delivered to date. In fact, since we arrived here in Canberra for this sitting period last week, over 190,000 doses have been delivered. We are getting on with the job. No one is saying that there haven't been problems along the way and it has now been turned around and we are now back on track. Our numbers are comparable with the world's best rates of vaccination. With one million Pfizer doses arriving weekly, a plentiful supply of AstraZeneca and now Moderna approved for use in Australia, it will be great to see the weekly doses increasing over coming weeks. 25 million doses of Moderna have been secured, with the first million doses arriving next month. It is a safe, practical vaccine. Madam Deputy President, I would like to acknowledge the hard-working frontline staff who are administering these vaccines. My sister is one of those. They are all working long hours and often under extreme pressure. They, along with all the other health professionals who have been at the forefront of the COVID outbreaks across the country, deserve our thanks. Their commitment to saving Australian lives, putting others before themselves in what is often a thankful task. It's incredible. The ramped up rollout, though, is just the start. 
Not only will the vaccination of Australians help save lives, it will also help us to relax restrictions as we progress through the four stages of the national plan. The current phase obviously is accelerating the vaccination rates and keeping short, sharp lockdowns if possible. The transition phase, when we get to 70 per cent, will see low-level low restrictions and hopefully less lo lockdowns. And by the time we get to con the consolidation phase, with 80, 80 per cent of adults fully vaccinated, we will only hopefully have targeted lockdowns. That's the plan. As we lead into the final phase, where we can open international borders with no lockdowns and boosters regularly pr being provided if needed. As evidenced by the Doherty modelling, now that we've protected our more vulnerable elderly Australians, it's now possible to shift our focus to younger Australians, and they, are now, they now have access to, to more options in regard to vaccinations. And it is wonderful to see the young Australians turning up across the country to get vaccinated. Tasmania, my home state, is leading the way in vaccinations. We reached the milestone of 50 per cent vaccinations last week, and as part of Premier Gutwin's four-point Delta Shield plan announced yesterday, they will be boosting vaccination rates over the next weeks to achieve 60 per cent by September. That plan also includes increased fines, tighter border controls, strengthened testing, tracking and tracing, and a support package for businesses impacted by interstate lockdowns. They too are getting on with the job. Madam Deputy President, I'd like to turn my attention now to earlier this year when, here in this place, we debated legislation in relation to the freedom of speech, particularly in the context of academic freedom of speech. And I would defend every single person's right to the freedom of speech, particularly those of us elected to parliament to represent all Australians. Universities must be, place, must be places that protect free speech, even when it is being said things said may be unpopular or challenging. The idea of academic freedom is vital to the continued development of our educations. Our universities are critical institutions where ideas are developed, debated and challenged, as is our parliament. As we debated here earlier today, there are vastly differing, differing views about coronavirus, the development of COVID-19 vaccines and the resulting impacts of the virus on border closures, restrictions around events and even how to wash our hands properly. Of course, some of the public debate around COVID we would agree with, and as discussed earlier today, we wouldn't. But that is the very nature of free speech. We are all entitled to our opinion, but there is a line when it puts at risk public safety. Madam Deputy President, I defend everyone's individual right to decide if they will be vaccinated or not. However, one, anyone who chooses not to should also respect the right of those who do and not vilify or harass those that do. I am fully vaccinated, Madam Deputy President, and coming to that decision, I considered all the commentary in the public arena. However, the overriding decision came down to wanting to protect my family, my community and myself from an insidious, life-threatening oh, illness. Order, Senator Askew. Uh, Senator Sheldon. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr President. Thank you. Well, you rise to take note of Senator Birmingham and Senator McKenzie's answers to questions. Now, Senator Birmingham spent all his time covering the backs of members of his government when they espouse dodgy health advice. Maybe Senator Birmingham in his answers to those questions should start covering the backs of our mums and dads, our grandparents and children, and holding dodgy government members to account that are giving dodgy health advice. Their failure by this government on a series of uh, levels has been particularly uh, gross. We've seen the grossness of it because of the lack of proper action when it comes to vaccine rollout. Now, I just sort of note in the answers that were given by and comments from others taking note from the government that not one of the senators on the government side defended the government's silence on their own dodgy government members giving dangerous advice. And the question of freedom of speech is always a critical one. But you need to call out when it's dangerous advice, when it's putting our community at risk, our families and our public and the public. Well, quite clearly, we've seen a failure on a number of levels from this government. Failure to hold dodgy members to account, failure to supply to meet supply necessity, failure to vaccinate, and of course failure to quarantine. The failure on the vaccine front 
is an important area. Many people, not because um, uh, they should, I, I have certainly my strong views, I've received AstraZeneca, um, and I suggest that many others should be doing the exact same thing. But clearly amongst the public, because of the government's misinformation, lack of appropriate approach to this health issue, that there is great disquiet right across our community. And of course, Senator Canavan also said that you know, people are just speaking about a particular viewpoint. You know, that's our job. Well, yeah, that, that could, might be your job, Senator Canavan, but the job of, of government members who know the right health advice is to actually espouse it and hold you to account. Now, one of Mr uh, Morrison's own cabinet ministers, Nikki Sava, um, talked about Mr Morrison's philosophy. If you see a problem, throw money at it. If you see a problem, walk away from it. If you see a problem, duck shoves to somebody else. Well, that, this dangerous disinformation being run by government's own party room is just another problem that Mr Morrison is walking away from. And Mr Christensen said, when will the madness end? How many more freedoms will we lose due to a fear of virus which has a survivability rate of 997 out of 1,000? It's time we stop spreading fear and acknowledge some facts. Masks don't work, fact. Lockdowns don't work, fact, so Mr Christensen says. I mean, quite clearly, the government is at complete disarray about how they deal with this. Because we've seen, particularly in the situation with Mr Christensen, that the Deputy Prime Minister, Mr Joyce, made it clear that he was not going to hold the government to account. He was not going to hold those in the government to account that were giving dodgy health advice. And why? Because of crass political opportunism. Because of the fact that turning them and holding them to account means that they might blow back. Well, guess what? They're blowing back on the Australian community's health. They're blowing back on the outcomes that we need to make sure that we have a successful economy reopened and the lockdowns can cease. And it goes to the very important question where, you know, uh, regional doctor, Dr. Clyde Ronan said at Yoronga uh, Medical Clinic, um, and he said, more and more patients with no shows of vaccination bookings due to false ideas circulating in the community. He went to say, everybody seems to be an expert at the moment. We're being saturated with information and not all the information is useful. Otherwise, you get people speaking outside of their expertise. You get people with no expertise at all and they're all got an, op got an opinion. Well, quite clearly, vaccination hesitancy in this country is the squarely at the feet of the misinformation and disinformation from the government's own members. It's incredibly important they get their acts together and the government holds them to account. The question is the motion moved by Senator O'Neill be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Waters. Thank you, President. I move to take note of the question by me to uh, Senator Birmingham, but I note that Senator Rice would like to be making the take note contribution, who's uh, dialling in remotely. Senator Rice. Thanks, Mr. President. We are in a climate emergency. The UN Secretary General said this week that it is code red, completely consistent with Greta Thunberg's words that we should be acting as if our house was on fire, because it is. But what response did we get from Senator Birmingham this afternoon? From our government? Basically, it's don't worry, it's just a little fire in the kitchen. You know, we'll, don't worry, we'll get onto it at some stage. Eventually, we'll get the fire extinguisher out, we'll, or perhaps some other technology. I mean, we're meeting our Paris target, said Senator Birmingham. And in fact, whereas in fact our pollution from burning fossil fuels has in fact increased by 6% between 2005 and 2019. And even if we do meet our Paris targets, it's like saying we put the high jump bar just a couple of centimetres above the ground five years ago, and now we're celebrating that, oh, look, we got over it. I mean, basically, our target translates into almost three degrees of global warming, if that was what the rest of the world was agreeing to as well, and which would make the extreme weather that we have been seeing in recent times just the beginning. 
Meeting our Paris targets, even if we do make that, is not where the global focus is now. This is an emergency and other countries are recognising it. The US has recognised it. They have now got a commitment to slash their carbon pollution by 50 per cent by 2030. The EU recognises it. They are going to be slashing their pollution by 50 per cent by 2030. The UK by over 60 per cent by 2030. We, as Australia, we need to triple our ambition to be consistent with the science, with what the IPCC has laid out so starkly for us this week. We need to be slashing our pollution. We need to have reductions of 75 per cent by 2030 if we are going to be doing our part to be keeping global heating below one and a half degrees uh, above pre-industrial levels. I mean, the Morrison government's refusal to act on climate leaves Australia isolated on the world stage. It's us, it's Saudi Arabia and it's Russia. And no one is being fooled, least of all our allies. I mean, the US just this week has publicly rebuked Australia's climate policy. It was an unprecedented public rebuke. I mean, think how strong the private critiques must be if this is what they are willing to say publicly. I mean, one of their key negotiators, Dr Pershing, said the commitments they made in Paris are not sufficient. So for all that Senator Birmingham can blather on about technology, the fact is we are burning coal and gas and oil at unprecedented rates. And the rest of the world, our allies, are not impressed. But no, we have got a government that is basically hell-bent at looking after their billionaire mates and their fossil fuel donors, setting fire to our future rather than facing the facts. You only have to look at the subsidies going out the door for the mining and burning of fossil fuels. Over $10 billion a year, including committing to be spending $600 million for the Curry Curry gas plant, over $200 million to be supporting and subsidising the fracking of the Beetaloo Basin, releasing an absolute climate bomb on the world. This government is failing in their most basic duty to be keeping us safe. They are burning our children's futures. So we have to take serious action. The IPCC report laid it out very starkly. The alarm bells are ringing. The UN Secretary General said that gas, greenhouse gas emissions from fossil fuel burning and deforestation are choking our planet and putting billions of people at immediate risk. Billions of people at immediate risk. The temperatures are rising, the ice is melting, the oceans are rising, the reef is dying, the forests are burning. It was 48.8 degrees in Sicily yesterday. The fires around the world, in Greece, in Russia, in the US, in Canada, on the back of our Black Summer fires, show this is the emergency that we are in. But, so look, we've got to take action. There is hope. We can kick out this destructive planet-burning mob and with the Greens in balance of power, we can have a government that will push, that the Greens will push the next government to go further and faster on climate. We can adopt science-based targets for 2030. We can shift to abundant green energy. We can stop the mining, burning and export of coal and gas and oil and we can work with other countries around the world for a positive, healthy future. Question is the motion moved by Senator Seward be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, I seek leave to move a motion relating to future meetings of the Senate. Leave is granted. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr. President. I move the motion circulated, uh, which is that a the president may alter the day and time of the next meeting of the Senate at the request of or the agreement of the leader of the government in the Senate and the leader of the opposition in the Senate, and the time of meeting shall be notified to each senator. B. The Senate may meet in a manner and form not otherwise provided in the standing orders with the agreement of the Leader of the Government in the Senate and the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate, and that the rules and orders necessary to constitute such a meeting may be determined by the Procedure Committee, and C. Leave of absence be granted to every, other, every member of the Senate from the end of the sitting today to the day on which the Senate next meets. Uh, Mr President, in, uh, in moving the motion, I do place on record that uh, um, this is moved as a contingency. Obviously. Uh, um, certain steps have been taken over the last year to ensure uh, the effective management uh, of the chamber through these extraordinary times. Uh, the government moves this motion with no intent to necessarily use any provisions within it at this time, and obviously it clearly provides for 
consultation, particularly with the opposition, and agreement with the opposition should any provisions of it be used. The question is the motion moved by Senator Birmingham be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. We we'll now move to tabling and consideration of committee reports and responses. Senator Seawitt. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I present the fourth interim report of the Community Affairs Reference Committee on Centrelink's compliance program, and I move that the uh, Senate adopt the recommendation in the report relating to an order for production of documents. This is a very important. Do you want? Um, this is a very important um, motion and report. This is the fourth report from this committee, and it relates to public interest immunity and the government claiming public interest immunity yet again over specific issues related to the Centrelink compliance program, which we all know is actually commonly known by the whole of Australia as robo-debt. And yet again, despite the fact that one of their reasons for or their key reason for not providing the information that we have sought repeatedly about the legal advice they obtained which I'll go into in a little bit uh, more in a, in a moment but the fact is they were using the court case as an excuse not to provide that information that court case has finished now Judgment has been passed. Debts have been repaid, not all that we think should be repaid, and compensation will be paid. The government has no excuse to hide behind now, which is what the majority of the committee agree. Senator O'Neill, who I'm sure will speak any minute when I um, finish my contribution, and other senators have sought this, including myself, have sought this information repeatedly. The community needs to know. Not just the Senate inquiry, but the community need and want to know what the government knew about a program that caused untold stress and harm. And I'll say it here again. It did contribute to people and it's uh, when people are reading this Hansard, please, uh, I, I'm aware um, of the sensitivities of this issue, but it did lead to people taking their own lives. I know Senator O'Neill has spoken to family members, as have I, and they are absolutely convinced that it contributed, contributed to their loved ones passing. That program was had abhorrent. What advice did the ministers—there's a number that were oversaw this program—what advice did those ministers seek? Did they seek to check that it was legal? Did they? Did the department? If so, when? At the beginning of the program, before they went down this track? And I'm sure what we'll hear from the, uh, from the government is that this is money that people were owed that people owed. Well, they didn't owe it, and the government should have checked before they started this robo-automatic process. And they'll also say, oh, we didn't do it automatically. It wasn't robo-debt. It wasn't automated. That is nonsense. There was a clear change in the way these debts were collected. When did they seek that advice? And you know what? If the government didn't seek legal advice, even bigger shame on them for not seeking legal advice to see if they could actually do this. But this matter relates to this particular matter on table relates to their latest claim of public interest immunity, and um, this has been claimed, as you know, on many occasions. But this occasion. As I said, the excuse is not there. They're using, and you'll see from the correspondence, the excuse that there may be future ones. Well, if that was the case, they'd deny giving people any information at any time. 
if, there was, if they were really genuine about any future dealings, because not all the people that could claim or uh, their um, not anybody who not everybody who had a debt raised against them um, was part of the class action. So they using the excuse that it could be others. It's complete nonsense. It's complete nonsense. This information should be publicly available, and the Australian people deserve to know how this program started, whether, it, whether the government ever knew it wasn't illegal and just hoped they wasn't legal and just hoped they didn't get caught, or whether they never bothered to check that they a program that resulted in untold misery in this place. It's not on. And this place, I hope, will continue to chase the government over this issue. Because it's not just me. There's many, many people in this country that want to know these answers. So we will, all of us, keep pursuing this information. I urge the Senate to support the recommendations, uh, the recommendation that we have moved. Uh, sorry, that, that I've just moved, and we have presented in this report, which specifically goes through a number of points, which I won't uh, take up time to read. But basically, it says, if this information, the committee recommends that the Senate adopt the following uh, resolution, following the production, uh, requiring the production of documents. And it talks about the documents that we want laid on the table no later than 12 p.m. on the 24th of August 2021, and goes on to the event that, in the event that the minister fails to table his documents, the Senate requires the minister to attend the Senate at the conclusion of question time on the 25th of August 2021 to provide an explanation of the minister's failure to table the documents. We are very clear in what documents that we want, including answers to all the questions that relate to legal advice and the income compliance program, commonly known as robo-debt. Sorry, I'm ably being there in terms of um, that doesn't actually say robo-debt which have been subject to the rejected claims of public interest immunity during the Community Affairs Reference Committee's inquiry into the Centrelink compliance program. We want executive minute to the Minister for Social Services dated the 12th of February 2015. And we also want a letter confirming that the above responses relating to legal advice and the executive minute will be provided. Um, we also confirm that if the government— we're also giving the government the opportunity to provide this information in camera, by the way. So it's not as if we've been unreasonable. I don't think it's unreasonable to ask for the legal basis on which the government, or the, the basis on which the government thought they had legal authority to, come, to undertake this illegal program. Please support this, this uh, resolution. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. And uh, I, I want to acknowledge the leadership that's been shown and the references committee, which is very ably chaired by Senator Seward, who's just made a contribution on this matter of, of great importance to hundreds and thousands of Australians. So for those who are just sort of listening or tuning in, if you heard about robo-debt, if you know anybody who was affected by robo-debt, which is essentially where the government created a bill and sent it to its own citizens, and that bill has now been considered to be an illegal activity by the government against its own people. That's where we are. So all that, all that noise about robo-debt that people heard, that's where we are in the sequence. I also want to congratulate and thank all the other senators on that committee with me, including Senator Urquhart, who is here in the chamber with me. And indeed, um, even though they hold a different view and they are members of the government, the, uh, the, the government members who have actually provided quorum so that these inquiries could go ahead. Because that's the job we're supposed to be doing here. We're supposed to be finding out about what's going on, double-checking that things are OK and that Australians aren't being ripped off. And this is a pretty big rip-off, where your government decides to concoct a debt and send it to the Australian people, and it's found to be an illegal debt. So my contribution today really uh, refers to the recent report that Senator Seat was just worth talking about to the government's continued attempts to cover their tracks. And they've made a claim against the public interest in saying it is not in the public interest for them to release 
critical documents that show us what they knew and the decision making that they undertook. So we consider it a bogus PII claim to hide legal advice that a federal judge found legally insufficient and which was responsible for the sending of 347 people these false debt notices. What we have to say about this program is it was a colossal and callous failure from its inception. In order to prop up the budget and the bottom line, when that was what Scott Morrison used to talk to you about, and that was the only thing he used to talk about then, now he's telling you why he's not, he's not doing a bad job looking after the country's health. Back then he was telling you he was looking after the economy, he was looking after the budget. But as Social Services Minister, it was Scott Morrison who began concocting this scheme to target the most vulnerable in our community and unleash debt collectors on Australians. Australians on the pension, Australians on carers' allowance, Australians who were doing it tough were harassed by debt collectors and the Australian state over money that they actually did not owe. This was an illegal act by the Australian government under the leadership of Mr Morrison. It was illegal. It was enormously expensive. And we need clarity on how on earth this monstrous item of public policy was allowed to be unleashed on the public. We cannot allow the mistakes that were made to be repeated. And so we come to Minister Reynolds' most recent claim, because this is at the long, long, after a long line of claims by the government that they shouldn't provide this, they shouldn't provide it, they shouldn't provide it, because they said originally there's a court case coming up. Well, the court case that declared the government had undertaken illegal activity has come and gone. Yet Minister Reynolds decided to send to the committee a letter that claims it would not be in the public's interest for the legal advice that underpinned robo-debt to be made public to the committee. Now, the committee's terms of references for this inquiry, which give us the task and the job that we're supposed to do, require us to examine the legality of this income compliance program. And that actually means dealing with the legal advice that underpinned the entire enterprise, advice that was later found by the federal court to have been legally insufficient and responsible for a $1.8 billion payout from the taxpayers. And this is a critical matter of, of public interest that the representatives, that's us, the senators, examine the faulty legal advice on which the whole dirty scheme was cooked up by Mr Morrison as the Treasurer and then presided over for years as the Prime Minister. The public needs to know, and these are the documents that we're seeking by the 24th of August, the dates that legal advice was sought and provided, the legal advice that was provided to internal and external lawyers to the ministers, departments and agencies in relation to robo-debt or in connection with the class action or potential litigation. We need to know for the Australian public to make sure that this doesn't happen again. The identity of the person, the agency or the firm who provided the legal advice. We need to know the costs of the legal advice. We need to know where issues remain to be resolved and the dates and content of any briefings or, ministers or meetings, including ministerial briefings and ministerial meetings, that relate to that legal advice. We need to see and know about the instructions to the lawyers by this government that inflicted illegal debts on its own people. And we need to see any legal advice provided in relation to the modification or enhancement of the income compliance program. And that's what they call it, the income compliance program. It's more the government harass you program. That's what it was. Minister Reynolds' claim that it is still in the public interest to continue to hide this advice is not merely untenable, it's grossly offensive. The committee is even willing to be provided the documents in camera, thus negating the risk that it could ever be used against the government. Yet still, still they continue to keep the legal advice hidden. This government has fought this disclosure tooth and nail which tells me only one thing, they absolutely must be hiding something very, very big. And it's very closely connected to the man who holds the highest position in this land, the Prime Minister of Australia, Scott Morrison. How could it be possibly considered that it's in the public interest
for the government to continue to hide advice that cost the public $2 billion. And as Senator Seward indicated, we know that there were lives lost, several lives lost, confirmed, because of the harassment that people suffered by this government when they sick the, the debt collectors on them. And of course, there was untold mental anguish, and we have no data collection about the families that were torn apart, businesses that went under, fledgling businesses that needed support but had all of their economic capacity ripped away from them, only to be repaid later when they'd lost the lot. That's the scale of error that we see with this government. The class action brought against the government to sort out this robo-debt matter has been settled. There is no current court action that I'm aware of with regard to robo-debt. Even last year, when the case was still live, Secretary of the Department of Social Services, uh, Catherine Campbell, was unable to explain to the committee how sharing this data would prejudice the Commonwealth's position on the class action. But it didn't stop her from pretending that she didn't know what robo-debt was and trying to lock up the information. Now, there is a legal precedent for disclosure of legal advice to the Senate. As stated in Odger's Senate practice, it says that it has never been accepted in the Senate nor any comparable representative assembly that legal professional privilege provides grounds for refusal of information in a parliamentary forum. Moreover, the Senate has consistently rejected government claims that there's long-standing practice of not disclosing privileged legal advice to the, con the conserver of the Commonwealth's legal and institution constitutional interests. The government has not a leg to stand on. The Morrison-Joyce government is merely playing for time, delaying, kicking the ball into the weeds every time this Senate rightly asks for the documents to allow us to get to the truth. Well, I will tell them we will not let this go. The Australian people will not let this go. And one day soon, I hope soon, we will find the truth of this matter. Several questions go not to specific legal advice but to general information regarding the procurement of legal advice. And the government say this is never released, but that is not true. Christian Porter released legal advice on the eligibility of Minister Dutton under section 44V of the Constitution on the 24th of August 2018. In 2011, Prime Minister Julia Gillard advised the House of Representatives that we have made available to the Leader of the Opposition the advice of the Solicitor General on asylum seekers and offshore processing. In 2007, the Minister for Immigration and Citizenship, Kevin Andrews, released advice in relation to the power of the cancellation of the visa of Dr Hanif. These are just three examples of common practice releasing legal documentation by federal governments of both uh, parties. It's clear if the government wasn't so afraid of the implications of releasing this advice, it would have done so. But it has a responsibility, both moral, ethical and parliamentary to provide to the Senate the documents that we seek to be laid on the table no later than noon on the 24th of August. It's time. Order. Cough it up. Let's Order. get on with the Senator job. Senator O'Neill, the question is the motion moved by Senator C would be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. We will now proceed to the consideration of documents. Listed on pages 8 to 9 of the notice paper, if they're not um, Noted now, they will be taken to be discharged. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr. President. Record. I take note of documents one, two, five, and six on page eight, and continue, uh, seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? And on, yep. oh, sorry. Yep, leave is granted. Uh, and on page nine, I take note of documents seven and eleven, and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted. It is. Um, we will now proceed to the consideration of committee reports. Oh, sorry, Senator O'Neill. I just wanted to make a couple of remarks on report five. Um, that has been held over, so we'll have to. Stand. I'm looking at the clerk. We've moved on, but can we go back to it? And uh, what we'll do is we'll take it, uh, Senator uh, Urquhart, that you've sought leave to continue remarks on all but five, and we'll let Senator O'Neill speak to the motion to take note of number five. Uh, I'm just put on the record today an emerging concern with regard to the vaccination. We've seen a lot of blame of a vaccine companies' advisory bodies for the mistakes that the Prime Minister's um, perpetrated. 
in his, fa his failed leadership for the country, and we see this ex escalation of lockdowns and deaths and illness. I, I want to draw particular attention to one of the major concerns I have right now, and that is that breastfeeding women cannot access the vaccine uh, that they need currently because they are actually ineligible for the AstraZeneca vaccine, and the government have left these women off any priority list. And I seek to raise this today because who knows what could happen with everybody in lockdown and a potential that we might not be back here for some extended period of time. I want to take this opportunity, as, as it might be the last time that I get to raise this concern. Uh, breastfeeding women need access. They need to be made a priority to be able to get the eligible vaccine that is recommended for them. And I urge all my um, sisters on the other side of the benches here to make sure that women's particular needs with regard to vaccine access are given a greater priority by this government because it seems to have been overlooked. I also want to note that at the moment only 10 per cent of Indigenous uh, men and women have, access, have accessed the vaccines, and we are in a situation where that explosion of the illness into rural New South Wales in uh, Walgett, Bathurst, Dubbo, Burke, Bogan, Brewarrina, Coonamble, Gilgandra, Narromine and Warren uh, means that the Aboriginal communities that are so significant in those communities are particularly vulnerable at this time. So once again, thank you very much for your indulgence, Mr. President, in allowing me to put that on the record, uh, and I seek leave to continue thank my you. remarks. Senator O'Neill, Senator Seawitt. Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm just double checking that uh, document 11. I missed all the documents that were saved. That documents yeah. in 11 and 12 were saved. Not 12, Senator Seawitt. Not 12. So can I save 12 too, please? You'd like to move to take note and seek leave yes. to continue your remarks. Uh, yes, done. all that. All that. Senator Seawitt, thank you. Um, we can now move on um, to committee reports, government responses and Auditor General's reports. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr President. Um, I take note of document on, do on page 10, documents 4, 9, 10, 11, 12, uh, 13 and 14, and seek leave to continue my remarks. Leave and, is granted. Senator and on Urquhart. page 11, uh, Auditor General's reports 1, 2 and 3, and seek leave to continue my remarks. Leave granted. It is. So we will now move on to ministerial statements. Bishops first. Um, I have received letters requesting changes in the membership of committees. Senator McKenzie. Uh, I seek leave to move a motion to vary the membership of committees. Is leave granted? It is. Senator McKenzie. I move that senators be discharged from and appointed to committees as set out in the document available in the chamber and listed on the dynamic red. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Ministerial statements. Senator McKenzie. I table a document relating to the order for the production of documents concerning JobKeeper payments. Senator Patrick. So, um, Mr President, I wish to make a statement in relation You're to that. You're moving to take note of that? Yeah, I moving believe. to take note of, yep. uh, of that report, uh, of, the, of that response. Um, the, the Senate has asked the Tax Commissioner to provide information about companies that receive JobKeeper. Asking for information, very simple information, how much uh, or which companies receive JobKeeper, how much they received in total, whether or not money has been paid back. Uh, this is information which is not company operational information, it's not company tax uh, information, it's information about what the taxpayer gave to a company. That's what the information is about. It's no different to a grant that might be given to a, com to a company, and we would expect complete transparency about any grant money that we would uh, give to a company. Likewise, any contract that we have with a company, we would uh, expect transparency that uh, the, the information would be published on, on um, uh, Austender. Now, the Commissioner claims that inf this information is sensitive. I will uh, give the Commissioner credit. Unlike in past times, in his response, he actually acknowledges that the Senate has the power to require the production of these documents, but then advances a public interest immunity. 
the, uh, the basis upon which he does uh, so is really it looks at two fronts. He, uh, he makes a claim that the information is sensitive, and it is not. It cannot be sensitive. Uh, he also makes a claim that if it were released, somehow it would undermine the tax system. We would have uh, people no longer wanting to talk to the tax office. Uh, and both of those reasons fail for, uh, uh, you know, f because we, we know that in New Zealand this information has been published. In New Zealand this information has been published for every company and as a result of that publication, as a result of that transparency, we see uh, we've seen 5 per cent of the total amount of their wage subsidy returned to the government, as opposed to here in Australia, where we have only had 0.25 per cent of uh, JobKeeper payments returned from companies. And we know that there, is, there are companies out there that, are, uh, that have taken this money, they've made uh, an assessment that they weren't going to uh, uh, have turnovers. Um, I, either uh, 30 or 50 per cent uh, less than what they had in the previous uh, uh, reporting periods for the, for the previous years. Uh, that, was, that appears to be the only requirement. In fact, the government introduced the scheme. And look, uh, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, it was appropriate to uh, get money to people quickly. But that's no excuse for now looking back and saying there are companies that took the JobKeeper, went on to make bigger profits, paid uh, money to their, uh, to, to their investors, paid money to their executives. We funnelled taxpayers' money uh, from the wallets of Australians and into the bank accounts of investors and uh, executives. And that was not what that money was intended for. It was never intended for that. And we have to do something about this. And we've seen the experience in New Zealand. If you uh, disclose this information, companies look very closely at what happened, and they have returned uh, a lot more in terms of percentage uh, values back to the New Zealand taxpayer. And that's all I think we need to have happen here. We can't have a situation where you know, Jerry Harvey has uh, uh, received $22 million of taxpayers' money through the JobKeeper scheme. Uh, made record profits, and he's out buying adver ad advertisements on the on the Australian taxpayers' uh, coin. That's just not right, and it disturbs me every time the government stands up and tries to defend uh, what has happened. They take a very strict legal perspective, and I, ex I and I and I accept the government's legal perspective. I'm not suggesting any of the companies have broken uh, any any legal rules or any laws, but they ha they have breach the moral trust of Australians. And it's our job to make sure that we stand up and uh, uh, highlight exactly what's happened and encourage the government to uh, have this money returned, signal to the, uh, these companies that it isn't acceptable. Right now, every time this is mentioned in the chamber, Senator Birmingham rises and says it's OK. It was great that these companies got that money. And, and that well, no, I'm not, I'm not, uh, Senator Rustin. I am not verbaling the the, uh, the 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 minister at all. He has stood at the table of the Senate and said that this is a good thing. This money became a stimulus package, which was not what it was intended for. It was never intended for that. The uh, the the, uh, the minister tries to rewrite history. We can go back to the Hansards and we can see what he said. We can see what the government said when they introduced the job keeper. And definitely, it didn't say at the time that this money was to go uh, for stimulating the economy, uh, for uh, executive bonuses, for investors. That's not what was uh, was said back uh, back when the JobKeeper scheme was presented to this parliament. And, and uh, it's not appropriate to rewrite history and suggest that that was what it was for. This parliament would, parliament would never have. Uh, have agreed to that. We were uh, cognizant that there were companies in difficulty and we needed to help them. And uh, I have nothing uh, adverse to say about companies who took that help 
uh, and uh, used it to make sure that they could retain their business, they could retain their employees. Uh, uh, I have no gripes about that at all. It's only in circumstances where companies uh, took the money and made, uh, and made larger profits. At that point, the CEOs of these companies, the directors of these companies, ought to be looking and saying, what is the right thing for my company to do? What is the right thing for my company to do? Keep this taxpayer money that was given to me for a purpose for which I haven't used it, or should I return it? And that's the point of the transparency measure proposed through this order of production, is to, make, to, to lay out on the table uh, who got what, and look, other people can then look at it, and companies can, uh, uh, you know, companies may have to answer for their for their own conduct. I don't think anyone is going to go after companies that uh, that really did struggle, and we know which companies struggled through uh, through the pandemic, and we know which which companies thrived. But transparency is like you turn on the lights, you see the cockroaches cockroaches scurry across the floor. That's uh, that's what it's about, and uh, hopefully we squash a few of them. Okay, so um, it is not okay for the government to simply stand up and say uh, it's okay to take this money. And it's not okay for the government to try and hide this information uh, when, in actual fact, it is not company information at all. It is simply the amount of taxpayer money that was provided to a company, and taxpayers have a right to know about that. Go and have a look at the New Zealand site. You can type in any company name. It doesn't matter whether it's the, the news agents down the road or, uh, or, or uh, you know, a printing company, a medical company, uh, a, a, a travel a, a company. It doesn't matter. You can type in Qantas. You can type in um, Air New Zealand. You can see how much JobKeeper or their, their equivalent of JobKeeper was received by these companies. It hasn't blown up their tax system hasn't harmed the companies, but it's made sure that taxpayers' money has been spent wisely and it has encouraged companies to, in New Zealand to return that money. And I just don't see for the life of me how the government thinks it is reasonable to, to shut the doors on, on this, to shut the doors on money that taxpayer paid to these companies. It's taxpayers' money. It's not money the company earned through its uh, business operations. It's not you know, the amount of profit they made. It's not the, the um, amount of uh, tax um, uh, that was returned to them as a result of a tax submission. It's simply the amount of money that taxpayers provided to these companies for help. Not unreasonable to disclose that. I don't accept the public interest immunity advanced by the, uh, by the uh, tax commissioner. I uh, already have a notice of motion uh, that has been lodged in relation to this. I will be asking the Senate to insist upon uh, the uh, uh, OPD being complied with. And uh, beyond that, let's hope the, uh, the commissioner uh, well, yeah, the, follows the process. I don't criticise him at this point in time. He's advanced his public interest immunity. I hope the Senate backs the rejection of that. Uh, if that occurs, uh, I will use everything uh, possible to make sure that the Senate order is enforced. Thank you, Mr. President. Question is the motion moved by Senator Patrick be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. If we no, ayes have it. I understand I've got a motion with respect to rearrangement. Senator Rustin. Oh, thank you, Mr President. I move that general business not be proceeded with. question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. There being no other business, I propose that the Senate do now adjourn. And I understand we do not have any speakers on the adjournment. So I will announce the Senate stands adjourned and we'll meet again on Monday the 23rd of August at 10am. Stay well everyone.